This is Audible. Tantor Audio presents Reaper's Legacy by Joanna Wild, narrated by Tatiana Sokolov and Todd Habercorn. Author's note: After writing Reaper's Property, the first book in this series, although Reaper's Legacy stands alone. The most common questions I heard were about my research and the characters' names. Specifically, how accurate are the books, and why do some of the names sound almost silly? The answer is that I started my career in journalism and researched outlaw motorcycle club culture extensively for my stories. This included talking to people in club life, many of whom answered questions for me throughout the writing process. The Reaper's Legacy manuscript was reviewed and corrected by a woman attached to an outlaw MC. Many have questioned the accuracy of the road names I chose, feeling that they aren't fierce or intimidating enough. Horse, picnic, bam, bam, etc. Some have suggested that no real badass would be called picnic, but they don't realize that road names are often whimsical or flat-out funny. Not every biker has a name like Ripper or Killer. The picnic in my book is named after a real man, although his name wasn't just picnic; it was actually picnic table. The majority of the names in my book were taken from real life. Prologue, Sophie. Eight years ago, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I'm gonna stick it in now. Zach's voice was rough and full of urgent need. I smelled him all around me, sweaty and hungry and so beautiful I could die. After tonight, he'd be mine for real. His hand reached down between us, guiding the round, rubbery head of his penis as it nudged my opening. It felt weird. He pushed at me, and I guess he missed because it hit me too high. And, ouch! Shit, Zack, that hurts. I think you're doing it wrong. He stopped immediately and grinned down at me, the gap between his front teeth teasing. Holy crap! I loved that grin. I'd had the biggest crush on Zack since we were freshmen, but he never noticed me. Not until a couple of months ago, my folks didn't let me out much. But in July, I'd managed to get permission to stay with Lissa for a night, and we'd snuck out to a party. Zach had homed in, and we'd been a couple ever since. I had gotten really good at sneaking out. Sorry, babe," he murmured, leaning down to kiss me. I softened immediately, loving the feel of his lips ghosting across mine. He adjusted himself and started sliding into me again, slow and steady. This time he didn't miss, and I stiffened as he stretched me open wide. Then he hit a barrier and paused. I opened my eyes and looked up at him. He looked back down at me, and I knew right then and there that I'd never love anyone half so much as I loved Zachary Barrett. Ready? He whispered. I nodded. He shoved into me, and I squealed, pain ripping between my legs. Zach kept me pinned with his hips as I gasped, shocked. Then he pulled out, and I tried to catch my breath. Before I could, though, he'd thrust back into me, hard. Ouch! Holy shit, you're tight," he muttered. He pushed himself up on his hands, throwing his head back as he pumped into my body over and over, eyes closed and face straining with hunger. I don't know what I'd expected. I mean, I wasn't stupid. I knew it wouldn't be perfect the first time, no matter what the romance books said, and it didn't hurt that much. But it sure as shit didn't feel good either. Zach moved faster, and I turned my head on the couch to look across the small apartment. His brothers, apparently, we had it for the night. It was supposed to be our special perfect time together. I'd expected flowers or soft music and wine or something. Stupid. Zach had pizza and some beer from his brother's fridge. Ouch. I muttered again as he paused, face twisting. Shit, I'm gonna come. He gasped. I felt his penis throb deep inside, almost twitching. It was weird, really weird, and nothing like I'd seen in movies, not even a little bit. Was that it? Huh? Oh fuck, that's good. The apartment door opened as Zach collapsed between my legs, oblivious to the world. I couldn't do anything but watch in horror as a man walked in. I didn't know him, but he couldn't have been Zach's brother. He didn't look anything like Zach, who was taller than me, but not by a whole lot. This guy was really tall and muscular in the way men who work with their hands get from heavy lifting on the job. 
He wore a black leather vest with patches over a ratty T-shirt and jeans that had streaks of dark motor oil or grease or something. A half-rack of beer dangled from one hand. His hair was short and dark. Almost military. His lip was pierced and he wore two rings in his left ear and one in his right. Like a pirate, eyebrow was pierced too. His features were bluntly handsome, but nobody would ever call him pretty. Big black boots covered his feet, and the chain from his wallet hung low across his hip. One of his arms had a full-sleeve tattoo. The other had a skull with crossed blades behind it. He stopped in the doorway and looked us over, slowly shaking his head. "'I told you what I'd do if you broke into my place again,' he said quietly. Zack popped up and his face went white. His entire body, with one notable exception, stiffened. I felt that exception slither out of me— along with some fluid, and realized we hadn't even bothered to put a towel down or anything. Ew. But how was I supposed to know we'd need a towel? Shit, Zack said, his voice a tight squeak. Ruger, I can explain. Don't fucking explain, Ruger said, pushing forward into the room. He slammed the door shut behind him and walked over to the couch. I tried to hide my head in Zack's chest— more ashamed and embarrassed than I'd ever been in my life. Flowers. Were flowers too much to ask? Jesus Christ, what is she, twelve? Ruger asked, giving the couch a kick. It shuddered under me, and Zack sat up, pulling away from my body. I shrieked and pushed my hands down between us, trying to cover myself from his brother's gaze. Shit. Shit. Then it got worse. The brother, Ruger, whatever the hell kind of name that was, looked right at me as he leaned across my body, grabbing a folded blanket from the back of the couch. He tossed it over my crotch. I moaned and died a little inside. My legs were still spread wide, my skirt up high around my waist. He'd seen everything. Everything. This was supposed to be the most romantic night of my life, and now I just wanted to go home and cry. I'm taking a shower, and by the time I'm done, you need to be gone, Ruger said, getting in Zack's face. My boyfriend flinched. And stay the fuck out of my apartment. With that, he walked down the hall to the bathroom, banging the door shut. Seconds later, I heard the shower come on. Zack jumped up, muttering. Asshole. He's such a goddamn asshole. Was that your brother? Yeah, he's a prick. I sat up and straightened my shirt. Thank God I hadn't taken it off. Zack loved to touch my breasts, but we'd actually moved pretty fast once we got started. I managed to get to my feet, holding the blanket in front of me while I pulled down my skirt. I had no idea where my panties had gone, but a quick look around didn't reveal them. I leaned over the couch, digging into the pillows, hunting. No luck, but I managed to stick my hand in the disgusting wet spot we'd left behind— I felt like such a whore. Fuck, Zack yelled behind me. My head jerked up. How could things possibly get any worse? Holy fuck, I cannot fucking believe this. What's wrong? The condom broke, he said, eyes wide. The fucking condom broke. This has got to be the worst night of my life. You better not be pregnant. The air froze in my lungs. Apparently things could get worse. Zack held the broken rubber out toward me. I stared down at the nasty thing, not quite believing my bad luck. Did you do it wrong? I whispered. He shrugged, not answering. It's probably okay, I said after another long pause. I mean, my period just ended. You can't get pregnant that soon after your period, right? Um, yeah, probably, he said, flushing and looking away. I didn't really pay attention to that shit in class. I mean, I always use a condom. Always. They never break, not even— My breath caught and I felt hot tears well up in my eyes. You told me you'd only done it once before, I said softly. He winced. I've never done it with anyone I loved before, he said, dropping the broken rubber and grabbing from my hand. I tried to tug away. The mess on his fingers grossed me out, but when he pulled me in tight and wrapped his arms around me, I caved. Hey, it's gonna be okay, he muttered, rubbing my back as I snuffled against his shirt. It'll be fine. We're fine. 
I'm sorry I wasn't honest with you. I was afraid you wouldn't stick with me if you knew I'd been stupid before. I don't care about any other girls, and I never will. I just want to be with you. Okay, I said, pulling myself together. He shouldn't have lied, but at least he owned up to it. Mature couples work through hard stuff all the time, right? Um, we should probably get out of here. Your brother looked pretty pissed. I thought he gave you a key. My stepmom has an emergency key, he said, shrugging. I took it. He was supposed to be out of town. Grab the pizza. Should we leave some for your brother? Screw him. And he's my stepbrother. We're not even really related. Okay. I found my shoes and slipped them on, then got my purse and the pizza. I still didn't know where my panties were, but just then I heard the shower stop. We needed to get out. Zack glanced over at the bathroom, then winked at me as he grabbed the half-rack off the counter. Come on, he said, taking my hand and pulling me toward the door. You're stealing his beer? I asked, feeling a little sick. Seriously? Fuck him, Zack said, narrowing his eyes at me. He's a total dick, thinks he's better than everyone else, him and his stupid fucking motorcycle club. They're all assholes and criminals, and he is too. Probably stole it in the first place. And he can buy more any time he wants, not like us. We'll take it to Kimber's. Her parents are in Mexico. We jogged down the apartment complex stairs, then crossed the parking lot to his truck. It was kind of old, but at least the full-size Ford's King Cab had plenty of room. We'd take it out sometimes, just the two of us, and spend hours lying in the bed under the stars, kissing and laughing. Other times we packed three or four couples in, all sitting on each other's laps. Zack hadn't done such a great job tonight, but that wasn't his fault. Sometimes life just didn't follow the plan. I was still crazy about him, though. Hey, I said, stopping him as he opened the driver's side door. I turned him around and popped up onto my toes, kissing him long and slow. I love you. I love you too, babe, Zack said, smoothing my hair back behind my ear. I melted when he did that, made me feel all safe and protected. Now let's go kill some of those beers. Shit, fucking crazy night. My brother is such a dick. I rolled my eyes and laughed as I hauled ass around the truck. So losing my virginity hadn't been perfect and beautiful and all that. But at least it was over, and Zack loved me. Too bad about the panties, though. I bought them special and everything. Ruger. Eight months later. Fuck, it's my mom. I gotta grab that. Ruger yelled across the table at Mary Jo, holding up his cell. The band hadn't started yet, but the place was still packed, and he couldn't hear a damn thing. He didn't get out much since he'd started prospecting the Reapers. Earning a place in the club was a full-time job by itself, and he pulled shifts at the pawn shop, too. Ma knew that, and she wouldn't have called if it wasn't important. Hey, let me get outside, he said loudly into the phone, walking toward the door with long strides. People got the fuck out of his way, and he bit back a smile. He'd always been a big guy, but now that he wore an MC cut? Fuckers practically dove under the tables when they saw the club patches on his vest. Okay, I'm outside, he said, moving away from the crowd in front of the iron horse. Jesse, Sophie needs you, his mom said. What do you mean? he asked, peering at his bike parked down the street. Was that guy getting close to it? Oh, not gonna happen. So, are you going? she said. Shit. She'd been talking. Fuck. Sorry, Ma. Missed what you said. I just got a panicked phone call from Sophie, his mom repeated. Stupid kids. She went to a kegger with your brother, and now she thinks she might be in labor. He's too drunk to drive her, and she's having contractions, so she can't drive herself. I'm gonna kill him. I can't believe he'd take her somewhere like that, especially now. Are you fucking kidding me? Jesse, don't use that language with me, she snapped. Can you help her or not? I'm in Spokane, and it'll take at least an hour to get there. I'll start making more phone calls if you can't do it. Wait, isn't it too early? A little too early, yes, she replied, her voice tense. I wanted to call an ambulance, but she insists it's just Braxton Hicks. Ambulance rides cost a fortune, you know, and she's scared of the bills. 
She wants to go home, but I think she might need the hospital. Can you get her or not? I can meet you there as soon as I hit town. I've got a real bad feeling about this, Jess. Didn't sound like Braxton Hicks to me. Yeah, of course, he replied, wondering what the hell Braxton Hicks were. He saw Mary Jo come out of the bar, smiling at him ruefully. She knew all about sudden phone calls and changes in plans. Where are they? He got the information, then hung up, walking over to his date and shrugging his shoulders. This sucked. He wanted to get laid, and not at the clubhouse. Some fucking privacy would be nice for once, and Mary Jo was wild as they got. Club business? She asked lightly. Thank fuck she wasn't a drama queen. Nope. Family, he replied. My asshole stepbrother knocked up his girlfriend and now she's going into labor. Needs a ride to the hospital. I'm gonna go get her. Mary Jo's eyes widened. You should leave, she said quickly. I'll take a cab home. Shit, that sucks. How old is she? Just turned seventeen. Damn, she said, shivering with genuine horror. I can't imagine having a kid that young. Call me later, okay? He gave her a fast but hard kiss. She reached down and offered his cock a quick squeeze. Ruga groaned, feeling himself stiffen. He really needed to get laid. Instead, he pulled away and walked over to his bike. The party was halfway to a toll, off in some field that he vaguely remembered visiting when he was in high school. He found Zack's truck easy enough. Sophie stood next to it, looking scared in the summer twilight. Then her face tightened and she hunched over her giant belly, groaning. Now she looked terrified. Ruger parked his bike and realized he'd have to leave it in the field. No way she could ride with him. Fucking great. Asshat little shits would probably run over it or something. Sophie's face was white with strain, though. No room to fuck around. She needed to go in the truck, and clearly she needed to go now. Ruger shook his head, glancing around for his brother. He still couldn't figure out why a smart, beautiful girl like her would pick Zack, of all people. Sophie had long, reddish-brown hair, beautiful green eyes, and a way about her that screamed feminine softness. A softness he'd spent more than one night imagining with his dick in his hand. Even pregnant in the middle of a field party, she was still gorgeous. Way the fuck too young, though. She saw him and winced, reaching around to put one hand against her back, stretching as the contraction ended. Ruger knew she didn't like him, and he didn't blame her. They hadn't met under the best of circumstances, and things between him and Zack went further to shit every day. Ruger hated the way he treated their mom, and hated the way he lived his life. More than anything else, he hated the way the little fuck was already running around on Sophie behind her back. Cocksucker didn't deserve a girl like her, and their kid sure as hell hadn't won the lottery when it came to his future daddy. How you doing? he asked, coming up to Sophie and hunkering down so he could see her face. Her eyes were full of panic. My water broke, she said, her voice a hoarse whisper. The contractions are coming really fast. Way too fast. It's supposed to be slow with your first baby. It never happens this fast. I need to get to the hospital, Ruger. I shouldn't have come here. Ah, oh, fuck me, he muttered. You got the keys? She shook her head. Zack does. He's over by the bonfire. Maybe we should call an ambulance? Oh, she groaned, leaning over. Hang in there, he said. I'll get Zack. I can drive you to the hospital faster than an ambulance at this point. She groaned again and leaned back against the truck. Ruger took off toward the bonfire, finding Zack half passed out on the ground. On your feet, asshole, Ruger demanded, grabbing him by the shirt and dragging him upright. Keys, now. Zack looked at him blankly. Was that barf on his shirt? High school kids stood around watching them, eyes wide as they clutched their big red solo cups of cheap beer. Fuck me, Ruger muttered again, digging down into his brother's pants pocket, hoping like hell he hadn't lost him. This was closer to Zack's dick than he ever needed his hand to be. He pulled out the keys, dropping Zack back onto the dirt. You want to see your kid getting born, get your ass in the truck now, Ruger told him. I'm not waiting for you. With that, he took off toward the Ford wrenching open the door and lifting Sophie into the back seat. He heard a thudding noise and saw Zack climb into the truck bed out of the corner of his eye. Little prick. Ruger turned on the engine and popped the truck into gear, ready to go. Then he slammed it back into park, jumped out, and ran over to his bike. He had a little first aid kit in there. Nothing fancy, but at this rate they might need it.
He climbed back in the truck, pulled out of the field, and started toward the highway, watching Sophie anxiously in the rearview mirror. She was panting hard, and then she screamed. Every hair on the back of his neck stood up. Holy shit, I feel like I need to push, she cried. Oh God, it hurts. It hurts so bad. I've never felt anything like this. Try faster. We need to get there fast. Her voice trailed off as she groaned again. Ruger drove faster, wondering if Zack had something to hold on to. He couldn't see him back there. Maybe he'd passed out in the bed. Hell, maybe he'd bounced out. Ruger didn't care either way. They'd almost made it to the highway when Sophie started shouting. Stop! Stop the truck! Ruger stopped, hoping to hell that didn't mean what he thought it did. He threw on the parking brake and turned to see her, eyes closed, face almost purple and full of agony. She was crouching forward, moaning. Ambulance, he said, his voice grim. She nodded tightly. He made the call, giving the operator the details of their situation. Afterward, he put the phone on speaker, dropping it to the seat. Then he got out and opened the back door, leaning in. I'm here with you, Sophie, the 911 operator told them. Hold on, the paramedics only have to come up from Hayden. You'll see them soon. Sophie groaned through another contraction. I have to push. The ambulance is ten minutes out, the operator said. Can you hold on until they reach you? They have everything they need to help you with this. Fuck! Sophie screamed, squeezing Ruger's hand so hard his fingers went numb. All right, it's unlikely the baby will be born before they arrive, but I want you to get ready, Ruger. The operator said, her voice so calm she sounded stoned. How did she do that? He felt about thirty seconds away from a heart attack. Sophie needs you now. The good news is that childbirth is natural, and her body knows what to do. A baby born this fast usually means a very smooth delivery. Do you have a way to wash your hands? Yeah, Ruger muttered. You gotta let me go for a sec, Sophie. She shook her head, but he pried his hands free. He ripped into the first aid kit, pulling out a couple of ridiculously small sanitary wipe packets. Then he attacked his hands and tried to go after hers. She screamed and punched his face. Holy shit. Girl had some power behind her. Ruger shook his head, then pulled it together, his cheekbone throbbing. Another contraction. It's too early, Sophie gasped. I can't stop it. I have to push now. When is she due? The operator asked as Sophie moaned long and low. About a month, Ruger told her. It's too early. All right. The most important thing is to make sure the baby is breathing. Don't let it fall on the ground if it's born before the EMTs arrive. You'll have to catch it. Now don't panic. It can take hours to push out a baby, especially the first one. But just as a precaution, I want you to find something warm to wrap around the child if Sophie delivers. You'll check the baby's breathing. If it's good, you'll lay him on the mother's bare chest, face down, skin to skin. Then put whatever you have over him. Don't tug on the cord, cut it, tie it off, or anything. Keep your hands away from the birth canal. If the afterbirth comes out, wrap it with the child. That's when it hit him. Sophie was going to have her baby right here on the side of the road. His nephew. Right now. Holy shit, she needed to get her pants off first. She wore leggings and he tried to pull them down with her still inside the cab. It didn't work, and she couldn't seem to find a comfortable position either. We have to get you out of here, he said. She shook her head, teeth gritted. But he picked her up and set her feet on the ground anyway. Then he pulled down her sopping wet leggings and panties in one smooth move, lifting one foot and then the other to free her legs from the clinging fabric. Now what? Sophie cried out again, face tight as she bore down next to him, falling into a squat beside the truck. Fuck, he needed something to keep the baby warm. Ruger glanced around frantically, finding exactly nothing, so he pulled off his cut and tossed it into the truck. Then he ripped his t-shirt over his head. It wasn't the best, but it was relatively clean. He'd showered and put on a fresh one before meeting Mary Jo. Sophie pushed for an eternity, crouched down and digging her fingers deep into his shoulders. He'd have bruises there in the morning, probably cuts from her nails, too. Whatever. The 911 operator's calm voice encouraged them, saying the ambulance was only five minutes out. Sophie ignored her, lost in her own world of pain and urgency, giving loud, low groans with every contraction. Can you see the baby's head? The operator asked. Ruger froze. You want me to look? Yes. 
He was pretty damn sure he didn't want to look. Fuck. Sophie needed him, though. The kid needed him, too. Ruger dropped down to peer between her legs. That's when he saw it. A tiny head coming out of her body, covered with dark black hair. Holy crap. Sophie sucked in a deep breath and gripped his shoulders even harder. She let out one loud, long moan as she pushed again. Then it happened. Ruger reached down, almost in a trance, as the world's most perfect little human slid right out of her and into his hands. Sophie started crying with relief as blood streaked her thighs. What's happening? the operator asked. He heard a siren in the distance. The baby just came out, Ruger muttered. Odd. He'd seen a calf born, but that had nothing on this. I'm holding it. Is it breathing? He watched as the newborn opened its little eyes for the first time and looked right at him. They were blue and round and confused and fucking gorgeous. They closed again as the baby screwed up its tiny mouth, sucked in a deep breath, and let out a piercing wail. Yeah, fuck. The kid is fine. Ruger looked up at Sophie as he raised the baby between them. She smiled hesitantly and reached for her child. Her exhausted, tear-streaked, yet radiant face was the second most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in his life. Right after those tiny blue eyes. You did good, babe, he whispered to Sophie. Yeah, she whispered back. I did, didn't I? She kissed the boy's head softly. Hey, Noah, it's Mommy, she said. I'm gonna take such good care of you, I promise. Always. Chapter 1. Sophie Seven years later, Seattle, Washington Our last night in Seattle didn't go so great. My babysitter, my emergency backup sitter, and my second emergency backup sitter all had the flu. I'd have been screwed if one of my new neighbors hadn't volunteered to keep an eye on Noah. I didn't really know her, but we'd been living next to each other for a month and no red flags. Not the best, I know. You do what you have to when you're a single mom. Then Dick yelled at me for coming in late for my shift. I didn't tell him I'd nearly missed work altogether because of Noah. And no, I'm not just calling him Dick because he's actually a dick, although he is. It's his real name. That night I truly understood why he was in such a bad mood, because of the six girls who were supposed to be on, only two showed. Two had the flu, genuine, half the city had it, and two had dates, or I'm assuming they had dates. Their official stories were a dead grandmother, her fifth, and an infected tattoo. Apparently none of the drugstores in her neighborhood carried bacitracin. Either way, things fell to shit fast. We had a band, which put the customers in a good mood, but the live music and drunken dancing made it even harder to keep up with my tables, also made us busier than usual. We would have been stretched even with a full staff. To make things perfect, it was a local band, and most of their fans were college students, which meant crappy tips. By eleven, I was already tired and needed to pee in a bad way, so I ducked into the bathroom. Out of toilet paper already, of course, and I knew damned well nobody had time to restock. I pulled out my phone, doing a quick check for messages, and saw two. One from Miranda, my babysitter, and a second from Ruger, the world's scariest almost-in-law. Shit. Miranda first. I held it to my ear and listened, hoping to hell everything was all right. No way Dick would let me off early, even for an emergency. Ruger could wait. Mom, I'm scared, Noah said. I froze. I took Miranda's phone and I'm hiding in the closet, he continued. There's a bad guy here, and he's smoking inside, and he wanted me to smoke, too, and they kept laughing at me. He tried to tickle me and make me sit on his lap. Now they're watching a movie that has naked people in it, and I don't like it. I don't want to be here, and I want to go home. I want you to come home. I really need you, right now. I heard his breath hitch, like he was crying but didn't want me to know, and then the message cut out. I took a couple of deep breaths, trying to control my surge of adrenaline. I checked the time on the message. Almost forty-five minutes ago. My stomach twisted, and for a second I thought I might puke. Then I pulled it together and left the bathroom. 
I managed to walk back into the bar and have Brett, the bartender, unlock the drawer where he kept our purses. I need to get home. My kid's in trouble. Tell Dick. With that, I headed toward the door, pushing through drunken frat boys. I was almost out when someone grabbed my arm, spinning me around. My boss stood there, glaring. Where the hell do you think you're going, Williams? There's an emergency, I told him. I need to go home. You leave me now with a crowd like this, don't come back, Dick growled. I leaned forward and stared him down, which was pretty easy considering the guy was hardly more than five feet tall. On good days, I thought of him as a hobbit. Tonight, he was just a troll. I need to take care of my son, I said coldly, using my deadliest troll-killing voice. Let go of my arm, now. I'm leaving. Driving home took at least a year. I kept trying to call Miranda, but nobody answered. When I reached our ancient apartment building, I tore up the wooden stairs to the top floor, shaking with a weird mixture of rage and fear. Miranda's place was right across from my little studio, and while my thighs and calves hated the climb, I loved how we were the only residents up here. Until now. Tonight it felt remote and scary. I heard music and grunting as I pounded on the door. No answer. I pounded harder and wondered if I'd have to break in. Then the door flew open. A tall guy with unbuttoned pants and no shirt blocked the entry. He had the start of a gut and bloodshot eyes. I smelled pot and booze. Yeah? he asked, swaying. I tried looking around him, but he blocked me. My son Noah is here, I said, struggling to stay calm and focus on what really counted. I could kill this asshole later. I'm here to pick him up. Oh, yeah. Forgot about him. Come on in. He stepped aside and I ducked past him. Miranda's place was a studio just like ours, so I should have seen Noah right away. Instead, I spotted my useless neighbor on the couch, collapsed on her back with her eyes glazed and a dreamy smile on her face. Her clothes were rumpled, her long hippie skirt shoved up above her splayed knees. The phone lay on the coffee table in front of her, next to a bong made out of plastic pens, foil, and a Mountain Dew bottle. Empty surrounded it, because apparently weed wasn't enough to keep her entertained, while she failed to babysit my seven-year-old child. Miranda, where's Noah? I demanded. She looked at me blankly. How should I know? She slurred. Maybe he went outside, the guy muttered turning away from me as he reached into the fridge for another beer. I caught my breath. Across his back was a giant tattoo that looked kind of like Ruger's, only it said Devil's Jacks instead of Reaper's. Motorcycle club. Bad news. Always bad, despite what Ruger insisted. I'd think about that later. Focus. I needed to find Noah. Mama? His voice was soft and trembling. I looked around frantically, then saw him climbing in through an open window facing the street. Oh, my God. I moved toward him, forcing myself to approach oh so carefully. Four flights above the ground, and my boy was clinging to a window sill. If I wasn't damned careful, I'd knock him off the ledge. I reached out and clamped my hands around his upper arms, pulling him in and clutching him close. He wrapped around me like a little monkey. I rubbed my hand up and down his back, whispering how much I loved him, and promising never to leave him alone like that again. I don't get what you're so upset about, Miranda muttered, pulling herself up to make room for her asshole boyfriend. There's a fire escape out there, and it's not like it's cold. It's August. Kid was fine. I took a deep breath, closed my eyes, and forced myself to stay calm. Then I opened them and looked past her. That's when I saw the porn on the TV. My eyes skittered away from the sight of a silicone woman screwing four guys simultaneously. Something terrible took fire in my heart. Stupid bitch! Miranda would pay for this. What's your problem, anyway? She slurred. I didn't bother answering. I just needed to get my boy out of there and home safe. I deal with my neighbor tomorrow. Maybe by then I'd have calmed down enough not to end her miserable life. I carried Noah out of the apartment and across the hallway to my own door. 
Somehow I managed to get it open without dropping him, fingers trembling from suppressed rage and a healthy dose of guilt. I'd failed him. My baby needed me, and instead of protecting him, I'd left him parked with a druggie who could have gotten him killed. Being a single mom sucked. It took a warm bath, an hour of snuggles, and four books to get Noah to sleep. Me? I wasn't sure I'd ever sleep again. The summer heat didn't help. I swear the place had zero airflow. After an hour of sweating in the darkness, watching his little chest rise and fall, I gave up. I popped a beer and sat down on our couch, a thousand plans running through my head. First, I'd kill Miranda. Then either I needed to find a new place to live or she did. I also pondered whether to call the cops. I liked the idea of throwing her and her stoner boyfriend to the wolves. They deserved a friendly visit from the boys in blue. But since her man was in a motorcycle club, calling the cops might not be the smartest move. Guys and MCs generally weren't fond of the police, a perspective he and his club brothers might feel the need to share with me once he made bail. Not to mention Child Protective Services would get involved, which could also get pretty ugly. I loved no one would do anything for him. I was a damned good mother. When other girls my age were out partying and having fun, I was taking him to the park and reading him stories. I spent my twenty-first birthday holding him while he puked from stomach flu, instead of hitting the bars. No matter how rough things got, I spent time with Noah every day and made sure he felt loved. But I didn't look so good on paper. Single mom, dad out of the picture, no family around, crappy studio apartment, probably unemployed after tonight. What would CPS make of that? Would they blame me for leaving him with Miranda in the first place? I had no idea what to do. I took a long pull on the beer and then turned on my phone, where Ruger's message glowed at me accusingly. Crap. I hated calling him. No matter how much time he spent with us, and he made a point of seeing Noah regularly, I just couldn't relax around him. Ruger didn't like me, and I knew it. I think he blamed me for destroying his relationship with Zack. God knows I played my part. I pushed that memory away. I always pushed that memory away. If only I unnerved him, too. But apparently that was too much to ask. Instead, he just looked right through me, hardly bothering to acknowledge my existence. Even more frustrating, Ruger had to be the hottest guy I'd ever met. He was all danger and hard muscles, with his tattoos and piercings and that goddamned black Harley of his. When he walked into a room, he owned it because it only took one look to see he was a fucking badass, the type who takes what he wants and never says he's sorry. I'd been nursing a hell of a crush on him for longer than I cared to acknowledge, something he'd failed to notice despite his apparent fascination with every other woman under the age of forty within five hundred miles. Well, failed to notice all but once, and that hadn't exactly ended well. At least he never brought any of his club whores around, which I greatly appreciated but that didn't change the fact that he was one of the biggest sluts in North Idaho. So that's where we stood. Presented with my non-threatening charms, the panhandle's sexiest, most prolific man-whore still preferred hanging with my seven-year-old child during his visits. I sighed and hit the play button. "'Sophie, answer your fucking phone,' he said, his voice cold and unyielding. Like usual. I just got a call from Noah." I talked to him for a while and tried to keep him calm, but then some bitch started yelling and took the phone away. Nobody answered when I called back. I don't know what the fuck you're thinking, but your kid needs you. Get off your ass and go get him. Now. I swear, if anything happens to him, you don't want to go there, Sophie. Just fucking call me when you find him. No excuses. I dropped the phone and leaned forward on my knees rubbing my temples with the tips of my fingers. In addition to everything else, now I had to deal with Mr. Being a Biker isn't a crime losing his shit on me, which he would do, I had no doubt. Ruger was scary enough in a good mood. The one time I'd seen him truly enraged still gave me nightmares, and that's not a figure of speech. Unfortunately, he had a point. 
When my son needed me, I hadn't answered the phone. Thank God Ruger had been there for Noah. But still, I really didn't want to deal with him right now either. I couldn't leave him hanging, though, worried about Noah all night. He'd called me a bitch the last time I'd seen him, and maybe he had a point. But I wasn't a big enough bitch to torture him like that. I hit the callback button. He all right? Ruger demanded, not bothering with a hello. I've got him and he's fine, I said. I couldn't hear the phone ring at work, but I found his message and left about forty-five minutes later. He's okay. We got lucky and nothing happened. Not that I can tell. You sure that asshole didn't touch him? Ruger asked. Noah said he tried to tickle him and make him sit on his lap, but he ran away. They were completely cross-faded. I don't think they even noticed when he took off. He was hiding outside on the fire escape. Fuck, Ruger said. He didn't sound happy. How high up was he? Four stories, I replied, closing my eyes in shame. It's a miracle he didn't fall. Okay, I'm driving. I'll talk to you later. Don't fucking leave him alone again, or you'll answer to me. You got that? Yeah, I whispered. I hung up the phone and set it down on the table. The room felt stifling, and I couldn't get enough air, so I crept softly across the floor to the window. The splintery wooden sash slid up with a groan, and I leaned out, looking down at the street, sucking in the cool breeze. The bars had just emptied, and people laughed outside, walking along like everything was fine and dandy. What if I hadn't checked the voicemail? Would any of these happy drunks have looked up and seen a little boy clinging to the fire escape? What if he'd fallen asleep out there? Noah could be dead on that pavement right now. I finished my beer and grabbed a second one, then sat on my ratty couch and pounded it. The last time I checked the clock, it said 3 a.m. A noise in the pre-dawn darkness woke me. Noah? A hand covered my mouth as a large body came down over mine, pinning me to the couch. Adrenaline poured through me too late. No matter how I struggled, bucking my entire body against his, my attacker held me trapped. All I could think about was Noah, sleeping right across the room. I needed to fight and survive for my son, but I couldn't move, and I couldn't see a damned thing in the darkness. You scared, a rough dark voice whispered in my ear. Wondering if you'll live through the night? What about your kid? I could rape and kill you and then sell him to some sick pedophile fuck. You couldn't do a goddamn thing to stop me. Now could you? How are you going to protect him living in a place like this, Sophie? Fuck. I knew that voice. Ruger. He wouldn't hurt me. Asshole. I didn't even have to break through the fucking pathetic lock you have on this shithole he continued, shifting his hips over mine, emphasizing how little control I held. Your window's open, and so is the window in the hallway. I just stepped out on the fire escape and walked right over, which means anyone else could too, including that sick fuck who messed with our boy earlier. That bastard's still in the building. I want him, Sophie. Nod your head if you'll stay quiet, and I'll let you talk. Don't scare Noah. I nodded my head as best I could, trying to calm the racing of my heart, torn between the remains of fear and my building anger. How dare he judge me? You scream. You'll pay. I jerked my head. He pulled his hand away and I took several deep breaths, blinking rapidly, trying to decide if lunging at him with my teeth would be worth it. Probably not. Ruger was heavy and he covered my entire body, his legs clamping down across mine, my arms trapped deep in the couch. I couldn't remember him ever voluntarily touching me before. Not for four years, at least. That was a good thing, because something about Ruger turned off my brain in a bad way, leaving my body in charge. I got knocked up the last time I left my body in charge. I'd never regret my son, but that didn't mean I should let my libido do the thinking for me again. After I finally got shot of Zack... I'd only gone out with very safe, very boring men. I'd had three lovers total in my life, and numbers two through three were nice and tame. I didn't need a complication like my son's biker uncle, but I'd caught his familiar scent now, gun oil and a hint of male sweat, which led to an annoyingly predictable response down below. 
even angry, I wanted Ruger. In fact, I usually wanted him more when I was angry. This was unfortunate because he had a gift for pissing me off. Life would be so much simpler if I could just hate him. The man was truly an asshole. He just happened to be an asshole who loved the hell out of my kid. So now he lay on top of me, and I wanted to headbutt him or something, but I also felt embarrassing heat pool between my legs. He was big and hard and right there, and I didn't know how to handle that. Ruger always kept his distance from me. I expected him to let me up now that he'd made his point in the least constructive way possible, but that didn't happen. Instead, he shifted again, leaning up on his elbows on either side of me, holding me trapped. His legs moved, one coming to rest between mine, way too intimate. I tried to close my knees, but he narrowed his eyes and slid his hips into the cradle of my pelvis. Wrong, so wrong, and unfair, too, because clenching him between my legs didn't exactly make my brain work better. I squirmed, needing him to be far away from me, immediately, yet I couldn't help wondering whether I could reach down between us and open his fly. The man was like heroin, seductive, addictive, and a damned good way to wake up dead. Hold still, he whispered, voice strained. The fact that my dick's in its happy place is probably saving your life. Trust me when I say I'm seriously considering strangling you, Sophie. Thinking about fucking you helps balance that out. I froze. I couldn't believe he'd just said that. We had an agreement— We'd never discussed it, but we both followed it scrupulously. Sure enough, though, he pressed his hips into mine again, and I felt his hard length growing against my stomach. My inner muscles clenched, sending a wave of need wrenching through me. This was cheating. The infatuation went one way. I lusted after him, he ignored me, and we pretended nothing had ever happened between us. I licked my lips, and his eyes followed the small movement, unfathomable in the dim light starting to filter through the windows. You don't mean that, I whispered. He narrowed his eyes, studying me like a lion scoping out the slowest gazelle. Wait, did lions eat gazelles? Was this really happening? Think. This isn't you, Ruger, I told him. Think about what you just said. Let me up and we'll talk. I fucking mean every word, he replied, harsh and angry. I hear my kid is in trouble and his mom's nowhere to be found. I spent hours driving across the state, scared shitless that someone's molesting or murdering our boy. And when I finally get here, I find you in a total shithole with a broken lock on the downstairs door and easy access to your apartment through an open window. I crawl in and find you passed out on the couch half-naked and smelling like beer. He dropped his head down, scenting me and twisting his hips into mine. Shit, that felt good. I actually ached between my legs. It felt so good. I could have taken him away from you easy as fuck, he continued, raising his head, eyes burning through me. And if I could, so could anyone else, which is not fucking okay. So you'll just have to sit tight and wait for me to cool down a little, because right now I'm not feeling particularly reasonable. Until then I'd suggest you not tell me what I mean. You got that? I nodded my head eyes wide. I believed every word he said. Ruger held my gaze as he shifted his legs again, and then both were between mine and I felt every inch of his dick right up against my crotch. He surrounded me completely, overwhelming me with his strength, and I had a sudden, crazy flashback to that night I'd lost my virginity to Zack in Ruger's apartment. Me sprawled on a couch, legs spread, watching my life fall to shit. Full circle. Adrenaline still raced through me, and he wasn't the only one who needed to cool down a bit. He'd scared me, damn it, and now the bastard was turning me on, a sensation that mixed disturbingly well with the anger and fear already overwhelming my system. I really couldn't move, either. Ruger dropped his head down next to mine and groaned, grinding his hips into me. A swirl of tingling, tightening, traitorous desire twisted up along my spine from my pelvis— I moaned as he pressed hard against my clit. This felt good. Too good. My inner slot suggested a surefire way to burn off tension. As if reading my mind, Ruger's breath caught. Then he pushed into me harder, rubbing his length back and forth against the thin layer of cotton covering my center. 
Neither of us said anything, but I tilted my hips up to feel him better, and he stiffened. This is a bad idea, I thought, arching into him, closing my eyes. I'd wanted him for years. Every time I saw him, I secretly wondered what he'd feel like inside me. Of course, if we did this, I'd still have to look at his smug, smirking face. He wouldn't even be embarrassed, the stupid jerk. We had to stop immediately. But he felt fucking incredible. His scent surrounded me, the hard strength of his body pinning and spreading me like a captured butterfly. His nose brushed the curve of my ear, and then he dropped lower, giving my neck a slow, sucking kiss, lips dragging across my skin, until I had to bite my own to stay quiet. I twisted underneath him and acknowledged the truth. I wanted him deep inside. Now! I didn't care that captured butterflies die when they're pinned. Mama? Shit. I tried to speak, but nothing came out. I cleared my throat and tried again, the heat of Ruger's breath playing across my cheek. My entire body throbbed, and he shifted, slowly dragging his hips across mine again, deliberately taunting me. Bastard. Hey, baby, I called to Noah, my voice unsteady. Um, give me a sec, okay? We have company. Is it Uncle Ruger? Ruger thrust against me one last time before jackknifing up. I sat up unsteadily, throwing my hands up and down my arms. Noah's voice should have been cold water on my libido, but no such luck. I still felt Ruger's delicious hardness between my legs. I'm here, little man, Ruger said, standing and running his hands across his head. I studied him in the dim morning light, wishing with all my heart he looked more like my former boss, Dick. No such luck. Ruger was over six feet tall, roped with muscle, and annoyingly handsome in an I'm probably a murderer, but I've got dimples and a tight ass, so you'll still lust after me kind of way. Sometimes he wore a mohawk, but the last few months he'd taken to wearing the same buzz cut he'd had when we first met, the slightly longer hair on top, dark and thick. Combined with his size, his piercings, his black leather club vest, and the tattooed sleeves on both arms, he belonged on a wanted poster. Noah should have been terrified of him, but he didn't seem to notice how scary his uncle was. He never had. I promised I'd come get you, didn't I? Ruger said softly. Noah crawled out of bed and stumbled over to Ruger, reaching his arms up for a hug. Ruger caught my boy and swung him high, meeting his gaze eye to eye, man to man. Ruger always did that. He took Noah seriously. You okay, bud? Noah nodded, wrapping his arms around his uncle's neck and clutching him close. He worshipped Ruger, and the feeling was mutual. The sight was heartbreaking. I always thought Zack would be Noah's hero. Obviously, my instincts were shit. I'm proud of you, little man, Ruger told him. I stood, planning to join them, but Ruger turned away. So he wanted some privacy. I wasn't going to argue if it made Noah feel safe— but I still strained to hear the conversation as he carried my boy back to bed. You did good, Colin, for help, I heard him say faintly. You ever get in a situation like that again? You call me. Call your mama. You can call the cops, too. You remember how to do that? Nine one one, Noah muttered, his voice sleepy and thick. A giant yawn caught him off guard and he slumped against Ruger's shoulder. But I'm only supposed to do that in an emergency and I wasn't sure if I'd get in trouble. A bad man touches you? That's an emergency, Ruger murmured. But you did your best. You did what I said. You hid, and that was real good, little man. I want you to lie down and go back to sleep, okay? In the morning, I'm taking you to my house, and you'll never have to see those people or this place again. But you can't come with me if you're too tired. I caught my breath. What the hell? I watched as he tucked Noah in, my mood far from mellow. Seconds later, my kiddo was out again, clearly still exhausted. I pulled on a robe and waited for Ruger to come back, crossing my arms and bracing for battle. He cocked a brow at me, deliberately checking me out. Was he trying to use sex to bully me? That might explain his little seduction on the couch game. You forget the part about not pissing me off? Why did you tell Noah he's going to your house— you can't make promises like that. I'm taking him home to Coeur with me, Ruger replied, his voice matter-of-fact. 
He tilted his head to the side, waiting for the fight he had to know was coming. His neck was thick with muscles, and his biceps flexed as he crossed his arms, matching my stance. It really wasn't fair. A man this frustrating should be short and fat, with hairy ears or something. But it didn't matter how sexy he was this time. I wouldn't cave. He wasn't Noah's dad, and he could step the fuck off. I'm betting you'll want to come with us, and that's great. But he's not staying in this shit hole another night. I shook my head slowly and deliberately. I felt the same way about our apartment. It didn't feel safe any more. But I wasn't going to let him just swoop in and take over. I'd find us a new place. I wasn't quite sure how, but I'd do it. I'd spent the last seven years honing my survival skills. You don't get to make that decision. He's not your son, Ruger. Decisions made, Ruger replied, and he may not be my son, but he's definitely my kid. I claimed him the minute he was born, and you damned well know it's true. I didn't like how you took him so far from me, but I respect why you did it. Things have changed now. Mom's dead. Zack's gone, and this. He gestured around the ratty little studio. This isn't good enough. What the fuck do you need in your life that's more important than giving Noah a safe place to live? I glared at him. What's that supposed to mean? Keep it down, Ruger told me, stepping forward into my space, pushing me back. It was a power play, pure physical intimidation. I'll bet it usually worked for him too, because when he loomed over me like that, every survival instinct I had told me to roll over and follow his orders. Something quivered down below. Stupid body. It means exactly what it sounds like. He continued, "What the fuck are you spending your child support on? Because it sure as shit isn't this hellhole. And why the fuck did you move out of your other place?" It wasn't great, but it was okay, and it had that little park and playground. When you told me you were moving, I thought that meant you found something nicer. I'm here because I got evicted for not paying my rent. His jaw tightened convulsively. His expression darkened. Something impossible to read filling his eyes. You want to tell me why exactly? I'm just hearing about this situation. No, I replied honestly. I don't want to tell you anything. It's none of your business. He stilled, taking a series of deep breaths. Long seconds passed, and I realized he was consciously forcing himself to calm down. I thought he'd been angry before, but the cold fury that came off him now was a whole new level. I shivered. That was one of the many problems with Ruger. Sometimes he scared me, and the guys in his club, even scarier. Ruger was poisoned to a woman in my situation, no matter how sweet he was to Noah, or how badly my body craved his touch. Noah is my business," he finally said, each word slow and deliberate. "Everything that touches him is my business. You don't get it. That's your problem. But it ends tonight. I'm taking him home where it's safe, so I won't ever get another fucking phone call like that one again." Jesus, you haven't even done the basics to secure this place. Don't you ever listen to me? I told you to get some of those little alarms for the windows until I could come over and wire the place up right. I steeled my spine and held fast. One, you don't get to take him anywhere. I said, trying very hard not to flinch or let my voice tremble. I couldn't afford to show any weakness, despite the fact that I was perilously close to peeing myself. And two. Your asshole brother hasn't paid me any child support for nearly a year now. Health and welfare can't find a trace of him either. I did my best, but I couldn't keep up the rent on the other place. I can afford the rent here, so we moved. You have no right to judge me. I'd like to see you raise a child on what I earn. They don't just give out those window alarms for free, Ruger. His jaw twitched. Zach's working the oil fields in North Dakota. He said slowly. Making damned good money. I talked to him two months ago about Mom's estate. He said everything was okay between you two. He lied, I said forcefully. That's what he does, Ruger. This isn't news. Are you really surprised? I felt suddenly tired. Thinking about Zach always made me tired, but sleep wasn't the answer. 
He waited for me in my dreams, too. I always woke up screaming. Ruger turned and walked over to the window, leaning on the sill and looking outside thoughtfully. Thank God he seemed to be calming down. If he didn't look so deceptively attractive silhouetted in my window, my world would make sense again. I guess I shouldn't be, he said after a long pause. We both know he's a fucking loser. But you should have told me. I wouldn't have let this happen. It wasn't your problem, I replied softly. We were doing fine, at least until tonight. My regular sitters all have the flu that's going around. I made a mistake. I won't make it again. No, you won't, Ruger said, turning to face me. He tilted his head to the side, eyes boring through me. He looked a little different, I realized. He'd lost a bunch of his piercings. Too bad it hadn't softened him up even a little bit, because his expression was pure steel. I won't let you. It's time to admit you can't do it all on your own. Club's full of women who love kids. They'll help out. We're a family, and family doesn't stand by when someone's in trouble. I'd opened my mouth to argue when I heard a light knock on the door. Ruger pushed off the window and strode over to open it. A giant of a man walked in, taller even than Ruger, which was saying something. He wore faded jeans, a dark shirt, and a black leather vest covered with patches, just like Ruger's, including his name and a little red diamond with a one percent symbol on it. All the Reapers had them, and my old friend Kimber had told me it meant they were outlaws. That I had no trouble believing. This new guy had shoulder-length, darkish hair and a face so perfectly handsome he could have been a movie star. Under one arm he held a stack of broken-down cardboard boxes, tied together with what looked like bailing wire. In the other he held an aluminum baseball bat and a roll of duct tape. I swallowed and nearly fainted. My hands actually started sweating because I'm cliché like that. My nemesis hadn't just come to rescue us. He'd brought along one of his accomplices— that was the biggest problem with Ruger. He was a package deal. You bought one Reaper, you bought them all. Well, all of them who weren't currently serving time. This is one of my brothers, of course, Ruger said, closing the door behind him. He's going to help us move your shit. Stay quiet, but start packing whatever you want to bring. You'll be staying in the basement at my place. Don't think you've seen my new property, he added pointedly which I knew was a dig at me for refusing his offer of a room at the beginning of the summer when we visited Coeur d'Alene. But it's got a daylight basement with a kitchen and everything, and you'll have your own little patio. There's tons of space for Noah to run around, too. It's furnished, so only bring what you really care about. The rest of this shit can stay. He glanced around the room, judging my furniture. I saw his point. Most of it had been scrounged off curbs next to dumpsters. The finer pieces came from thrift stores. How's the kid? Horse asked softly, setting the boxes down and leaning them against the wall. Then he hefted the bat, giving it a little toss and catching it with his other hand. I couldn't help but notice how thick his arms were. Apparently club life wasn't all drinking and whoring, because Ruger and his friend obviously did some serious weightlifting. Did the bastard touch him? What are we dealing with? No, it's fine. I said quickly. I eyed the tape, which Horace had failed to deposit next to the folded boxes. He was scared, but it's over now. And we really don't need your help, because we aren't going back to Coeur d'Alene. Horace ignored me, glancing toward Ruger. The guy's still here? Dunno yet, Ruger replied. He looked to me. Sophie, show us which apartment they're in. What are you going to do? I asked, glancing between them. Their faces were completely blank. You can't actually kill him. You know that, right? We don't kill people, Ruger said, his voice calm and almost soothing. But sometimes assholes like him have accidents when they aren't careful. Can't control that. It's a fact of life. Show us where he is. I looked at Horse's big, strong hands holding his baseball bat and the roll of duct tape, one thumb caressing the silver surface. Then I thought about Noah clinging to a fire escape, four stories high, hiding from a bad man who wanted him to sit on his lap so he could tickle him. I thought about the booze and the pot and the porn. Then I walked to the door, 
opened it, and pointed across the hall toward Miranda's studio. There and there. Chapter 2 Ten minutes later, I couldn't stop wondering what Ruger meant by the word accident. Were they planning a fatal accident? I told myself it wasn't my problem. Miranda's fate was set the moment Noah called Ruger, crying and begging for help, totally beyond my control. Telling myself that worked for about half an hour, and then my conscience kicked in. If Ruger and Horse weren't planning to kill someone, why did they need a bat and duct tape? Those weren't constructive discussion about what you did wrong supplies. Those were killing someone and hiding the body supplies. The only thing missing was a box of big black garbage bags. I'd seen Dexter. I knew these things. Miranda deserved serious payback for Noah, but she didn't deserve to die. I didn't need that kind of karma. I called Ruger's cell. He didn't answer. Then I crept across the hall and knocked on the door. There weren't any screams or anything coming from inside. Good sign or bad? Hard to tell. This was my first felony, and I didn't know the proper procedure. I heard boots crossing the creaky wooden floor. It's me, I said, pitching my voice low. Can you come out for a sec? I really need to talk, Ruger. Ruger's busy, Horse replied through the door. We'll be done here soon. Go get packed and take care of your boy. We got this. I tried the knob. Locked. Seriously, Sophie, go back to your place. I backed away from the door. Now what? The open window at the end of the hall caught my eye. A fire escape. Ruger had used it to get into my apartment, and Miranda's place was a mirror of mine. Maybe I could get in that way to make sure everything was all right. I ducked back into my studio for a quick check on Noah, closing and locking my own window while I was at it. Thankfully, he was still totally out. Not a surprise, given the night we'd had. I slipped through the door and locked it, then walked over to the hall window and stuck my head out to scope the situation. Sure enough, the narrow iron landing stretched from my window and across the hallway before stopping under hers. I put my leg through cautiously and stepped onto the platform, making it creak. I glanced down and swallowed. Never been a huge fan of heights. I held the rail with one hand, trailing the other along the brick wall until I reached her closed window. I crouched low, peeking through. Miranda wasn't much of a decorator, so she didn't have real blinds, just a filmy, translucent scarf she'd tacked over the pane. Details might be a little fuzzy, but I could still see clearly enough. Her boyfriend lay face down on the floor, hands bound tightly behind his back with duct tape. They'd wrapped his feet, too, with more tape around his head, like they'd decided to shut his mouth and just kept going. Blood trailed from a cut on his forehead and dripped out of his nose. Bruises were forming along his ribs. He seemed to be unconscious. Ruger stood over him, aluminum bat in one hand, cell phone in the other. Miranda knelt in the middle of the room, hands taped tight just like her man's. More duct tape covered her mouth and she wore a sleazy nightgown that was probably supposed to look sexy. Horse lounged casually across from her, leaning against the wall. He seemed bored. I sighed with relief. I'd been crazy to think they'd actually butcher two people in cold blood. That didn't happen in real life. Sure, whatever was going on in there didn't look fun, but I could live with that. Ruger hung up his phone and shoved it into his pocket. He said something to Horse. Horse shrugged and must have cracked some sort of joke because Ruger laughed. Then the big man walked over to Miranda, knelt down, and ripped the strip of silver off her face. Her lips quivered as she asked him a question. He shook his head as he replied, and she started trembling so hard I could see it from across the room and through the curtain. Then things got bad. Horse reached around and pulled an ugly black handgun out of the back of his jeans. I watched in frozen horror as he cocked the slider thingy on top, clearly preparing to shoot. Then he said something else to Miranda. Tears ran down her face as she slowly opened her mouth. Horse nudged her lips wider with the barrel of his gun, pushing it in. Holy fuck! Holy fuck! I jumped up and pounded on the window with both hands, screaming at them to stop. 
Ruger spun around, moving so fast I couldn't follow. Within seconds he'd ripped open the window and jerked me into the room. The sash crashed down again as he wrapped his arms around me, pinning me to the front of his body, my back to his stomach. I tried to scream again, but his hand slammed across my mouth. The bat clattered as it rolled across the wooden floor. Miranda's eyes darted toward me, full of desperate hope that quickly melted when neither man moved. Then Horse spoke. Time's up, sugar. Usually people close their eyes. Your call. Miranda moaned, shutting her eyes tight and visibly bracing her body. Horse glanced up, smiled, and blew me a kiss. Then he pulled the trigger. Ruger. Sophie exploded in his arms, thrashing furiously. Her bitch of a neighbor screamed and fell back on the floor, flopping around dramatically. Neither seemed to notice the fucking gun hadn't been loaded. Ruger fought to control the banshee in his arms, hating horse because the bastard just stood there, smirking at him like the smug, cock-sucking asshole he'd always been. Seriously, a goddamned kiss? Sick fuck. One of Sophie's heels lashed back and caught him in the shin. When he grunted, she kicked the same spot again, savagely. Fifty bucks says your baby mama could take you in a fair fight, Horse taunted. Miranda's shrieking suddenly stopped and she froze, opening her eyes to look around in stunned confusion. Finally, Dumbass had noticed she wasn't dead. Sophie stilled and Ruger's aching shin rejoiced. Feel like I'm repeating myself here, he muttered in her ear, but if I move my hand you better keep quiet. Got me. She nodded her head tightly. Ruger let go and Sophie jerked away. Fast as a snake, her hand flashed out and slapped him across the face, which fucking hurt. Damn. You bastard, she hissed. You scared the crap out of me. What kind of sadist pulls shit like this? The kind interested in making a lasting impression? Ruger asked, cocking his head at her. Jesus, did you want us to kill her? Sophie's face twisted and her mouth opened, but before anything came out, the bitch on the floor started crying. Loud. Ruger had come to realize Miranda did everything loud. Horse leaned forward and caught Miranda's arms, jerking her up and onto her knees. He caught her chin, forcing her to meet his gaze. We do this again. A bullet comes out and pulps your brain, got me? She nodded frantically, her sobs even noisier than before. How was that even possible? Then Ruger caught the unmistakable smell of piss and sighed. Sure enough, she'd left a puddle. Every fucking time, he muttered. Horse snorted. Pussy. I can't believe you guys, Sophie said, clenching and unclenching her hands, shaking with adrenaline. She was so angry she'd forgotten to be afraid. He actually liked that about her. Sophie had grit. But right now she was getting on his nerves. They had a lot to do in limited time before the Jack showed up. I thought you were killing her. She thought you were killing her. How can you do this? We wanted to catch her attention, Ruger replied, temper fraying. Near-death experiences tend to stick with a person. Next time she'll make better choices. Sophie opened her mouth, then snapped it shut and glared. The sound of tape ripping cut the air as horse covered Miranda's mouth again. Thank fuck for that. Ruger was tired of her noise. He was exhausted from driving all night, and he was hungry. Go back next door, Sophie, he said, rubbing a hand through his short hair. He caught a whiff of his own scent when he raised his arm. Nasty. He'd have to shower at her place before they left for Coeur d'Alene. We won't go crazy, I promise. But don't forget, Noah spent more than an hour hiding on the fire escape last night. Four stories up, Sophie. Your babysitter's man is a registered sex offender, by the way. Bitch knew it, too. She still invited him over while she had a kid at her place. Don't feel sorry for either of them. Sophie's eyes widened. How do you know all that? Horse answered. They told us. I wouldn't think sex offenders go around sharing that kind of information, she said, suddenly wary. We're very persuasive people, Ruger told her. You just gotta ask the questions right. Go home, Soph. We need to finish up here and get you moved out. I'm tired, honey. This is all wrong. I feel like an accomplice, Sophie replied, shaking her head. I don't like it. 
For fuck's sake. She hadn't been too worried about being an accomplice when she pointed out Miranda's place earlier. A little late to be complaining at this point in the game. Enough. Really? You don't like it? Personally, I don't like the idea of the next kid getting raped just because he isn't smart enough to hide on the fire escape, Ruger said, stepping slowly into her space and backing her toward the wall. How about this? You go ahead and feel guilty about being an accomplice, and I'll go ahead and keep doing your dirty work so you don't break a fucking nail or something. Then tonight, we'll open a bottle of wine and talk about how today made us feel. Maybe eat some chocolate while we're at it, then watch The Notebook together. That work for you? She hit the wall and he leaned forward, slapping his hands flat on either side of her head. Ruger dropped his face into hers, eyes blazing. Shit, Sophie. I think I'm showing extreme patience, all things considered. This is not a fucking joke. No one made it through last night because he stayed awake and alert on that fire escape, not because either of these fucks lifted a finger to help them. They terrorized a little boy and laughed about it. Now it's their turn. Don't expect me to feel bad about that. Go home. Sophie swallowed, eyes wide. She stayed quiet as she slowly slid down and out from under the barrier of his arms, skirting the edge of the room until she reached the door. She slipped through, closing it behind her very softly. Ruger glanced over at Horse, who raised a brow. Great. Now we'd catch shit from him, too. Your baby mama's kind of hot when she's pissed, Horse said helpfully. Jesus, Horse, you got no sense of boundaries, you know that? Yep, he replied, and Ruger seriously considered taking the bat and smashing the bastard's face in. Of course, then he'd have Horse's old lady to deal with. Bitch was a damned good shot. Miranda fell over with a thump, eyes wide. They looked down at her. What should we do with this one? Horse asked. I want her out of our faces, but I gotta say... Don't like the idea of leaving her here for the jacks when they come to pick up their problem child. He jerked his chin toward the still unconscious man on the floor. Let her go right before we take off, Ruger suggested. He walked over and nudged her with his foot. Hey, Miranda, we cut that tape off in a couple hours. We need to worry about you sharing this little adventure with anyone, because that would put me in a real bad mood. She shook her head violently. You sure? Horace asked. If it's a problem, we'll figure out something else for you. Saw an empty lot not too far from here. Wonder how long it'll take before some construction worker digs up your body. Miranda grunted, eyes wide. I'm gonna assume that means you'll keep your mouth shut, Ruger said, sighing and rubbing the back of his neck. Muscles were way too tight back there. Oh, something else you should know. It's not just us you'd be dealing with if you talk. There's a hundred and thirty-four brothers in the club. Generally... I'm considered one of the nicer ones. True story, Horse chimed in. Fuck with us. We'll fuck you back. Harder. Always. She nodded frantically. Sounds like a plan, Horse said. He glanced over at the man on the floor and then caught Ruger's eye. Might want to tell your baby mama that the next time she has a run-in with a guy from another club, she should give us a heads up before we go in. This could have been ugly. She doesn't get it. Not ink, not cuts, nothing. She may have seen his tats, but she didn't know what they meant. Tape, Ruger said. Horse tossed it over and Ruger crouched down next to the woman. Legs together, bitch. It'll be a new experience for you. She obeyed, and he started wrapping tape tight around her ankles. You were still in Afghanistan when Sophie and Zach's shit went down, Ruger told Horse. But trust me, it got ugly, and we didn't exactly socialize after that. She hates me, she hates the club, and the only reason she puts up with the situation is that she loves Noah too much to take away the only man in his life. Sucks for him. But I'm the best he's got. Sounds like she's a bitch, Horse said. Rumor is you saved her ass. Fucking knight in shining armor might want to trade your bike in for a pretty pink unicorn to ride, seeing as you're such a special snowflake and all. Shut the fuck up, asshole, Ruger replied. I saved her, but I also lost my shit on her in a big way. At a time, she couldn't handle it. Not that it matters now. Long story short, she knows jack about club colors or how we live. She didn't mention the back patch because she's fucking clueless. If I could offer a suggestion? Horse asked. No. You gotta tell her what to expect. Help her understand club life before she fucks up again, he said. 
Save yourself an ass load of trouble down the line. Trust me on this, bro. Breaking in a civilian like Sophie as your old lady is rough enough. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Also, she's got a hell of a mouth on her. What happens in private is one thing, but she can't pull that kind of shit at the armory. You know it's true. Ruger snorted, dropping the tape as he finished wrapping Miranda's legs. Why had he brought horse? Anyone would have been less annoying. Even Painter, despite the fact the kid probably couldn't find his own dick in the shower, let alone pin down a woman. Unfortunately, only Horse had been both sober and stupid enough to answer his phone in the middle of the night. This'll be hard for your tiny little brain to process, so listen carefully, Ruger said, rising to his feet and tossing the tape onto the couch. One, she's not my baby mama, so stop calling her that. Only funny the first fifty times. Two, I'm not planning to make her my property. I'm helping out because she's Noah's mom and for all practical purposes he's my son. I'll keep an eye on her for his sake, but she's a free agent. I doubt she'll ever set foot in the armory, no matter what I tell her. Bullshit. Not bullshit, Ruger snapped. She doesn't want me, asshole. Trust me. I have reason to know this. Our history is fucking complicated. Way too complicated for a dumbass cocksucker like you to understand. You struck out, Horse declared, a slow grin stealing across his face. And you're still driving across the state in the middle of the night so you can set her up in your house? You are well and truly screwed, brother. I didn't strike out, Ruger replied, eyes narrow. It wasn't like that, and I don't think of her that way. Here's a suggestion for future reference, then, Horse said. Try jerking off before answering the door if you want me to believe you don't think of her that way. Wood like you were sporting usually implies the opposite. Unless it was for me? If that's the case, I'm genuinely flattered. No judgments. Why hasn't Marie shot you yet? Because I'm not in denial about what my cock wants, Horse replied. I piss her off, I get no pussy. Watch and learn. Now let's get them locked down and start hauling your girl's shit out to the truck. Jax'll be here in a couple more hours, and I don't particularly care to stay and discuss techniques for removing dumbasses ink with them. What kind of suicidal idiot doesn't black out his tats when his club cuts him loose? Well, he joined the Devil's Jacks in the first place, Ruger replied, shrugging. That doesn't say much for his intelligence. Hope he has health insurance. Probably gonna need it. Only if he's lucky. So tell me, brother, how many times you've seen the notebook? Cause that's information the boys back home are gonna need to know. Asshole. Sophie. Noah slurped down his cereal, hopping in his chair like a bouncy ball. We're going to Uncle Ruger's today, right? Do you think he has Skylanders? Yep, we're going to Uncle Ruger's. No idea about the Skylanders, but I wouldn't get your hopes up, I replied. My rush of adrenaline had died down, making it harder to sustain any real anger. Instead, I surveyed my studio and finally admitted the truth. The place was a total shithole. Not only that, I had no excuse for not putting on the window alarms. They sold them at the dollar store, for God's sake. I didn't like letting Ruger win, but reality was on his side. I was broke, I'd lost my job, and I couldn't protect my own child. Waiting tables hadn't paid enough to support us anyway, and I wouldn't have been working there in the first place if I'd had better offers. My folks certainly wouldn't help. I'd been dead to them ever since I refused to terminate Noah. Turning down a safe, free apartment would be insane. I still wasn't quite ready to forgive Ruger, though. Intellectually, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Sure, he'd been a dick to me. He'd also dropped everything to drive hundreds of miles and save Noah when he'd needed help. The two should probably balance each other out if I wanted to be fair. Not only that, Ruger had made a point I couldn't shake. I really didn't want to do my own dirty work. Ruger and Horace had assessed the situation, made a tough call, and fixed things. And that was a huge relief. Ultimately, I'd gotten mad at Ruger for scaring me, not for scaring Miranda. Well, that and his bullying. He could have just talked to me about moving to Coeur d'Alene instead of playing creeper man in the night. We have to pack before we leave, I said, as Noah finished up his cereal. He carried his bowl carefully to the sink, spoon teetering. We aren't just going for a visit. We'll be living there for a while. I'm going to get most of your stuff, but I want you to pick out some jammies and clothes to wear tomorrow. 
Tuck them in your backpack. You should also grab some books to read in the car, okay? Okay, Noah replied, dragging his bag out from under his bed. He didn't seem bothered at the thought, which said a lot about our existence. He'd moved at least once a year his entire life. I shook my head, feeling the familiar weight of guilt settle over me. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't seem to get it right. I rinsed out his bowl and put on some coffee. Then I grabbed a box to start packing. Want some music? I asked Noah. My pick? Sure, I said, handing him my phone. He plugged it into our little speaker set like an expert. Here comes science started playing, and after a few minutes we were both singing along about the elements and the elephants. As kid stuff went, it wasn't too bad. Beat the hell out of Disney crap. We didn't actually own much, so packing wasn't hard. Coffee helped. Three boxes of stuff for Noah, two boxes for me, plus a suitcase. I had to stand on a chair to take down our big tie-dyed wall hanging. We'd made it together last summer, on one of those glorious days where the sun is so bright and beautiful you don't even consider making your kid go in at bedtime. I used it to wrap the framed family portrait I'd splurged on when Noah was three. Then I looked around the room. Not much left, just the kitchen and bathroom stuff. Packing up two lives should take more than an hour, I thought wistfully. I decided to take a quick shower before clearing out the bathroom. Don't open the door unless it's Uncle Ruger or his friend, I told Noah, emptying the coffee pot into my mug. You cool with that? I'm not a child, he replied, offering me a look of genuine disgust. I'll be in second grade soon. Okay, seeing as you're an adult, you go ahead and finish up out here. Make sure I haven't missed something, I replied. I'll wash up fast. I shut the door and pulled off my clothes. The room was small, but at least we had a tub. Unfortunately, the hot water situation wasn't too great. One of the joys of living on the top floor of a building was shared boilers. I showered quickly, grabbing a towel as I stepped out, dripping all over my dirty laundry. I dried off and wrapped the towel around my head before reaching for my clean clothes. They weren't there. I'd already packed them all up without giving it a second thought. Well, crap. I heard Ruger's voice in the apartment. Wasn't that just perfect? I grabbed a second towel and wrapped it around my body, opening the door a crack. Noah, can you come here? I called. He's downstairs with horse. Wanted to help load the truck, Ruger answered. He strolled toward the bathroom, all lean and tall and full of controlled strength a great big killer cat. He stopped outside the door and crossed his muscular arms, eyes dark with something I couldn't interpret. Memories of those arms around me earlier flashed through my head, and I flushed. Stupid. Ruger was a dead end, at least in terms of a relationship, and I sure as hell didn't want a booty call. Okay, that was a lie. I'd love a good booty call. Just not with a guy I'd still have to deal with ten years from now. My hormones needed to find something else to obsess about. What's up? he asked. I forgot clean clothes, I told him, considering my strategy. You mind stepping outside for a sec? I'll get dressed fast. You gonna give me crap about coming to Coeur d'Alene? he asked, raising a brow in challenge. Great, I'd gotten over my snit, but clearly he hadn't. No. You wanna bitch me out for what happened next door? No. That's a fast turnaround. I don't have a lot of choice, I admitted, forcing myself not to grit my teeth. It's not what I'd pick, but it's better than staying here, and you win. I didn't want to do my own dirty work. I'm glad you did it for me. Happy? You say that like it hurts. It did hurt. The man was like a cheese grater on my skin. Just let me grab something to wear, Ruger. You won. Don't rub it in. He laughed, the sound harsh. Glad you figured that out, he said. Life's easier when you have help, like it or not. I'll dig something out for you. Suitcase? That's okay, I started, but he'd already turned and grabbed the bag, flopping it on the now-naked bed to unzip it. I swallowed as he began digging around. Not that I had anything to hide, but I didn't like him touching my things. Way too intimate. Nice, Ruger said, turning back toward me, dangling a black lacy push-up bra from one finger. 
The side of his mouth twitched, and those dark eyes warmed. You should wear this one. Put it down, Ruger, I told him. Just go outside. I'll find what I need. I like these ones, too, he said, pulling out a pair of turquoise panties. They'd go good with the garter belt. I bit back a groan. I might have a thing for pretty underwear, but I didn't need his input. Jerk. I checked my towel, making sure it was securely tucked in. Then I walked out of the bathroom, determined to get his hands off my panties. Just put them down, I repeated, as I moved across the floor. He turned toward me, eyes sweeping over my figure and pausing on my breasts. I felt exposed and uncomfortable, which was silly. The towel covered more than most swimsuits. He had a hungry gleam in his eye, though. One I refused to take as a compliment— We'd already established that Ruger found me attractive on a basic biological level. Problem was, Ruger found every woman attractive on a basic biological level. I really didn't like this new dynamic between us. Things were more comfortable when Ruger treated me like a piece of unwanted furniture. But I like them, he said, examining the soft fabric with a smirk. I grabbed for the panties, but he held them out of my reach. I just got done convincing myself I've been unfair to you, I told him, narrowing my eyes. Don't ruin it. Ruger didn't say anything for several seconds. Then he stretched the panties between his hands like a rubber band and shot them at my face. I lurched to grab the silky blue missile. That's when the towel slipped and I flashed enough of myself to earn a damned fine collection of Mardi Gras beads. Nice rack, Ruger told me. Checked out the rest of you before, but never those. Usually the other way around, now that I think of it. Tits before. Jesus, you're a pig, I said, cutting him off as I jerked up the towel. I'll concede the point, he said, shrugging and stepping away from the suitcase. But only if you wear that black bra. I liked the girls. They deserve something nice. Asshole, I muttered, busy mood back in full force. I dug through my bag, pulling out a pair of ratty cutoffs. Then I spotted the super tight, super low cut Barbie is a slut tank top my friend Carrie got me two years ago for Halloween when we stayed with her folks in Olympia. We'd taken no out trick or treating wearing friendly witch costumes early in the evening. Then we tucked him safely in bed at her mom's place and took ourselves out trick or drinking. I made out with three different guys at three different parties, using three different names. We finished by eating our weight in chocolate chip pancakes at IHOP as the sun rose. Best night ever. I pulled the tank out with a smile. Ruger wanted to treat me like one of his sluts? I could go there. I'd let him perv on my boobs all day, publicly. Maybe I'd flirt a little too, but not with him. Nope, he could just suck it while I flashed the world. I would teach him to play with my panties. I hoped his balls turned so blue they froze. I ignored him as I took the shorts, tank, bra, and panties back to the bathroom and got dressed. I dried my hair and put on full war paint. Then I stepped out to find Horse and Noah were back. Hey, Mom, Horse has a dog named Ariel. Can we get a dog, too? Noah asked the instant he saw me. I don't think so, I replied. A dog's a lot of work. We should start smaller. Maybe a hamster. Let's ask Uncle Ruger if that's okay, or if he thinks it's too much. I smiled at Ruger, whose eyes were glued to my chest. I adjusted my tank, pulling it down just enough to expose the top of the bra he'd requested. He wanted to break our rules and bully me? No problem. I was a big girl now, and I could fight back. So, what do you think, Uncle Ruger? I asked sweetly. Is it too much? Chapter 3 Despite his earlier breakfast, Noah had no trouble polishing off a full plate of pancakes, two slices of bacon, and a glass of orange juice. Another growth spurt coming, I realized. That sucked. Seemed like I'd just bought him new clothes a month ago. Every time I caught up, the kid got bigger. You done? I asked him, leaning back in the booth. We'd finished packing an hour ago, at which point Ruger and Horse kicked us out. Apparently, we were getting in their way. Ruger handed me two twenties and told me to take Noah out for breakfast down the street, 
which made sense, given the long car ride ahead of us. I didn't like taking his money, but I had to be practical. I couldn't afford to waste cash on something as frivolous as eating out. Don, Noah said, grinning at me. God, he was beautiful. His face still held a hint of the softness he'd been born with, but his legs and arms were getting lanky. He liked his hair on the long side, so it hung shaggy around his face and shoulders. Not quite long enough for a ponytail, but close. People told me I should cut it. I figured it should be his choice. When he was older, he'd learn all about peer pressure and fitting in. For now, I wanted him to enjoy the blissful freedom that comes from not giving a rat's ass about the world's opinions. His skin was light, with a smattering of freckles across his nose and face. Sometimes I caught glimpses of myself or Zack in him, but not often. Noah was his own person. No question of that. Kind of took after Ruger that way, I mused. Okay, let's go, I said, dropping some money on the table. I tipped the waitress nearly fifty percent. She seemed overworked, and I knew how that felt. Also, it wasn't my money. I texted Ruger as I left, wondering if we'd killed enough time. He replied, telling me to give him another thirty minutes. We didn't have a park right by our apartment, but there was a lot about three blocks away that Noah liked running around in. I'd heard it used to be a hangout for dealers and users, but a few years back, yuppies had started moving into the neighborhood. Now about half of it was a community garden, and the rest was for the kids. Someone had built a wooden swing set. Murals on the sides of the buildings bordering the lot kept the place looking cheerful and bright. It took us about ten minutes to reach the park, and Noah made the most of his time there. I ran laps with him around the edges, hoping to tire him out. It didn't work, of course. Then we headed back, popping into a used bookstore on the way to pick out something special for the car ride. We found Horace Ruger and two guys I didn't recognize on the sidewalk outside the building. The newcomers wore leather vests that read Devil's Jacks across the back. Below that was a picture of a red devil and the word Nomad. They were both tall guys, one bulky in a muscular way and the other long and lean in his strength. Both had dark hair. One raised his chin in silent greeting. The men clearly appreciated my Barbie tank top. They were both attractive, but the tall one was actually almost pretty. He was so cute. He had floppy brown hair and hadn't shaved in a couple of days. He wore a battered flogging Molly T-shirt with his faded jeans and leather boots. Both of them looked about my age. Hey, I said, coming up to them, smiling. You must be Ruger's friends. Nice to meet you. I'm Sophie. This is my boy Noah. Ruger's eyes narrowed. Go wait in the car," he said, tossing me his keys. "Those aren't my keys. Introduce me to your friends." "They're my keys, blue rig, right over there," he told me, nodding toward a large SUV across the street. "Car, now. Horse is going to drive yours back to Coeur d'Alene." I opened my mouth to argue, just on general principle. Then I caught Horse's eyes, which held a silent warning. He glanced toward Noah, then toward the strangers. That's when I finally caught the tension in the air. Their body language was far from friendly. Oops, this wasn't a happy visit. Nice to meet you, I said, taking Noah's hand. I dragged him across the street and climbed into the big SUV waiting for us. Ruger had already installed a booster seat in the back. Noah's backpack sat next to it. I leaned over and stuck the keys in the ignition, then switched on the AC. Ten minutes later, Ruger came over and climbed into the driver's seat. "You buckled in, little man?" he asked as he popped the SUV into reverse. "Uh huh," Noah replied. "Thanks for grabbing my backpack. I'm excited to see your house. Do you have Skylanders?" "Got no idea what a Skylander is, kid," he replied. "But I'm sure we can get some." "Ruger," I started, but he cut me off. "Jesus, Sophie," he said, glaring at me. Now I can't buy the kid a present. Shit, he's had a rough night. If I want to buy him something, I will. Actually, I was going to ask if I could take him upstairs to the bathroom before we leave. I replied, smiling sweetly. He drank a big glass of juice at breakfast. We aren't going to get far without a pit stop. Ruger's glare faded. That's totally reasonable. Yeah, I know. I'm a reasonable person. We'll stop at a restaurant or something. He said, pulling out. I don't want you going back upstairs. Hunter and Skid are up there now. Hunter and Skid, 
I asked. Those the guys you were talking to on the sidewalk? Things seemed a little tense. What was that all about? Don't worry about it, he said. Club business. I'll pull off when I see a good place to stop. Predictably, Noah started begging for a kid's meal when we stopped at a fast food place, especially when he saw they were Skylander themed. He couldn't possibly be hungry, but Ruger ordered two of the overpriced little boxes. That's ridiculous, I told him as he carried them back to the car. The food will go to waste. Noah is stuffed. Not to mention he already ate out earlier. He doesn't need unhealthy junk like that. They're for me, Ruger replied. He can have the toys. I'll take the food. I'm starving. As we pulled out and onto the freeway, Noah started telling Ruger all about the Skylanders. By now he was totally wired, and it was a damned good thing he was belted in. Otherwise, he might have jumped around until we crashed the car. He talked Skylanders as we cleared the city. He talked Skylanders as we passed North Bend. He talked Skylanders as we started up Snoqualmie Pass. Poor Ruger. He had no idea how much conversational stamina Noah had. I'm taking a nap, I said, raising my arms and stretching, chest thrust out. I saw Ruger's eyes flick toward me, and they weren't looking at my face. Good. I wanted his balls so blue they stayed that way, because maybe that would teach him a lesson about changing the rules of our relationship without warning. I still had a crush on him, but he wasn't crushing on me at all. Nope. Ruger was just horny. Sure, he grunted. Noah rattled on in the background as I leaned my seat back and closed my eyes. I woke slowly, feeling myself in motion and trying to remember where I was. I heard Noah talking, and it came back to me. Ruger, Coeur d'Alene, Packing, Miranda. Then the Skylanders realized they needed the Giants if they wanted to defeat Chaos. Noah said to Ruger, his voice earnest. You still talking about Skylanders? I asked sleepily, turning to look at Noah. He was all smiles, clearly excited to have a captive audience. Yep, still talking about Skylanders, Ruger said, his voice strained and his expression dark. I bit back a laugh. Been talking about Skylanders nonstop. I think we ran out of new material a while ago because now he's telling me the same shit over again. We're almost to Ellensburg. I want to pull off and buy one of those little DVD players for him to hold on his lap and some headphones. We got almost three and a half more hours. This might kill me. Will I get to have it in my room? Noah asked, his excitement kicking up a notch, voice growing shrill. I want lots of movies. I want to watch it every night. Mom doesn't let me watch very much TV, and... Just for the car, Ruger snapped. Noah's face fell. Ruger glanced back in the mirror and grimaced. Sorry, little man. Didn't mean to yell at you. Uncle Ruger is kind of tired. Think we could keep it quiet until we get to the store? Please? The poor man was clearly desperate. I bit my tongue, looking out the passenger side window, trying not to laugh. Shut up, Sophie. I didn't say anything. I heard you thinking. I started giggling. I couldn't help it. Soon Noah joined in, filling the car with his happy noise. Ruger stared straight ahead at the road, face grim. If I were a better woman, I wouldn't have enjoyed it so much. I had to admit the silence was refreshing. Noah was a fantastic kid, but his mouth didn't have an off switch. Ruger had gotten him a little DVD player that strapped to the back of the passenger seat and plugged into the car. Combined with Star Wars headphones and four new movies, the trip was already a thousand times more tolerable. I waited until Ruger's fingers stopped clenching the steering wheel so hard they turned white before I opened the conversation. We need to talk. He glanced toward me. Never good words coming from a woman. I'm sorry if it's not convenient, I replied, rolling my eyes. But we've got to figure some things out. At least I need to figure some things out. What's the plan once we're back in Coeur d'Alene? You're moving into my basement, he said. He reached back and rubbed his shoulder with one hand. Shit, I'm all knotted up here. That's what I get for driving all goddamn night. I ignored the comment and pushed ahead. I know the basement part, I continued, but I'm going to have to figure some other things out, too. No one needs to get registered for school. It starts a week from tomorrow back home. Do you know when it starts in Coeur d'Alene? 
No idea, he replied. Do you know what school he'll be going to? Nope. Did you think about schools at all? I didn't think about anything other than getting him safe and hurting the fuckers who nearly killed him. That's fixed, so from here on out, you're in charge. Okay, I muttered, leaning back in my seat. I put my bare feet up on the dashboard, knees bent. I enjoyed not having to drive. Noah and I weren't like most families where the adults could take turns on a road trip. I'll take care of that. The next thing to worry about is a job. You have any idea what the market is like right now? Nope, he said again. You're not the most helpful person. It's not like I planned this, babe, he replied. I got a phone call last night. I called horse for backup and we left. That's it. Haven't had time to do a damned thing since then. If I'd known about this shit ahead of time, I would have hurt the fuckers preemptively. I'm doing this on the fly, Sophie. I felt my snark die. He was right, which wasn't fair. Again. Ruger was always right. It didn't make any sense because, so far as I could tell, he lived life without a second thought for the future. I scrimped and saved and planned and worked, yet I still couldn't get any traction. Might be able to arrange something for you with the club. I looked at him and frowned. I appreciate all you've done for me and Noah, I said slowly. I even appreciate what you and Horst did earlier. I don't care that it was a crime, but that's where I stop, Ruger. I don't want to get involved in any more illegal things. I won't be your drug runner or something. Ruger burst out laughing. Jesus, Sophie, he said. What the hell do you think I do all day? Fuck, my life's not even close to that interesting. I had no idea what to say. I'm a gunsmith and security expert, he continued, shaking his head. This should not be a surprise to you, seeing as I've wired up your apartments over and over. I spend most of my time repairing firearms in a perfectly legal shop the club runs. I design and install custom security systems on the side, because I get off on that shit. A lot of rich fuckers with summer homes on the lake. All of them need security, and I'm more than happy to take their money. Wait. They let a motorcycle gang run a gun shop? I asked, startled. I didn't know that part. I'll bet the cops love that. First, we're a club, not a gang, he said. And the store is technically owned by one guy, Slide. Been no brother for fifteen years. But we all pitch in and it's a group effort. Having him hold the deed makes the paperwork easier, given the type of business. I apprenticed with him. So this gun shop is one hundred percent above the table? I asked skeptically, and people actually pay you to install their security? Aren't they afraid you'll be the one breaking in? I'm damned good at what I do, he replied, smiling. Not exactly forcing them to hire me. You want to see the gun shop? Come check it out. Check out any of the businesses. You have more than one? Got a strip club, a pawn shop, and a garage, he said. Lots of the guys work in those, but we got civilian employees, too. And what do you see me doing if I worked for the Reapers? I asked, considering the strip club. I don't know what we need, he said, shrugging. Not even sure there's an opening. We'll have to check and see. But it'd be good for you. Got health care plans and shit. So you guys don't do anything illegal? It's all legitimate? You think I'd tell you if we were doing something illegal? He asked, sounding genuinely curious. Um, no? He laughed. Exactly. So it doesn't really matter what I tell you anyway, because you wouldn't believe it. Club business is for club members. Seeing as you are not a member, it's not your problem. All you need to know is I'm trying to help you here. If there's a job you're qualified for, it'll be yours. If not, no big deal. Ruger, don't take this personally, but I don't want to work for your club at all, even if there's an opening, I replied. You know I've never wanted anything to do with the Reapers. You and Horse helped me, and I appreciate it, but nothing's changed. I don't agree with your lifestyle. I don't want Noah around your friends, either. I don't think it's a good environment for a child. You've never even met them. Kind of judgmental, don't you think? Maybe, I said, looking away. But I'm going to do the best I can for Noah, and hanging out with a bunch of criminals isn't part of that. I don't believe for a minute that there isn't something shady going on with you guys. Ruger's hands tightened on the steering wheel. Great. Now I'd insulted him. Considering your folks haven't talked to you in seven years, 
Your son's father needs a restraining order, and you can't hold down a job or provide for your child. Seems to me like you aren't in a position to be calling us anything, he told me, voice tight. Friendly Ruger was gone. A lot of things happen at the clubhouse. Some of those things run deep, no question. Might scare you, but I'll tell you one thing. When one of our own is in trouble, we don't kick him out in the street. More than I can say about your daddy. He's a model citizen and we're the criminals. But shit goes down, I can count on my brothers. You got anyone you could say that about? Besides me? Because deep down in my heart, in my guts, in my fucking DNA, I'm a reaper, Sophie. Still sure we aren't good enough for you? I caught my breath, hating how my eyes filled with moisture. Bringing up my folks was a cheap shot. I tried to ignore the tears, refusing to blink and let them fall. Then my nose started running and I sniffed. That was low, Ruger. That was true, Sophie. You want to be all high and mighty, you need to find another target. Your ass is getting saved by me. And behind me stands the club. If you were with the Reapers, Noah would be surrounded by adults who care about him. Lots of kids in the club, Soph. They go home when things get wild, but let me tell you, something like this happened in Coeur d'Alene to one of our kids? I'd have to fight my brothers for the privilege of killing the guy. That's family, Sophie. And Noah could use some of that family around him. I don't want to talk about this. Then don't talk, he replied. But listen up. I get that you don't want to be part of club life. Don't worry. I'm not going to force the point. Because if you're going to be a stuck-up bitch, I wouldn't want you around them anyway. Stop it. Shut the fuck up and listen, he snapped. This is important. Love the club, hate the club. You need to be aware of a few things, because they're part of your reality now. The asshole that hurt Noah? You saw the ink on his back, right? Yes, I replied, wishing him straight to hell. Called a back patch, he continued. It's his club colors, right on his skin. Club colors are what we wear on our cuts, our vests. Call them rags, too, and they say a lot about a man. In this case, those colors said he was part of the Devil's Jacks. A lot of MCs out there, good and bad, but the Jacks are one of the worst. Reapers and Jacks are enemies. Things worked out this time, but you run into a guy with colors like that again? You need to tell me. I'll still go after him, but I'll call in more backup first. This morning it all worked out. Next time it might not. You got me? I shrugged, looking away. Ruger growled in frustration. I don't think you get me, Soph, he said. Let me tell you a little story. Got a brother named Deke, down in the Portland chapter. Deke's got a niece named Gracie, his old lady's sister's kid. She had jack shit to do with the Reapers, by the way. So, Gracie went off to college down in Northern Cali three years ago and started dating a guy who turned out to be a hangaround with the Jacks. I looked over at him, unnerved. He stared straight ahead, face grim. So little Gracie went to a party with him and a bunch of guys raped her, one right after the next, he said. You ever heard of a train? I stared at him and swallowed. Believe it or not, some women are down with that, he continued. Gracie isn't one of them and they were not gentle. They tore her up so bad she'll never have kids. Then they carved a DJ into her forehead and dumped her in a ditch. Deke found out when they sent him pictures they took of her with her own fucking phone. Tried to kill herself. She's doing better now, engaged to one of the brothers in the Portland chapter. Did I mention they aren't nice guys? He fell silent. I thought about the two men I'd met earlier, Hunter and Skid. What happened to the men who did it? I asked hesitantly. Were they... were those guys you were talking to... It was four hangarounds and two jacks, he told me. Good news is they won't be hurting any more girls. Hunter and Skid weren't part of that particular mess, which still doesn't qualify them as decent human beings. So let me ask you again. You got me, Soph? Yeah, I whispered, feeling sick. Silence fell... Noah started laughing at his video in the back seat. Ruger drove, jaw muscle tight, staring straight ahead. Gracie's story played over and over in my head, along with what he'd said earlier. I'm not a stuck-up bitch. Could have fooled me. I have a right to keep my son away from your club. That why you left Coeur You know damned well why I left Coeur 
I said, hating him. And that's the second time you've called me a bitch. Don't do it again. Or what? I don't know, I replied, frustrated. I crossed my arms. The motion pushed my breasts up high. His eyes caught on them in the rearview mirror, and I dropped my arms, tugging up my tank. What a stupid game I'd been playing that morning. Ruger wasn't a boy I could tease by dressing like a slut. I didn't want his attention or to get more involved in his world. I'd never be more than a toy to him, and the men in his family had a history of breaking their toys. They just did it in different ways. Ruger didn't actually live in Coeur d'Alene. He lived west of town in Post Falls, back in the hills near the Washington border at the end of a private gravel road. We pulled up to his place around five that evening, horse behind us. The driveway widened into a large parking area behind an L-shaped, two-story cedar house overlooking a small valley. The setting was fantastic. Evergreens surrounded us, and I heard the trickle of a stream somewhere not too far away. A strip of grass ran down the hillside around to the front. It looked like it needed water, and given the yard's condition, I got the impression Ruger liked his landscaping natural. Noah bounded out of the car, running around the house in excitement. I stretched up high as I stood, pulling the tank up with me, exposing my stomach. I felt Ruger's eyes touch me, cool and speculative, and I quickly pulled it back down. Really, really stupid idea, that tank. What the hell had I been thinking? You don't pull a tiger's tail. I'd spent years wishing Ruger would notice me, just once. Now I needed him to unnotice me and start treating me like furniture again. Life as furniture might not be exciting, but it was definitely safe. Your car needs a tune-up, Or said, walking over to us. He tossed me the keys and I caught them, chest jiggling precariously. Horse eyed me, then smirked at Ruger, who watched us with something like disgust. I'll help haul your shit in, then I'll head home to Marie. She's starting school day after tomorrow. Want to enjoy some time with her before she gets all stressed out and bitchy. Ruger walked to the door, which sat kitty-corner from the three-car garage forming one side of the L. A narrow band of deck followed the line of the house around to the front. He punched in a code, opened the door, and we went inside. There he put in another code, because apparently one wasn't enough for Mr. Security is Critically Important. I walked in and my mouth dropped open. I fell in love with the house instantly. Before me was a great room with a giant prow-shaped bank of windows looking out across the valley. The place wasn't huge, but it was definitely big enough to impress me. To the right was a door that had to lead into the garage. To the left was an open-plan kitchen with a breakfast bar. A separate dining area held a table. Dishes littered the counter, and a smattering of empty beer bottles stood on the bar, which separated the kitchen from the main room. A stone fireplace lined one wall in the living room, and a sweeping staircase snaked upward along the other. Forgetting all about the men, I walked slowly forward to take in the view. Directly in front of the house was a broad meadow, ringed by evergreens lower on the slope. The valley lay beyond that, stunning and sweeping. Here and there I saw other houses, a mix of high-end, new construction, and original farms. I looked up to see that the ceiling vaulted all the way to the second story. Behind me was a loft. A pile of dirty laundry had been shoved against the open railing, and I couldn't help but smile. Ruger had never been much of a housekeeper. The living room needed attention, too. The leather couches seemed to be relatively new, as did the rest of the furniture. But for all the care he took to keep things clean, it could have been a frat house. There was even an empty pizza box on the coffee table. I heard a beer top pop and turned to find the men standing in the kitchen. Your house is almost as disgusting as the armory, Horse said to Ruger. Like yours used to be, Ruger asked. I don't remember that, Horse replied, his expression innocent. Just be glad you have Marie around, otherwise you'd be living this way too. I was never gross like this. It's not that bad, I said, smiling at Ruger, my earlier frustration forgotten. I honestly couldn't believe how gorgeous this place was. I had no idea what the basement looked like, but it could be a spider hole and I'd still be thrilled, just for the location. Not to mention the yard for Noah. But how did you get a house like this? I mean, it had to cost a fortune. How much land do you have? Fifteen acres, he said, a shadow crossing his face. I bought it in March, used my share of Mom's estate for the down payment. I cocked my head, stunned. 
Ruger's mother, Karen, had been disabled in a car accident a couple years before I met her. She'd been living on disability by the time I came along, pinching every penny. I'd never forget the sacrifices she made when she brought me into her home. I'd also never forget the betrayal on her face when I moved out after sending her steps to jail. What the hell? Why was she living so poor if she could afford something like this? Why did you let her? His expression darkened. They finally settled, he said. After all those years, fucking insurance company finally offered us a settlement. Too late. It went into the estate and I used my half to buy this place. My breath caught. When? Just about a year ago. And Zack got the other half? I asked, swaying. He's got money like this and he still stopped paying his child support? Sounds like it, Ruger replied, his voice tight. Remember what you asked me earlier? You really surprised by anything Zack does? Mom never thought she'd leave anything but bills. Estate planning wasn't a priority. That bastard, I whispered, stunned. We're starving and he's off spending your mom's money? She'd be so pissed. Hard to argue with that, he muttered. Marrying his dad was the stupidest thing she ever did, and I've been paying for it ever since. Zack's a fucking weight around my neck. Everything he touches turns to shit, and then I'm stuck hauling out his garbage. Again. I felt like he'd just punched me in the stomach. Is that how you feel about me and Noah? Chapter 4 Ruger Fuck. He couldn't believe he'd said that. At least Noah hadn't heard it. Sophie, though. Jesus. I'm gonna start unloading the car, Horse said. Coward. No, I don't feel that way, Sophie. Believe me, Ruger said. And he meant it. You're the only fucking thing he ever did that's worth a damn. I'm crazy about Noah, you know that. And we don't always get along, but you're important to him, and that makes you pretty fucking important to me. She offered him a quavering smile, and to his horror he saw the glint of tears in her eyes. Not good. Ruger could handle Sophie pissed off, but crying? No. Fuck no. Let me show you your place, he said quickly. Downstairs, you got your own French doors down there, private entrance. It's pretty. You can use the front door, too, if you like. Thanks, she murmured. Ruger walked across the kitchen to the basement door. He opened it, leaning in to turn on the light, holding it open for Sophie. He followed her down the steps, feeling like a dick. Then he felt like a bigger dick, because instead of thinking about ways to make things better, he checked out her rather fine ass. Damn woman had been driving him crazy all day. Her tits practically jumped out of that tank of hers, and the cutoffs had to be ten years old. The fabric was so worn and thin. They were tight, too, which matched his theory about their age. Sophie wasn't fat, but she'd put on some weight since high school. In fact, she'd filled out far too nicely for his comfort. Having her in the house would be a living hell. Hell already. He couldn't see her legs without imagining them wrapped around his waist. When she'd propped them up on the dash earlier, he'd almost crash the goddamned car. He thought about that morning on the couch in her apartment. His cock grew bigger with the memory, and he hoped to hell she wouldn't notice. Because he'd been right about one thing— Sophie really could be a stuck-up bitch, and he didn't doubt for a minute she'd use his attraction against him. She might want to fuck him, and he knew she did, she'd been as into it as he had, but that didn't mean she thought he was good enough for her. Fuck, she was probably right about that one. Screwing her would kick ass, but after that, things would get weird. Ruger wasn't interested in settling down with any woman, but if he ever did, she'd be different from Sophie. She'd fit in with the club, for one thing. She'd be the kind of girl who knew how to crack a beer at the end of a long day, kick back, and then give him a blowjob before bed. She'd love riding on the back of his bike, she'd be blonde, and she'd be tough enough to hold her own in a fight. Most important, she wouldn't fucking talk back to him. Sophie had a hell of a mouth. Wow, it's beautiful, Sophie said, stopping him dead at the bottom of the stairs. He looked at her to find all traces of wistful sorrow gone. Instead, she smiled big at him, clearly thrilled with something or other. Damn. Woman's moods changed so fucking fast a man couldn't even begin to keep up. I can't believe this. How did you get everything ready so quickly? He blinked, 
then looked around, shocked. What the fuck? When he'd left that morning, the place had been clean-ish. Not because he'd cleaned it, of course, but because one of the girls from the clubhouse had a few weeks ago for some reason. Trying to hook him for her old man, probably. He'd fucked her and kicked her out. Because he'd be damned if he'd let one of those bitches get their claws into him. It wasn't sort of clean now, though. It fucking sparkled. This was supposed to be a family room, with a small kitchen built into the back for reasons he'd never bothered to consider. There was a short hallway to the side, with two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a utility room. He used one of the bedrooms for storage, the other as a place for his friends to crash. Never once had it looked or felt like a home. Someone had come in and fixed all that. Soft, fuzzy-looking blankets were draped across the couches, and a spiral rag rug full of bright colors covered the center of the beige carpet. There were fresh flowers on the coffee table, right in front of the wall of glass looking out over the valley. French doors opened onto the little patio under the ground floor deck. Two loungers covered in big, soft pillows sat ready and waiting for use outside, framed on either side by cascading, hanging baskets. They hadn't been there that morning. There were even more fresh flowers on the pretty blue checked cloth covering the round table near the kitchen. A goddamn mystery table, because he had no fucking clue where it came from. Even the windows looked different. He studied them, then realized they had new blinds and long, gauzy curtains. Then he saw the TV. A flat screen sat on what looked like an old-fashioned wooden radio, which he had to admit was kind of cool and different. Not a huge TV, but plenty big for the space. Sophie darted down the hallway, sadness forgotten. He understood her sudden happiness, because right now the basement looked a lot more comfortable and welcoming than his space upstairs. Rooker, I can't believe this, she called from one of the rooms. He walked in to find a child's bed, dresser, and bookshelf set up and ready to go, complete with a motorcycle-covered blanket and pillowcase. The walls had been painted light blue, and little pictures that matched the blanket edged the ceiling. One wall had a big black square painted on it, with the words Noah's Room written on it in chalk. Noah is going to love this. Thank you so much. Sophie launched himself at her. Ruger wrapped his arms around her automatically, confused as hell. Shit, she felt good. His dick jumped to full-on attention and he sniffed her hair, wondering what it'd feel like wrapped around his fingers while she sucked him off. Sophie stiffened, obviously feeling his hard cock, and tried to pull away. He slid his hands down to her ass, holding her tight as he steadied her face. Her tits pressed tight against his chest, and he felt her nipples harden. She wanted this as bad as he did. Fuck, her lips were big and soft and pink. He wanted to bite them. Mom? Noah called. Mom, where are you? I can't believe this. There's a stream and a little pool to play in. Ruger's got four-wheelers, too. Horse says they'll take us on a ride sometime. Ruger jerked away from Sophie. We can't do this, she whispered, eyes wide. This is breaking the rules. Yeah, you're right, he said, which was a goddamn shame. For four years they'd played this game, pretending the other didn't exist. It'd been the right thing to do. Sometimes they'd played it so well he almost believed it. That's what his nephew needed from them, not some sort of bullshit one-night stand ruining things. Ruger could get laid any time. Noah only had one mom. The kid ran in and stopped, eyes wide as he took everything in. Is this my room? he asked. Um, yeah, Ruger said. Looks like it. What do you think? Cool, Noah said. I've never had a room like this. Mom, you gotta see the yard. He tore off again. Then Horse stuck his head in, offering Ruger a shit-eating grin. Nice, ain't it? We should talk, Ruger said to him, jerking his chin toward the living room. Sophie took the opportunity to dart through the door and investigate the second bedroom. Horse nodded, and Ruger followed him out. What the fuck happened here? Ruger asked, keeping his voice low. What do you think? Horse said. Marie, she and the girls came over to fix the place up. All of them. I asked her to. Why the hell did you do that? 
You want your baby mama and kid to feel good about staying here, right? He asked. Maybe feel safe and welcome? Chicks need that. Figured it would make life easier. Not only that, made the girls happy to do it. A heads up would have been appreciated. You were too busy pretending you don't want to fuck Sophie, he replied, shrugging. Someone needed to step in. Marie charged everything, by the way. I told her to leave the receipts for you upstairs on the counter. You can give me a check now, or I'll catch you later. Ruger froze. Fuck. Didn't think of that, he said, looking around again, appraising things with new eyes. How much do TVs cost, anyway? He glanced back at Horse, whose shit-eating grin had grown to full-on mockery. Oh, crap. You did this on purpose, he said. You did it just to fuck with me, didn't you? Like you give a flying fuck about welcoming Sophie. You know I can't take it back now. How much did Marie spend, asshole? I told her to keep it under three grand, Horse replied innocently. And I think she got most of the furniture used. You know Marie never spends money unless she has to. Hell, you don't even have to pay her back. It's not like you told her to do it. I'll cover the bill if you won't. Not every man provides for his family. Takes all kinds. I get that. You're a cocksucking bastard, Ruger said, advancing on him. Horse laughed. You're a cocksucking bastard, Noah repeated like a damned parrot. Ruger turned to find the kid standing in the open patio door, looking proud as hell. Oh. My. God. He heard Sophie gasp. He spun around to find her bracing a hand against the wall at the entrance of the hallway. Fucking perfect. Because they really needed more to fight about, right? Ruger, you can't say things like that around Noah. Gonna have to work on that mouth of yours, brother, Horace told him. Don't want to make Sophie mad. Like I said earlier, pretty sure she could take you in a fair fight. I'd pay to see it, too. Get out, Ruger said to him, jerking his head toward the stairs. Just get the fuck out. Go home before I shoot you. Sophie opened her mouth. Ruger turned and stopped her with one look. Enough. This is my house, he said. I'll talk however the fuck I want, and you'll keep your goddamned mouth shut. Got me? She gaped as he turned and stomped back up the stairs. Behind him, he heard Noah chanting, Fuck! 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 He needed a beer. Make that a shot. Sophie. Noah glared at me like an angry leprechaun. He sat in time out on our couch thanks to repeated use of his new favorite word. I popped a beer and raised it in a silent toast to the women who'd come to clean, decorate, and fix us food. I'd been serious when I told Ruger I didn't want to spend time with the club, but what they'd done for me was enough to make me reconsider. At the very least, I'd need to make an appearance to say thanks. They even left me a card and a long welcome letter full of important information, everything from their cell phone numbers to the address of Noah's new school. This was particularly important, because school would be starting on Monday, a full week earlier than back in Seattle. In addition to stocking the basics, they'd left me a pan of taco meat and all the fixings, ready to heat and serve. Thank God for that, because there was no way in hell I was going upstairs in search of food. In fact, I had no intention of going upstairs at all, not without an invitation. I'd use the patio door, save her that way. Not that I was still mad at Ruger. This was so much better than our old place that not even I could hold a grudge at this point. Nope. By then I was more scared of him, because the rules kept changing and I wasn't sure where we stood. Drinking one of the beers helpfully stocked in my fridge helped me relax a little. Most of our stuff was still out in the car. Ruger and Horace had done the heavy lifting at my old place, but I could handle unloading by myself. Not like we owned much anyway. I figured I could start hauling things down tomorrow, feeling pleased that I'd had Noah pack jammies for the road. No pressure to find his clothes tonight. The one thing I would not be doing was asking Ruger for help. Things were weird enough already. I heated the tacos and grabbed a couple of plates. The kitchen was fully stocked. Just corral, nothing fancy, but it looked new to me. You ready to make good choices? I asked Noah. He glowered at me and crossed his arms. Okay, I'm going to eat, I told him. I filled my plate, grabbed a second beer, and walked over to the doors, opening them wide and stepping out to one of the loungers. 
I sat down with crossed legs, setting my plate on the pillow in front of me. Then I took a bite. Holy shit, that tasted good after a long day. This is really yummy, I called to Noah. It's your favorite. Lots of cheese and no tomatoes. Too bad you aren't hungry. Noah didn't respond, but I heard the scrape of a chair on the deck overhead. I looked up to see the shadow of someone above, through the cracks in the decking. I waited for Ruger to say something. He didn't. Okay. I finished one taco and considered the second. Noah would be impossible if he didn't eat, but I couldn't let him get away with defying me like that either. Time for the big guns. Noah, you sure you don't want a taco? I called. I'm halfway done, and when I finish I'm putting the food away. Nothing but plain bread after that if you get hungry. Not only that, they left pie and ice cream. Silence. Then the chair above scraped again, and I heard footsteps as Ruger walked across the deck. Great. I hoped my yelling wasn't pissing him off even more. I couldn't get that garbage comment out of my head. I polished off my beer, bracing myself for battle on two fronts. What kind of pie? Noah asked. Looked like berries to me, I replied. I'm going to warm mine up before I put the ice cream on. I'm ready to say I'm sorry, he replied. I allowed myself just a few seconds to gloat before I walked back inside, face stern. So? I asked him. I'm sorry, Noah said. I'll make better choices next time. Can I make my own taco? You can't use bad words like that, I told him seriously. You say that at school, you'll get in really big trouble. Why can't Uncle Ruger say them? Because he's not in school. That's not fair. Kid had a point. Life isn't fair. Make your taco. I was digging through the fridge for the milk when I heard a light knock on the outside door. Uncle Ruger, Noah called. We're eating tacos. Do you want some? Sure, he replied. I straightened and turned toward him, wondering if he was still upset with me. I couldn't quite figure out how he'd been the one to teach Noah to say fuck, yet I'd gotten in trouble. Of course, there were all sorts of things I'd never figured out about Ruger. He came in and I handed him a plate warily, waving toward the food. He didn't smile at me, but he didn't scowl, either. I decided to take it as a positive sign. You made all this? he asked. Nope, the girls from your club did, I told him, figuring it was always good to make peace over food. And I definitely wanted peace with him, for both Noah's sake and my own. Maybe we could just forget today and start over tomorrow? I decided I liked that idea a lot. I grabbed two more beers and handed him one, smiling hesitantly. I found it all in the fridge. I still can't believe they pulled everything together in one day. Thank you so much. I had no idea you were planning something like this. I'm blown away. He grunted, not bothering to look at me. Okay, guess we were back to him treating me like furniture. Because I'm a perverse bitch, I didn't like it. Stupid, right? You want to bring your food upstairs? He asked us. I've got a table on the deck, hell of a view, and we'll be able to watch the sunset. Thanks, I said, surprised. Guess he wanted to make peace, too. Thank God for that. Neither of us had anything to gain from a cold war. And this really was nicer than any place Noah and I had ever lived. I liked the idea of having access to the deck, so long as Ruger didn't turn on me again. Would I ever get to the point where being around him wasn't hard to handle? Yes, I told myself. I'd force myself to do it, for Noah's sake. Dinner went better than expected. Noah talked the whole time, which smoothed the way for me and Ruger. I finished my food and then went and grabbed us some more beer, refilling Noah's glass of milk while I was at it. Eventually Noah got bored and headed down the stairs on the side of the deck to run around. By then I'd had enough alcohol to feel slightly less awkward— and Ruger seemed to be in a good place, too. I dragged my chair away from the table to the deck rail, propping my feet up against the railing. He went back into the house and started some music, a mix of old and new stuff. We each drank another beer as the sun grew low in the sky. I went from feeling good to feeling fucking fantastic all around. No one needed bed, so I took him down and gave him a quick shower. Poor kid was dead on his feet, falling asleep before I finished his story. I decided to go back upstairs and sit on the deck a while longer. 
I liked a little time away from Noah every day, which had been hard to get in our last couple of apartments. This was different, though. Noah could be safe while I had space. Hey, I called as I climbed back up to the deck. You mind if I sit up here for a while longer? What it's for, Ruger said. He stood at the railing, leaning forward on his elbows and looking out across his kingdom. He must have gone in and taken a shower while I was putting Noah to bed, because his hair was damp. He'd changed into a pair of worn flannel lounge pants that hung low enough to expose his hip bones. Maybe I was projecting one of my dirtier fantasies, but I was pretty sure he wasn't wearing anything under those pants, either. They certainly gave me a nice, defined view of his ass. The look worked for him in a big way. Ruger was all lean and muscular, with a six-pack that tapered down nicely and biceps that were a work of art. Oh, wow. One of his nipples was pierced, too. I've never seen that before. His pecs were broad and hard, large enough to be hot without venturing into man-boob territory. And his tattoos? I'd always wondered about his tattoos. His back was all Reaper's MC, but his arms and shoulders had ink, too. I wanted to study them up close, but that seemed sort of rude. Also, I couldn't quite get my eyes to focus. I settled for standing next to him, leaning forward against the rail. Want another beer? he asked. I shook my head. I've had enough, I replied. I'd had slightly more than enough, actually. I'd swayed climbing the stairs, and to be honest, I needed to either lean on the rail or sit. I felt my cheeks warm, and then I giggled. Ruger glanced at me, raising his brows in silent question. I giggled again. What? Pretty buzzed, I admitted, smiling at him. Guess the beer hit me a little harder than I thought. Been that kind of day. Not enough food, not enough sleep. You know how it goes. He smiled back at me, and damn, he was beautiful. He'd definitely taken out some of his piercings, though. Why do you have less metal in your face now? I asked, my sense of tact lost along with my sobriety. It makes you look less scary and more human. He glanced at me, raising his brows. I pulled most of them out last winter, he said. Started boxing, and they aren't so good for that. Huh. I didn't know what to say about that. My eyes caught on the ring he'd left on the lower left side of his lip. I wondered how it would feel if I kissed him there, maybe sucked it into my mouth, I'd tug on it with my teeth and then attack the rest of his. You're cute when you're drunk, he said, startling me. I'm not drunk, I told him, indignant. I'm buzzed. Perfectly okay, just happy. He laughed, then leaned over to whisper in my ear. Get much happier. You're gonna pass out. Then imagine what I could do to you. That was pretty funny, and I found myself giggling harder. Are you flirting with me? I asked, feeling daring. I'd been trying to figure him out all day. Why hadn't I just asked? I'd been afraid to talk about our relationship before now, but I couldn't remember why. Because I don't understand you, Ruger. Half the time you seem to hate me, and then it all changes. Keeps flipping back and forth. It's weird. He raised his brows. My eye caught on the piercing there, too. I wondered how much that hurt. Of course, it was nothing compared to his tattoos. My eyes dropped back down to his lips. They were full and way too soft for a guy, which I knew for a fact because they'd been all over my neck earlier. Yep, I'd definitely suck on those, given the chance. I'd suck on them for a good long time. Then I'd start moving down, trying out that pierced nipple on the way down to his cock. Was it as big and built as the rest of him? I wanted to know... Desperately, I swayed again, feeling heat rise up through me, nipples hardening. I'm not trying to flirt with you, he said. Oh, now that was a buzzkill. That's too bad, I said, sighing. What a shame. I wanted to sleep with Ruger. I really did. Or hell, anyone, for that matter. My rule about only dating safe guys I could control didn't lead to much in the way of action. Maybe I should revisit those guidelines. I don't get to flirt enough. I spend all my time working and taking care of Noah. It's kind of tiring, Ruger. I'd like to meet someone, you know? He didn't respond, looking straight ahead. 
A little muscle in his jaw clenched. If I'd been just a little braver, I'd have leaned over and licked his jawline. He'd had just enough of a five o'clock shadow that it'd be nice and rough under my tongue. Don't look at me like that, he said, closing his eyes. Despite what happened this morning, I'm not trying to start something with you, Sophie. You realize how fucked things would get if we started screwing each other? I'm not looking for a relationship, and I'm not a one-woman man. We gotta work together for Noah. You know that. I sighed. I did know it. Stupid beer. Yeah, you're right, I said, turning away from him to look out across the valley. He'd really found a hell of a place. I still couldn't believe how great our new home was. Felt great to really relax, too. Let it all out. Noah has to come first. We can agree on that one. I just want to get laid, though. Do you think any of the guys in your club are available? I don't want a boyfriend, just a friend with benefits. Someone I can fuck and then ditch guilt-free when it gets old. Ruger made a choking noise, and I glanced over at him, concerned. You okay? I thought you didn't want anything to do with the club, he said. His voice strained. How did you go from that to friends with benefits so fast? Actually, I think I might give the club a chance, I replied. Maybe the Reapers would be all right. And the more I considered the whole friend with benefits thing, the more I liked the idea. I never got to have sex. I was twenty-four years old, for God's sake. I should get to have sex. He did some really nice things for me today. Horace left home in the middle of the night to help someone he didn't even know. And those girls? They must have worked for hours getting everything ready for us. Just the furniture is amazing, let alone leaving dinner ready to go. I think the stencils are still wet. Jesus fucking Christ. I frowned at him. What's that supposed to mean? I asked. I thought you wanted me to get to know your friends in the club. And seriously, I deserve to get laid. I've earned it. Ruger straightened and turned to me, every muscle in his body tense and tightly leashed. His nose flared as he took a deep breath, and my eyes caught on the muscle in his jaw. He'd always been scary, but right now he looked downright lethal. I should have been terrified, but I had my buzz wrapped around me like a nice warm blanket of protection. I wasn't going to let him bully me any more. I think the girls would be good for you, he said. At least some of them. You stick with the old ladies. Don't want you around the others. But this friends with benefit shit? Not happening, Soph. Put that out of your mind. Got me? Why not? I demanded, outraged. You screw everything that moves. Why can't I? Because you're a mother, he said, his voice almost a growl. You got no business fucking around like that. I'm serious. I'm a mother, but I'm not dead, I said, rolling my eyes. Don't worry, I won't let Noah meet someone unless it's serious. But I'm ready for a little fun. Horace is hot, and if any of the other guys in your club are like him, even a little, they'd be perfect for me. Don't give me shit about it, either. I know you guys fuck around. Why shouldn't I? Those are sweet butts and club whores, he said, his voice hard. They're trash. No fucking way you're gonna be one of them. Not happening, Soph. You aren't my boss. You sound like a goddamned fourteen-year-old, he replied, eyes narrowing. At least I don't sound like an overprotective father, I snapped. You're not my dad, Ruger. He reached out and caught me behind the neck, jerking me into his body. Then he dropped his mouth down to my ear, my face so close to his chest I could have licked him. Trust me, I'm well aware I'm not your father, he said. His nose traced the curve of my ear the warmth of his breath sending a shiver through me. If I was, they'd throw my ass in jail for the shit I think about you. I raised my hands, sliding them up along his sides, tracing the line of his muscles before bringing them in to graze his nipples. I couldn't help myself. I leaned forward and flicked his piercing with my tongue. Ruger groaned and his fingers tightened in my hair. His entire body tensed, and then I felt the brush of his cock against my stomach. Holy hell. My nipples peaked and the flesh between my legs spasmed. I shifted restlessly. One of his hands slid down my back, past my shorts and panties to cup my bare ass. His fingers tensed as I licked his nipple again, 
then sucked the ring into my mouth. Jesus, he groaned. You got two seconds before I lay you over that table and fuck you so hard it breaks. Swear to God, Soph. You want to tell me how we're going to explain that to Noah? Because I got shit. I'm not looking to marry you, and I sure as fuck won't hand you my dick on a leash. So things could get weird fast, babe. I froze, shivering, feeling moisture soak my panties. I wanted to hump his leg like a bitch in heat, desperate for anything to fill the emptiness inside me. Instead, I pulled away from him, slowly. His hand slid free of my shorts and we stepped apart, eyes boring into each other. Fuck, Ruger muttered, running a hand through his hair. He looked away from me. The front of his pants bulged outward, his cock so hard I saw the thick head clearly outlined. I wondered what he'd do if I knelt down, pulling his pants low so I could run my tongue around the tip before sucking him deep into my mouth. It actually watered at the thought. Desire speared me like a weapon. I sighed, licking my lips. I'm gonna get another beer, Ruger said harshly. I looked up from his cock to his face to find his eyes glued to my chest. Shit, I was still wearing the damned Barbie tank, which left nothing to the imagination. My suitcase sat in his car. Grab me one, too, I replied, my voice shaking. Sure that's a good idea. I looked at him and shook my head. His chest rose and fell too fast, his dark eyes almost fully dilated. He swallowed and I rubbed my hand against the top of my thigh, restless and hungry. A steady motion caught his eye and he swallowed again. No, but I want one anyway. I walked unsteadily across the deck to a lounger and lay back on it, limp and full of need so intense I thought I might die. The sun had set, and the evening stars had started coming out somewhere along the line. I should go back down to my little apartment. I knew that. Instead, I closed my eyes and thought about how much I wanted to reach down between my legs and rub my clit until I blew up right in front of him. Something cold touched my cheek. I opened my eyes to find Ruger standing over me, eyes intense. They slid slowly across my body. Impossibly, the bulge in his pants was larger. God, it'd be so easy to just reach out and take him into my hand, feel that hard length for myself. Or I could sit up and lean my head forward, letting my cheek touch him through the soft fabric. I couldn't take my eyes off it. I rose until my face was only a few inches away from his crotch. Then I looked up at him, wondering if I'd lost my mind. "'Here's your beer,' he said roughly, holding it out to me. I took it and wrapped my mouth around the neck for a drink, holding his gaze. I hated him for being sober and in control. "'Jesus, Sophie,' he groaned. "'Don't fucking look at me like that.' "'Like what?' I asked him, catching a drip on the side with my tongue. Don't play stupid, he whispered. If you don't stop, I'm gonna fuck you. We'll both regret that tomorrow. You're drunk. I tilted my head to the side, thoughtful. Are you? I asked him. What? Drunk. He shook his head slowly, sinking down to sit next to me. He leaned over, scenting my neck. We weren't touching at all, but just the warmth of his breath on my skin almost killed me. I took another drink of my beer, slow and deliberate. His eyes burned a hole right through me. No, he whispered. I'm not drunk. Then what's your excuse? I asked softly. Mine's alcohol. Whatever I do tonight, I can blame the beer. What excuse should we use for you? Ruger reached over and took the bottle from my hand, setting it on the deck. No more tonight, he said, his voice cracking. You're done. We're done. We're not doing this. Got me? Yeah, I said, forcing myself to think past the buzz. I knew he was right. No one needed us both, and we had enough trouble getting along already. I was going to be living in his basement, for God's sake, and it wasn't like he hadn't been clear. He wanted to fuck me. No heart, no flowers, no dates, and definitely no commitments. At least I wasn't just a piece of furniture any more. Can I ask you something? What? he replied. I swallowed. Is this a new thing for you? I don't follow, he said, glancing at me. His eyes pierced mine, the warm night air hanging heavy between us. Wanting me? I said softly. 
Is it a new thing for you? I mean, aside from back then, I always assumed that was just a moment, you know? You always looked right through me. It's not a new thing. We sat together, neither moving, frogs chirping all around us. After a while, he reached up and rubbed the back of his neck, like he had in the car. You still sore? He nodded. Yeah, I kinked it somehow last night while I was driving. Stupid. Want me to rub it for you? I asked him. No fucking way you're touching me, he said. We covered that already. I'm not drunk, Soph. I won't fuck things up for Noah. We're not going to fuck up anything, I told him. I'm getting sober now. It's okay. I took a massage class, though. I'm actually pretty good at it. Let me help you. You've done so much to help me, I feel like I owe you something. Not a good idea. I rolled my eyes and bumped his shoulder with mine. Chicken, I asked, smiling at him. Jesus, you're annoying, he muttered, but he didn't protest when I crawled behind him. I ignored the screaming need between my legs as I knelt up and put my fingers on his shoulders. They were hard and strong, soft skin stretched over sleek muscles more than capable of supporting him while he pounded into my body. Unfortunately, it was too dark for me to see much of his tattoos, which was a damned shame. Ruger wasn't shy about taking off his shirt, but I never got close enough to really scope them out. I dug my fingers in and he groaned, head dropping forward. He wasn't kidding about being tight, either. Big knots snarled his neck and shoulders. After a few minutes of going at them with my fingers, I started using my elbows. Slowly, I got his neck to relax and started moving down his back. Lay down on your stomach, I told him, sliding off the side of the lounger behind him. I flattened it. He didn't move. You really are chicken, I murmured. I'm just going to give you a back rub, Ruger. Enjoy it for what it is, okay? He grunted and rolled onto his stomach. I leaned over him and went to work. Some of the knots just wouldn't give, so I decided to climb on top of him to get good leverage. Was this stupid? Of course. Did I care? Not one drunken bit. I straddled his butt, enjoying the feel of his hard body between my legs and his skin under my fingers. He smelled fresh and clean, but still utterly male. Drove me crazy. With every stroke of my hands, I rode him, not getting quite enough stimulation to satisfy me, but enough that when I felt a light beating of sweat break out, it definitely wasn't from the effort of giving the massage. At first he tensed, but slowly he gave in to it, each muscle group relaxing in turn. Finally my hands were tired and we were both limp. I lay down across his back, taking in his scent, the warm summer breeze just enough to keep me from overheating. Sof, he said, his voice a warning. Don't, Ruger, I whispered. It doesn't mean anything. Just let it be, all right? He sighed, and silence fell between us. I was still frustrated, no question. But it was a strange, relaxed kind of sexual desire washing through me now. Night sounds surrounded us, and I let myself enjoy the feel of Ruger's body under mine, wishing I really could have a man like this, strong, steady, and capable of protecting me from anything. If Ruger were mine, I'd be safe. Always. It'll be okay, Sophie, he murmured softly, sounding half asleep. I promise. I didn't answer because I didn't believe him. Instead, I dozed off. The next thing I remembered was him lifting me and carrying me down to my bed. Chapter 5 Ruger was wrong. It wasn't okay. Things got weird. So weird that he took off on me for nearly five days, leaving Sunday afternoon and not showing up again until Thursday. I had no idea where he went and didn't ask him about it when he came back. But it had to get less uncomfortable, right? Because you can only be all tense and strange around each other for so long. At least Noah started school without any problems, which didn't really surprise me. He'd always been good at making new friends and tended to roll with whatever changes came along. Before Ruger left on his club run, I wasn't a hundred percent sure what runs were, but apparently this one involved being gone for five days. He'd handed me some money and suggested I wait until the next week to start job hunting. He wanted to explore work options with the club, 
and also thought I should focus on helping Noah adjust to his new situation. I'd love to say I'm such a strong, independent woman that I told him to butt out, but it was actually a huge relief. I couldn't remember the last time I'd had a week off, and I loved it. I unpacked everything, sucked up the sun, and got reacquainted with the area. I also spent an afternoon with my old friend, Kimber. She invited me over for lunch on Tuesday. We'd stayed in touch through the years, and last summer I'd stayed with her and her new husband when we came to visit. Kimber had gone a little wild for a while after graduation. Then she met Ryan and settled down. He was some kind of software engineer and apparently did pretty well for himself, because she had one of those big houses popping up like mushrooms out on the Rathdrum Prairie. It was part of a development, not custom like Ruger's, but twice the size and pretty impressive. She also had a pool. "'You want a margarita?' she asked, opening the door in a bikini, a brightly colored wrap, and sunglasses that would have made Paris Hilton jealous. I smirked, because some things never change. "'This early?' "'It's always happy hour when you have kids,' she replied, shrugging. "'Either that or it's sad hour, and that's not half as much fun.' We grinned at each other like total dorks. "'So you want one or not?' she asked, dragging me through her grand entryway and down the hall to her kitchen. Because I'm definitely having one. Ava was up all night teething. She finally fell asleep about fifteen minutes ago. If I'm lucky, I have two hours before she's up again. I need to make the most of it and pack in six weeks' worth of social life before you go. Okay, I told her, but just one. I have to drive and pick up Noah later. I take it you're enjoying mommyhood? Loving it, she replied, pouring me a drink in a brightly colored martini glass with a flamingo-shaped stem. I can't believe how amazing Ava is. This is Audible. Reaper's Legacy by Joanna Wilde Chapter 10 Ruger He slid his cock into Sophie's sweet pussy as slowly as possible, savoring every inch. She was fucking tight like a clamp around his dick, the tug at his barbell making things just that much better. He could actually feel her heartbeat. If he didn't know for a fact she'd given birth to a child, he'd think she was a goddamned virgin, hot and swollen and perfect. Maybe he should have felt guilty, taking her like this. She was all worked up emotionally and vulnerable as hell. Understandable. Her little confession about Zack had floored him. He still couldn't believe he'd been so blind, but he'd already decided one thing. Next time he saw his stepbrother, he'd kill him. As for Sophie, he'd fucked up by not keeping a closer eye on her and Zack, and fucked up even worse by letting the law step in to fix the problem. He hadn't been ready to admit Sophie was his responsibility four years ago, despite what had happened between them at Noah's birth. He'd spent too long playing the good uncle, ignoring what he felt because he knew it wasn't the best thing for her. She deserved to be free, and who was he to take that away from her? Oh, fuck that. He was a jealous asshole, and the thought of some other man's cock on her juicy little cunt. Picnic was right. He needed to claim her or let her go, and that sure as fuck wouldn't be happening. Ever. Sophie might not be ready for a property patch, but that didn't matter. He'd patch her a different way with a ring of slowly purpling marks around her neck, his very own collar, branding her and declaring to the world that she had a man who owned her. God, he loved the sight of her laid out on the bench, hands tied with his belt, tank and bra pushed high, boobs shaking every time he slammed home, better than he'd ever imagined. And fuck, he'd spent a lot of time imagining her just like this. He tried to be careful, but when she started whimpering and convulsing around him, it was too much. Ruger drove deep, loving the little scream she gave, blowing his self-control. Something primal and powerful broke free. He grabbed her hips, digging his fingers into her ass. One hand slid closer to her rear, and he thought, what the hell, sliding in his finger. She stiffened and shrieked, interior muscles convulsing around him so hard he had to stop and hold steady, trying not to explode on the spot. That hadn't been a shriek of pain, thank fuck. Sophie stared at him with wide eyes, 
panting so hard her tits practically danced. It was fucking hot. He'd remember this moment as long as he lived. Ruger started moving again, savoring the clench of her muscles with every stroke, wondering if it was possible to die from pleasure. Seemed pretty likely, all things considered. He used his finger deep inside and his hand on her hip to control her position. He knew from her gasp that he'd hit exactly right. Now every stroke ground the rounded head of his barbell against her G-spot. Making a girl come while playing with her clit was fine, but he fucking loved the way it felt if he got them off from the inside. He wanted that from Sophie. Total convulsion. Total submission. She stiffened and moaned. Fucking close. Okay, baby, he said, watching her face. She'd closed her eyes. Head turned to the side, back arching as she strained toward him. He should have patched her years ago. What the fuck had he been thinking, missing out on this? Blow around me. Show me what that sweet pussy of yours can do. In the background, Ruger heard voices and knew some of the brothers had come into the shed. The thought of them seeing him like this, watching him brand Sophie, almost sent him over the edge. This wasn't just about fucking her. Although fucking her definitely kicked ass. No, this was about claiming her once and for all, and the more people who saw it, the better. Ruger slammed into her harder, loving the little grunting noises she made with every thrust. He knew she was close, damned close. So he pulled out just enough to center his cockhead on her G-spot and started a series of hard, short, unrelenting strokes. She came with a scream, hips jerking and tits shaking. Her pussy felt like a damned vice, and that did it for him. Ruger pulled out at the last second, sprang his cum across her stomach. Perfect. She'd never been more beautiful, at his mercy covered in his seed, and marked so that any man who saw her would know she was fucking owned. He wanted to tattoo his name across her ass and keep her tied up like this all day, ready and waiting for his cock. Somehow he doubted she'd be on board with that. Ruger bit back a grin. Sophie opened her eyes and looked up at him, dazed. Wow, she whispered. No shit. Ruger replied, wondering if any man in history had ever felt half as satisfied as he did in that moment. Probably not. He dropped a hand down to her stomach, rubbing his cum slowly up her body toward her nipples. Yep, he was a pretty sick fuck. Because even that turned him on. Having an old lady wasn't half bad, he decided. Not half bad at all. Sophie Holy shit on a stick. That was... unprecedented. Ruger had asked how many men I'd been with, and I'd told him three. But compared to him, I wasn't sure the others even qualified. I'd never felt anything quite as good as what he'd just done to me. Not even close. Now he gazed down at me with lazy hooded eyes, smug as all hell. He deserved to be. I grinned right back at him. Maybe this wasn't such a huge mistake. Damn, she squealed like a fucking pig, a man's voice said off to the right. I went from afterglow to pure horror in less than a second. Not only was I splayed on the counter, totally exposed, but my hands were tied up too. I thrashed, trying to get free, hoping to hell they'd just heard me, rather than watched the whole show. Ruger laughed, which was not an acceptable response, not even a little. Fuck off, he said, turning toward the three men who'd come up next to the van. He didn't sound pissed, though. He sounded pretty damn pleased with himself. This one's mine. Go screw your own girl. The men laughed and wandered over to the far side of the shed to look at the motorcycles, as if they hadn't just seen me getting publicly plowed. Oh, my God. Ruger, pull down my shirt and let me go, I hissed. Now! He reached down and straightened my bra and T-shirt, then tucked his cock back into his pants. This wasn't cutting it. I wanted my arms free and my shorts on. No. Instead, he leaned down over me, standing between my legs, elbows braced on either side of my body. Okay. We got things clear now? He asked. I glared up at him. What the hell are you doing? I hissed. Jesus, Ruger, let me go. I need to get on my clothes. I can't believe they saw me like that. Like, you've got anything they haven't seen before? He asked, smirking. 
You worry too much, Soph. These are bikers. They've seen people fucking. And it's a damned good thing they saw, too. How do you figure? Because now they know you belong to me, he said. I was so fucking worried about Noah, I didn't figure it out until today. Figure what out? That this thing between us is already out there, and it's already real. We can't make it go away. We're together, and we'll make it work. Or we won't. Sex is the least of it, though. This goes way past sex. Sudden hope hit me. Then I shook my head, reminding myself not to be stupid. This was Ruger. I might love him, but I wasn't blind. Are you saying you care about me? I asked skeptically. Like, really care? Well, yeah, he said, wrinkling his forehead. I've always cared about you, Soph. No secret there. I mean, I fucking held you on the side of the road while you pushed out a baby. Don't want to sound like a dick here, but the fact is not every guy would do that. Something happened that night. We pretended it didn't for a long time. Now we're done pretending. You're a giant slut, I said flatly, hating the words even though they needed to be said. I won't be with a guy who sleeps around. Yet here we are at a party where some random couple fucking in a shed doesn't even hit the radar. You plan to keep it in your pants? His eyes were dark and cool, and I knew my answer before he even opened his mouth. I won't bring anyone home, he said. Right now I can't imagine wanting to fuck anyone but you, but this life, it's about freedom. I became a reaper so I could make my own rules. Not looking to put my dick on a chain and hand it off to some woman like it's a damned puppy or something. Pain ripped through me and I thought about what Mags had told me. Lay it out for him. Either he's on board or he's not. Clearly Ruger wasn't on board, which meant this was one big fat dead end. My missing sense of self-preservation finally kicked back in. God, I was such an idiot. You gonna untie that belt or what? I asked, forcing myself to detach. Ruger and Zack might be very different men, but they had one thing in common. They both saw me as a thing to own, a possession. Ruger narrowed his eyes. Don't get all pissy, he said. I'm not saying I plan to sleep around, but I don't think... Let me up, Ruger, I said my voice soft. I need to put on my clothes and get cleaned up. Then I want to go visit with my friends and pretend this didn't happen. This happened. Let me up. He scowled at me, but he reached over and loosened the belt. The instant my hands came free, I sat up, pushing at his big stupid chest to get him out of my way. I hopped off the counter and grabbed my panties and shorts, sliding them on. Then I started walking away. I needed to find a bathroom, clean myself up. He hadn't even worn a fucking condom. Shit. Shit. How stupid could I be? At least I was on the pill. No little brothers or sisters for Noah, thank God. Still, I'd need to get tested. Idiot. Thankfully, I knew he usually wore condoms. I'd certainly found enough of them around his house. I'd talk to him about that later. Stop. I ignored him. Sophie, I said to fucking stop, he said, his voice harder. One of the men across the shed glanced up, speculation in his eyes. Great. I guess giving the locals the first show wasn't enough. We were still on Ruger's turf, though, so I'd follow his rules. For now. What? We're together now. You get that, right? He asked. I'm serious, Soph. You're my property. I'm my own property. I said slowly and clearly. Time to make a break before things got even worse. I didn't plan for this to happen, but I have to give you credit. You're pretty good at getting a girl off. I enjoyed every second of it. And I think you're right about Noah, too. He needs a man in his life. But us actually screwing doesn't really change anything. We're not working out. That doesn't mean he needs to suffer. You guys keep doing your thing together. I won't get in your way. The situation is finally working for the first damn time. I shook my head, resolute. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the next few days, I said. I'm going to find a job, and then I'm going to find a cheap place to live. Get out of your hair. That's fucking bullshit. No, I replied. That's reality. You want the freedom to sleep around. I'm not willing to give you that. I want more. 
Sounds like we have a fundamental difference of opinion here, and I'm not going to try to change you. But I'll tell you one thing, Ruger. I deserve to be with someone who gives a shit about me, as a person. Someone who values me enough not to fuck other women. I'd rather be alone the rest of my life than settle for what you're offering. Consider yourself a hell of a booty call, but that's it. We clear. With that, I walked away from him, hoping I didn't look too much like I'd just gotten my brain screwed out. Not that it really mattered. As much as I hated to admit it, I probably wasn't going to be seeing any of these people again anyway. So far as I could tell, women were only part of the club when they were attached to a man, and I considered myself officially detached. I'd be collecting my purse and my keys from the food table, and then I'd be getting the hell away from the Reaper's M.C. for good. Too bad about the girls. I really liked them a lot. Holy shit, what happened to you? Megs demanded. She looked me over and burst out laughing. Ladies, check this one out. I blushed, wishing I could disappear. So much for nobody guessing what I'd been up to. I see you and Ruger had your little discussion, Dancer said, peering closely at me. What the hell is he, a damned vampire? What do you mean? You have hickeys all over your neck, M said, smirking. Big ones. He did it on purpose. No way a person could do that by accident. Fucking asshole. He is such a dick, I muttered. And this is news? Marie asked. They're all dicks. It's sort of a defining characteristic of men, babe. You know, that dangly thing between their legs? I'm going home, I said. I can't take this. Meg stopped laughing and put her hands on her hips. You are so not going home, she said. Absolutely not. Wasn't this the plan? To figure out what he really wanted from you? Looks like he stepped up. Doesn't mean you can't stick around and have fun with your girls. Oh, I know what he wants from me, I muttered, feeling miserable. He wants me to be his property. The women all squealed, and Marie tried to give me a hug. That kicks ass! M said. I shook my head, and they sobered, confused. He told me that if I sleep with another guy, he'll cut off his dick and feed it to him, I said. And then he told me he wouldn't make any promises about not sleeping around himself. He did say he wouldn't bring anyone home, so I guess I'm supposed to feel good about that? Um, no. Ouch, Marie muttered. That's not gonna work. Nope, Mags replied. Although I see where he gets it. Some of these guys, they fuck anything that moves. They have their old ladies at home, ass on the side, and everyone just pretends it's not happening. Why would anyone think that's okay? I asked. I don't get it. I don't get it either, Marie said. But it's not really my business, telling other people how to live. I know what I do to Horace, though. He'd be praying for death by the time I finished with him. He would be, M added grimly. Marie's real good with a gun. Yep, I'd shoot his dick right off one inch at a time, she confirmed. And trust me, he knows it. Well, I don't care how other people live, I said. If they want to let their men sleep around, that's their business. But I'll be damned if I'll put up with it. Not good enough for me. And no way I want Noah growing up thinking that's how you treat a woman. Ruger can take his offer, stick it on a fork, and shove it up his ass— now I need to find a job and somewhere to live because I'm sure as hell not living with him any longer. Mags nodded, reaching into her back pocket and pulling out a tiny flask. It's medicinal, she said gravely. I twisted off the lid and took a quick sniff, which led to a sneezing fit. What the hell is that? My own special mix, she said, waggling her eyebrows. Trust me, it won't solve a thing. But you know what it will do? What? distract you, she said. You'll be too busy trying to put out the fire in your throat. Bottoms up. I took a swig. Damned if she wasn't right. Four hours later, my throat still burned from Meg's special medicine. I decided not to leave. The girls convinced me that I shouldn't let him win by running away. Making sure Ruger didn't win was extremely high on my list of priorities. The party was surprisingly fun. Mags and I stuck together, seeing as both of us were man-free. She wore Bolt's property patch, so guys left her alone. 
I wore a ring of hickeys that darkened and grew nastier as the night progressed, which may or may not have served the same purpose. It would have been totally humiliating, except I'd already decided I didn't give a flying fuck about any of the reapers or their sluts. And there were a lot of sluts floating around, including Blondie from the kitchen. She gave me a nasty little one-finger wave. More showed up every minute, multiplying like rabbits. To be fair, most of them seemed like pretty nice people, but I was heavily invested in hating them. I kept wondering which ones Ruger had fucked. The old ladies, there were about ten total, were a different group entirely. I liked them a lot and was sorry I wouldn't be getting to know them better. Mags and Marie must have spread the word about my situation, because nobody asked me any nosy questions. The girls kept me so busy I hardly had time to think about my humiliation. I did learn a few interesting things, though. For one, Meg shared why Bolt was in jail. It was an ugly story. Apparently, he'd been convicted of raping a girl who worked at the line. We were sitting in a couple of camp chairs over by the playground, watching over the kids, when Meg started talking about it so matter-of-factly that I thought I hadn't heard her right at first. Um, I said, desperately searching for some kind of response. What do you say when someone tells you her man's in jail for rape? He didn't do it, she said, shrugging. He got set up. I looked away, wondering how a woman who seemed so smart could be so stupid. Who stays with a rapist? If he'd gone to prison, odds were good he'd done the crime. No, she said, taking my hand and squeezing it. I can see what you're thinking. It's not like that. I was with him when it happened, hon. Didn't you tell the cops? I asked, eyes wide. Of course, she replied, but the girl ID'd him, and there was another witness who said they got into a car together. They never tested the DNA, although we've got a lawyer working on that. He says it's just a matter of time before we get him out. It's not Bolt's DNA, but the state lab is so far behind it takes a fucking miracle to get them to lift a finger. The cops said I was lying to cover for him made me look like a criminal and a whore on the stand. Damn, I said. That's horrible, Mags. Tell me about it, she said, her face sober. I love him so damned much. Bolt is a wonderful man. He's done some crazy-ass shit, but he's not a fucking rapist, you know? But being a biker's old lady? To the cops, that means you're nothing more than a club puppet. My testimony meant jack shit by the time they finished with me. He's up for parole in a year anyway, but I want his name cleared. Why haven't they processed the DNA? Good question, she said. New excuse every day. Fucking prosecutors. Huh. I didn't know where to put that, so I fell quiet. What I didn't do was get up or look away, because while I had only met Mags recently, I believed her. She wasn't stupid and she wasn't weak. Scary to think the system could be so corrupt. They definitely screwed Bolt, Marie said, plopping down next to us. But the local prosecutors aren't all bad. I got off on self-defense last year, after things went down with my brother. I glanced over at her, curious, but she seemed lost in thought. That story could wait for another day, I decided. If we had another day. The girls were being supportive, but whether they'd be friends long-term was iffy. I got the impression that once you left the club, you were out, and I was out before I'd even gone in. We settled in to talk about other, happier things as the sky darkened. By nine, the kids were all gone, and things started getting wilder. The music went up, and women's shirts started coming off, none of which fazed my new friends. Then the guy started a big bonfire and broke out a fresh keg. Couples started disappearing into the darkness. I tried not to look too closely— Afraid Ruger had already found someone new to screw. He was free to do whatever the hell he wanted. Didn't mean I needed to watch. That seemed like my cue to leave, except I still hadn't talked to Buck about a job. The more I thought about working at the line, the less realistic it seemed. Maybe I should just let it go. I mentioned this as I helped Marie, Megs, and M clean up the food tables. Dancer had taken her boys to her mom's house a while ago and hadn't gotten back yet. Why don't you talk to Buck and decide after that? Meg suggested, piling half-eaten bags of chips into a cardboard box. I'll help you find him. Let's get this finished first, though. 
All this shit needs to go into the kitchen. Here, give me the box, Marie said, reaching for it. Sophie, can you grab the other one? Sure, I said, picking it up. Marie was really sweet. She'd spend half the night talking about her wedding, which was just three weeks away. She'd made it very clear that she wanted me to come, no matter what was up with Ruger. Now I followed her into the armory through a back door, leading past a set of bathrooms into the large kitchen area. It wasn't anything special, not a professional kitchen. Still big, though, like you'd find in a church. Three fridges, lots of counter space, and a big round garbage can that had overflowed onto the floor. We both stopped, staring at it. Jesus, I cannot believe what pigs these boys can be, she muttered. Take the fucking garbage out when it's full. Doesn't take a genius. You think we can handle it? I asked, considering the can. It was packed hard and looked heavy. Only one way to find out, she replied. We set down the food, stuffed in as much of the spilled garbage as possible, and then each grabbed a side. It wasn't easy, but we wrestled it out through the kitchen and into the main lounge of the armory, which I hadn't seen yet. Holy shit! I said to Marie, eyes wide. The place was full of men drinking and women walking around all but naked. There was a bar with a naked chick giving body shots. My eyes skittered away only to land on another girl whose head bobbed up and down over a man's lap. He sat on a ratty couch, leaning back with his eyes closed, one hand wrapped tight in her hair. Just ignore it, Marie muttered, rolling her eyes. Bunch of dumbasses. The dumpster's out in the front, across from the parking lot. The geniuses who designed this place didn't put in many external doors. Built to be a fortress. Annoying as hell. We lugged the garbage across the room, and I felt my cheeks burning. Then a man came up and grabbed the heavy can on my side. You girls should have asked for help, he said, smiling at me. He was kind of cute, I realized. A little older, probably in his thirties. He had a long beard, tattoos— they all had tattoos. I figured it must be in the bylaws or something. And he wore a cut with one of those little diamond one percent patches. His name read D.C. Thanks, Marie said brightly. Grab the door for us, will you, Soph? I opened the big main door leading out into the front parking lot. There were more guys out there, sort of standing around. The guys I'd seen earlier, who didn't have very many patches on their vests. Prospects, get your asses over here and take care of this garbage, D.C. yelled, and two of them jumped up to grab the can. It needs to go back in the kitchen when they're done, Marie told D.C. No prob, babe, he replied. Who's your friend? Marie and I exchanged glances. I could tell she didn't want to introduce me, but neither of us wanted to be rude either. I'm Sophie, I said, taking the pressure off her. I'm just visiting... In fact, I'm heading out soon. Marie opened her mouth to add something. Suddenly, a giant man came up behind her, swinging her up and twirling her around before throwing her over his shoulder. Horse. I need to be fucked, woman, he declared, smacking her ass. Then he carried her back into the building as she shrieked in protest. I suddenly found myself alone in the dark with D.C. and the prospects. None of the younger guys looked me in the eye, and I thought very hard about the warnings I'd been given earlier. Yep, I was in the negative on every detail. Nice brands, he said. He reached up to trace the stupid hickeys Ruger had given me. You belong to someone? Now that was a loaded question. It's complicated, I replied, glancing around. I don't know what I was looking for. Kimber would know what to do at a time like this, I thought darkly. I need to get back inside, find the girls. I'll just go over there, I added, nodding toward the big gate in the wall to the side of the building. The gate I'd come in before. No way I would be walking back through that clubhouse by myself, not after what I'd seen in there. I'll take you, D.C. said, wrapping his arm around my shoulders and tucking me in tight next to his body. I smelled booze on his breath. Shit, shit, shit! Hey there! Em yelled, waving at me from the gate. I'd never been so happy to see someone in my life. She walked over to us, her smile bright and sweet. Thanks for finding Sophie, D.C. I need to get her back now. Ruger's up next in the ring, and he'll be super pissed if she misses his fight. 
They live together, you know. D.C. let me go, and I ran over to M. He frowned at me. Told you it was complicated, I said, my voice wavering. Sorry? He snorted as he turned and walked back into the armory, slamming the door behind him. The remaining guys looked everywhere but at me and M. Jesus, I could kill Marie for leaving you with him, M muttered, grabbing my arm and dragging me across the parking lot toward the gate. At least she yelled at me to go get you as Horace carried her past. Never leave a sister behind, you know. That could have gotten ugly. Um, she didn't really have much choice, I said. Horse just grabbed her and carried her off. It happened really fast. All Horse thinks about is sex, M snapped, her voice heavy with a mixture of disgust and what sounded suspiciously like jealousy. At least Marie sent you out here, I said. Would he have hurt me? Probably not, she said, her voice smooth. But odds are good he's drunk. You get a guy drunk enough? He doesn't always hear the word no. Does that happen? Rape? she asked bluntly. I nodded. It's not supposed to, she said. It's not like it's considered okay or anything, but I'm sure it's happened here. It happened in my college dorm, too. Any time you put people together, some of them are going to do horrible things. And you get enough horny men drinking enough alcohol, it can lead to bad shit. I'll tell you one thing, I feel safer here than I have at some frat parties. Reaper parties might get wilder than college ones, but we have rules, and trust me, they're enforced. And you grew up around this? I asked. Wasn't that... scary? I grew up with twenty uncles, M said, smiling brightly as we passed through the gate. She raised a hand to the guy standing there, and they all waved back. Clearly, M was loved. All of them would have done anything for me. I had aunties all over, too, and a bunch of kids to play with. Kids I'd known all my life. You saw how many children were here earlier, and they were all having a great time. Of course, we send them home before things get too crazy. And what age did you start staying later? I asked. She rolled her eyes and shrugged. Dad told me to leave about half an hour ago, she admitted. He doesn't want me to grow up. Not that any guy here would lay a finger on me. That's a thing. This is a family. Family takes care of each other. And all these women running around? I asked. That D.C. guy wasn't interested in me as family. Her face fell and she sighed. You aren't family, she said softly. I mean, you're Ruger's family and you'll be treated with respect. D.C.'s not from around here and he had no idea who you were. But if you're serious about not being Ruger's property, you'll never be a real part of the club. Would you hate me if I told you I don't want to be part of the club? I get it, she said, sighing. Believe me. I just wish it could be different for you guys. I wouldn't settle for what Ruger's offering either, though. No fucking way. You want to get out of here? My dad's going to see me sooner or later, so I might as well bug out now. Yeah, I really do, I told her. Let's go watch a movie or something, she said. You can come over to my place if you like. We have a killer home theater set up. Um, that sounds good, I replied, sort of surprised. You know, it's funny. I don't think of a motorcycle club president as being the kind of guy who'd have a home theater. I'll bet you wouldn't think he'd have a virgin daughter either, she said, regaining some of her humor. Fuck this, let's go. Last time they had a party this big, I walked in on my dad screwing this chick I graduated with. It was disgusting. Back out in the courtyard, a circle had formed beyond the bonfire. People cheered, yelled, and groaned every few seconds. "'What's that all about?' I asked, craning my neck. "'Fights,' M said shortly. "'That's what happens when you have too many penises concentrated in one place. "'Oh, and I wasn't kidding when I said Ruger was up next. "'He's out there right now. "'For some reason, they think it's fun to hit each other. "'Let's find Mags. Maybe she'll come watch movies with us.' I laughed, then spotted Mags. She stood near the fire, staring deep into the flames. I walked over to her, but she didn't look up. You okay? She sighed and crossed her arms, frowning. Peachy, she said, rolling her eyes. I'm just sick and fucking tired of being here without my man. The club's great and all, but it's not like having Bolt in my bed. I wasn't quite sure what to do, so I hugged her. She hugged me back. I really wanted to stay friends with these women, despite the whole Ruger situation. 
Hey, you want to come and watch movies with me and M? I asked. I'm sick of Ruger. Picnic says M has to leave, and you're lonely. Sounds like God Himself wants us to get out of here and eat some chocolate ice cream. She snorted. Ice cream's no substitute for a man, she said wryly. We can have whipped cream on it, I said, waggling my eyebrows. You can pretend you are licking it off him instead of the spoon. You're a dork, she replied, but she smiled. I know, I said cheerfully, but I'm a dork who knows her refrigerated toppings, and that's mission critical tonight. Let's go. I want you to meet Buck first, she said. You need to ask him about a job. I frowned. Did I really want to work at a strip club, especially one owned by the Reapers? Didn't seem like the best way to distance myself. You don't have to decide tonight, she said. Just talk to him, and then we'll get back to what's really important ice cream and chick flicks. A sad one, please, because I'm definitely in the mood for a good cry. Let's just talk to him, okay? Not like you have anything to lose, M added, coming up beside us. Fine, Buck, then we'll ditch this place. I'm ready for a three way with Ben and Jerry. Megs took my hand and pulled me toward the crowd surrounding the fighters, M trailing us like a puppy. I couldn't see much of the fight, what with the wall of bikers cutting us off, but Megs wormed her way through them like an expert. Soon we stood on the edge of the ring, which was just a line traced in the dirt. She was looking around for Buck, but the sound of a fist hitting flesh caught my full attention. Ruger stood in the center of the circle, naked to the waist, hands bare, expression hostile. He was facing off against a man I didn't know. He looked a little younger than Ruger, and based on the blood dripping down his face, Ruger was kicking his ass. M stumbled to a halt next to me. What the hell does Painter think he's doing? she muttered. I can't believe he's fighting Ruger. That's fucking stupid. Why? I asked. Eyes glued to the men circling each other. I could see the top half of Ruger's panther tattoo above his jeans. It really was perfect for him. Every movement was lithe and smooth and utterly predatory. Ruger's really good, Em said shortly. He'll slaughter Painter. Is that the one? Yeah, she said, her voice grim. That's him. The guy who won't put out for me. I hope Ruger kicks his ass. Ruger chose that moment to plow his fist into Painter's stomach, and the crowd roared. Painter gasped, but he stayed upright, recovering surprisingly fast, at least to my uneducated eye. He's over there, Meg said, grabbing my arm again. I looked at her blankly. Who's over there? Buck, she said. You wanted to talk to him about a job, right? Oh, yeah, I said, forcing myself to look away from the circling boxers. What kind of idiots fought like this on purpose? Mags dragged me through the crowd some more, coming to a halt next to a big man watching the fight with his arms crossed. He didn't look too happy. Hey, Buck, Mags said brightly. He glanced down at her and raised a brow. I swallowed. Um, we can do this a different time, I leaned in and whispered to Mags. He doesn't look like he's in a good mood. He's just like that, she said. Right, Buck? You're always kind of a dick, aren't you? The big man actually smiled. And you're always kind of a bitch, but I like you anyway, he said. You ready to ditch Bolt's ass and fuck a real man? I think Jade might have a problem with that, and she's a hell of a good shot. This time the smile reached his eyes. That's the fucking truth, he said. God, but she can be a bitch. Never boring. So who's this? This is Sophie, she said, jerking me forward. From the ring I heard the crack of flesh hitting flesh, and saw Painter staggering in the corner of my eye. Ruger circled him like a cat playing with its food. I forced myself not to pay attention, focusing on Buck instead. Talking to him couldn't hurt. Sophie's looking for a job, Mags added. Dancing? he asked, raising a brow. His eyes crawled down my figure, assessing me closely in a new way. All business now. I want a waitress, I said. I've waited tables and bars before. Never a strip club, but I'm a hard worker. I hear it's a good place to work. He studied me, face thoughtful. You belong to anyone? Mags and I looked at each other and I shook my head. Not really, I answered. 
What the fuck is that supposed to mean? She... Shut up, Mags, he said, although his tone wasn't mean. She can't talk for herself. She's got no place in my bar. So what's the story? You belong to someone or not? There was a sudden flurry of activity between the fighters, a series of fast blows that I couldn't quite follow in my peripheral vision. Based on the crowd's reaction, things were getting interesting. You the slow taking drink orders? Buck asked. Because I don't need a slow waitress. Sorry, I said, gathering myself. Ruger is my son's uncle. He give you that ring around your neck? Um, yeah, I said, grimacing. And I live with him. Nothing between us, though. I just really need a job. Buck eyed me speculatively, then glanced at Meg's. She smirked and rolled her eyes. Buck nodded slowly, then leaned over to the man next to him. Hundred bucks on painter? The man stared at him, brows raising. You fucking insane? Nope, Buck said. We got a bet. Sure, I'll take your money. Kid's almost finished. Buck turned back to me. Show me your tits, he said. My eyes widened. I'm not looking to dance, I said quickly. Just wait tables. Yeah, I get that, he replied. But I need to make sure you'll fill out the uniform right. You can leave your bra, but lift that shirt if you want a job. I glanced at Mags, who nodded reassuringly. Don't worry, she said, bright eyes darting between me, Buck, and the men fighting. You need a decent rack to waitress at the line. Go ahead, nobody will care. I took a deep breath, reached down, and pulled up my shirt all the way. Two seconds later, I heard a huge crash. Suddenly, Ruger was between me and Buck, fist slamming into his face. Buck went down and Ruger followed, pounding him brutally. I screamed as Mags jerked me to the side, both of us ducking our heads and huddling together. Three guys jumped on Ruger, pulling him off Buck. He fought against them, cussing and growling. Picnic appeared, followed by Gage, who carried a bat. Shut the fuck up, everyone! Picnic yelled. Ruger, pull your shit together. You're out of the ring, you forfeit. Now stop thinking with your dick, jackass. Let me go, Ruger growled. You gonna pull your shit together? Gage asked. Ruger nodded tightly and the guys let him go. Gage reached down to Buck, giving him a hand up. We got a problem here? Buck spat out some blood and grinned, the bright red outlining his teeth horrifically and dripping down his chin. He looked like a serial killer. It's all good, he said, licking his lips. Asshole just won a bet for me. Too fucking easy. Then he glanced at me, still crouched next to Mags, utterly stunned. No job, he said. Got enough bitch drama at the bar already. Had a fight, though, perfect. Ruger always wins. Fucking beautiful moment. Thanks, sweetheart. Um, okay, I said quickly. I think I'd do better working somewhere else anyway. Ruger glared at me, chest heaving, his entire body covered with a sheen of sweat. You asked him for a job? he demanded, grabbing my arm and jerking me through the crowd. I tried to break away, but he didn't even notice. Let me go! Ruger dragged me over to the courtyard wall and pinned me up against it, putting a hand on either side of my head as he got down into my face. What part of this is so fucking complicated? he asked, as angry as I'd ever seen him. Well, almost. You don't just go around flashing your tits. It's not a difficult concept, Sophie. Meg said he needed to check me out for the waitress job, I told him quickly. She said it wasn't personal, not a big deal at all. Ruger's eyes darkened. When a man asks to see a woman's tits, it's always personal, he said slowly and clearly, and yours belong to me. No fucking way I'm letting you work at the line. And keep your damned shirt on. Christ, it's like I'm talking to myself half the time. No worries, I said, not bothering to argue. Pointless. I've had enough of this club. I'm leaving. Em and I plan to watch movies and eat ice cream. Ruger stilled, then reached out and brushed my hair behind my ear. His touch gentle. I felt myself relax a little. Maybe he wasn't as angry as I'd thought. Then his fingers slid deeper into my hair and his eyes hardened. His hand tightened painfully as he jerked my mouth into his. His tongue stabbed deep into my mouth, 
possessive and dominant. His other hand caught my arm, jerking my body forward into his as he twisted it up and behind me. One knee shoved between my legs and he slanted his head, taking everything he wanted and more. My body loved it, the faithless bitch. The fight had left him sweaty all over, sending out pheromones so strong it's a wonder I could still stand upright. I wanted to wrap my arms around him, but he held me too tight, controlling every move. I was starting to sense a pattern with Mr. Don't Come Until I Tell You. Finally he pulled away, both of us gasping for breath. He still held me tight, completely incapable of movement, even if I'd wanted to get away, which I didn't. My brain had checked out a while back. His hips ground into me, cock more than ready to finish things off. You belong to me, he said, voice harsh. Ruger, I started, but a sudden loud feminine scream tore through the air. Ruger dropped me and spun around, covering me with his body as he scoped out the situation. The screaming continued, and then I heard a roar of masculine rage. In the dim firelight I saw a man tear across the courtyard, with about ten more guys chasing him. He hit the far wall, jumped high, and caught the top with his hands, pulling himself over. "'Holy shit!' I muttered. "'Stay out of the way,' Ruger said, turning to me. His eyes were deadly serious, and for once I had every intention of doing exactly what he said. "'I'll send one of the girls over, then you get the fuck out of here. Walk to your cars together. Got me?' "'Shouldn't we call the cops?' I asked, as the screaming died down. Now I heard crying and angry shouting. "'Someone's hurt. What the hell is going on?' "'No idea what happened,' Ruger replied. "'We'll get help, no worries. But don't call the cops. We handle things ourselves within the club. Do what I say for once and wait for me to send someone over. Then go home and stay there. I can't deal with this and worry about you, too.' I nodded and he kissed me hard, then ran off toward the armory gate. In the distance, I heard bikes roar to life and then a gunshot. I slid down the wall and sat, knees drawn up tight against my chest, and did my best to obey Ruger perfectly. Mags came over ten minutes later. Her face was grim and she had streaks of blood on her arm. I stood and threw my arms around her, clutching her tight. What happened? I whispered. Fucking toke, she muttered. There's some sort of club shit going down. They voted on it today. Supposed to be a done deal, but toke, he's out of Portland, had a few too many beers and decided there should be a recount. He started fighting with Deke and pulled a goddamned knife, waving it around like a jackass. Who was screaming? I asked. I pulled away and looked down at her arm. You're all bloody. Who got hurt? Her eyes hardened. M, she said. Cocksucker caught M with his knife. Shock hit me and I felt myself sway. Did anyone call an ambulance? I asked, glancing around the courtyard. Beyond the fire I saw someone sitting on the ground, surrounded by women. She's fine, thank God, Mag said, her voice harsh and angry. It's not a bad cut at all. We've got a guy who will give her a few stitches, keep the whole thing off the radar. What about that gunshot? Pick wasn't too happy about his baby girl getting cut, she said, which I figured was a bit of an understatement. Had to be him. Toke took off right over the wall, and I'll bet he's setting a new land speed record right now. If he's smart, he won't stop till he hits Mexico. M's a special girl. Everyone loves her. Not to mention pulling on his own president? This is more than a fight. It's club business. Toke just stepped in a giant, steaming pile of shit. I shivered. Let's go, Meg said. They want all the girls cleared out. Marie and Dancer will stick with M, but the rest of us are no longer welcome. We need to stay out of the way. Hell, at this rate we'll be posting bail. Be sure to sleep with your phone tonight. You serious? I asked, eyes wide. If Pig catches Toke, shit'll get ugly, she said. But don't worry, our boys are smart. They'll keep the situation under control. And the bail thing? That was a joke, right? Just keep your phone close, okay? Holy hell. Chapter 11 
My hand shook so hard I had trouble getting the keys into the ignition. Mags offered to follow me home, but I wanted to go by myself. I had a lot to think about, and I didn't feel like company. Clearly, Ruger and I had different definitions of what normal, appropriate behavior looked like. For one, I felt that long-term relationships should be monogamous. He felt they should be monogamous for me and open for him. Another issue... My parties usually wound down when people ran out of food and got tired. His occasionally ended with stabbings and high-speed chases. And last, but certainly not least, I tended to think sex should be private. He liked rubbing his sperm on my stomach in front of his friends after branding me with hickeys. I needed to move out. Immediately. No more messing around. The more I thought about what had happened, the angrier I got. M could have been killed. I might already have a fucking STD, seeing as I screwed the king of the man whores, condom free, in a damned shed, because I'm classy like that. Oh, and what's his name might have raped me in the darkness, just because I'd had the nerve to take out the trash when it needed emptying. What the hell was wrong with these people? Two hours after pulling into Ruger's driveway, I'd nearly finished packing up our stuff. We'd only been at his house for a week, so it wasn't exactly hard. I just threw shit into boxes and then hauled them out to my car. I could probably get it all in one trip, seeing as Noah was still at Kimber's. I'd call her first thing in the morning and ask if she could put us up for a couple of days. Fuck Ruger. Fuck his beautiful house and fuck the Reapers. Fuck their motorcycles, too. I hope they all got food poisoning at one of their damned pig roasts. I'd already finished packing my clothes, the living room, and the bathroom by the time I heard Ruger's bike pulling into the driveway. Well, wasn't that just craptastic? I'd planned to be gone before he got home, but if he wanted a fight, I'd give him one. I might not have my life entirely together, but I was pretty sure about one thing. Parties that ended with stabbings weren't part of the long-term plan. Neither was being tied to a man in prison, working as a stripper— or worrying about whether or not I was safe without a goddamned brand across my back like a fucking cow. I'd started throwing Noah's clothes into the suitcase when Ruger's boots thudded down the stairs. He paused in my kitchen, and I heard the sound of water filling a glass. So now it wasn't good enough for him to put me in danger and invade my privacy? He had to get my glasses dirty, too? I threw Noah's stuffed dragon, Puff, into the case with a disgusted thud. Wait. Why the fuck should I care where he got water? I wouldn't be here to wash the damned dishes. Wasn't my house. The ridiculousness of the night, the horrible way the party ended, packing to move God knew where at three in the morning. It all hit me at once. I grabbed Puff and slid down next to the bed, laughing at my own craziness. Why had I ever, for even a second thought we could live in Ruger's basement. I laughed as Ruger walked down the hall. I laughed as he came in the room, and I kept laughing when he knelt down in front of me. I ignored the waves of frustrated anger rolling off him because I just didn't give a damn. He reached out and caught my chin, forcing me to look into his eyes. They cut through me accusingly, like he had the right to an opinion. I stopped laughing and gave him my most evil smile. What the hell is going on here? he asked. I'm packing, I told him, holding up the dragon for him to see. We're leaving. I'm not your whore, and Noah's not your son. Your club is insane, and I don't want a damned thing to do with any of you. Do you remember when I said coming to the party was a bad idea? he asked me, raising a brow. Yeah, I remember that, I snapped. But you know what would have really driven the point home? mentioning that when your parties get wild, girls get stabbed. Because I'm pretty sure we didn't cover that part. I would have remembered Ruger. She'll get her justice, he said, eyes darkening. Toke will pay. Deke and Pignic are on it. Um, hate to break it to you, but M doesn't need justice, I pointed out, voice heavy with sarcasm. She needs to not get cut with a knife in the first place. Women are finicky that way. We like not getting cut. It was a horrible accident, he said slowly. And despite whatever crazy shit you're imagining, 
It's not something that's ever happened before. You're telling me with a straight face that you never have fights at your clubhouse? No, he said, speaking slowly and clearly. I'm telling you that they don't usually involve innocent women. Two men want to fight? That's their business. And what about women who aren't so innocent? I asked. Where do you draw the line on that one? Do you like to hit girls, Ruger? Is that okay in your stupid club? The air changed between us, growing cold. Oh, that got to him. A whole new level of angry rolled into the room between us, and I suddenly realized taunting him might not be such a great idea. Don't talk about the club like that, he said, face like stone. Show respect if you want to be treated with respect, and you know what? Damned straight I'd hit a woman if she hit me first. I'm not a knight in shining fucking armor, Sophie. What part of this don't you get? I've been honest with you all along. No bullshit. And yeah, a woman who attacks a man deserves what she gets. She wants to act like a man. She can damned well fight like one. And that doesn't bother you? I asked him. He shook his head. Not a bit. You want equality, babe? That's equality. Yeah, you're practically a feminist, I muttered. Em wasn't fighting, Ruger. She'll have a scar the rest of her life. And how is it women have equality when it comes to taking a hit, but the rest of the time they're just some guy's property? Stop talking shit about things you don't understand, he growled. Property is a term of respect. It's part of our culture. You start judging us for that, you better start judging every woman who changes her name the day she gets married, because it's the same damned thing. He stopped, running a hand through his hair, clearly frustrated. When you're someone's property, you're a woman the brothers will die to protect, he continued, his voice softening. They'll die to protect your kid, too. Don't turn that kind of loyalty into something ugly because you don't like the words we use. Dancer, Marie, Mags, they're proud to be property because they know what it means. Nobody forcing them to do anything. I swallowed, processing that. So tell me this, I asked. Why did Horst tell me that Marie's worth every penny he paid for her? Because that sounded a little fucked up and I don't think he was joking. You're at the clubhouse for less than a day and you've already heard about that? He muttered, almost to himself. Jesus, a little fucking discretion would be nice. Yup, don't want to scare away the new girls with reality, do we? Don't worry about it, he replied. Marie and Horse are fine, and they're getting married next month, so I think it's a moot point. Holy shit, did he really buy her? I asked, eyes widening. Ruger, that's... I don't even have words for that. Good. Maybe you'll shut up, he said. If you're interested, I have an update on M for you. You know, your friend you're so worried about. Maybe a little more important than lecturing me about women's rights, you think? I froze, shamed. Ruger was right. I'd been more focused on fighting with him than on M. How shitty was that? Yeah, I'd like to hear how she's doing, I said. I tossed Puff to the side and rose to my feet. He stepped forward into my space, doing that intimidation thing he was so good at. So, how is she? She's fine, he said after a long pause. It wasn't much of a cut, about three inches long and not deep at all. We got a friend of the club who came by, gave her some stitches to make sure she stays all pretty when it heals. Antibiotics, just to be careful. Last I saw her, she was high as a kite on oxy, and singing some kid song about kittens and mittens. The picnic's not feeling quite so festive, gotta admit. That's good news, I replied, staring at his chest blankly. He really was way too close. I got a text from Mags an hour ago, but I wasn't sure if she was downplaying things or not. I don't like your parties, Ruger. First part wasn't half bad, he said slowly, a knowing smile stealing across his face. You know, in the shed. He reached out and touched my neck lightly, then wrapped his fingers around it. My marks look good, he continued. Might keep them on you long term. Haven't decided yet. But you need to learn not to flirt with other guys, babe. You're claimed now. One, take your damned hand off me because I am not claimed, I said. He ignored me. 
and two, I didn't flirt with anyone. You flashed your tits at the whole damned club, he said. His hand tightened ever so slightly on my neck, not hard enough to hurt, just enough to show he could. Oh, I didn't like that at all. Take your fucking hand off me, I growled. This time he did, but at the same time he pushed me forward with his body, unbalancing me. I fell back on Noah's bed, almost hitting my head against the wall. Before I could roll away, Ruger dropped down over me, trapping me just as surely as he had back in my Seattle apartment. I was wearing a bra and Meg's told me to do it, I hissed, not bothering to fight him. That'd probably just turn him on, perv. She said he needed to check me out if I wanted to waitress at the line. I need a damn job, Ruger. Didn't seem like a big deal. Half the women there weren't even wearing shirts. It's not like I took off my bra. You're a fucking idiot, he snapped. Of course Buck checks out potential waitresses at the club during business hours. He did that to piss me off and get me out of the ring. He played you to win a bet, Soph. He'd never hire you without my permission, anyway. Why didn't Meg say it was okay, then? I demanded. Damn, he was heavy. He smelled good, too, which I hated. Predictably, my body wasn't listening to my brain again, because I had the urge to spread my legs and wrap them around his waist. Fuck if I know, but she did it on purpose, he growled. Might want to ask her about that. She set you up, and that means she set me up. I'll have words with her later. I narrowed my eyes. You leave Mags alone, I said, glaring. If someone needs to have words with her, it'll be me. If you and Horace had a problem, would you want me involved? Jesus, you're a pain in the ass, he said. And you're a disgusting pig man. No respect for me at all. I respect you, he said, frowning. I snorted. Yeah, I'll bet you fuck all the women you respect in public. And what the hell was that shit about coming on my stomach? I'm not a damned porn star, Ruger. I'm still all sticky and disgusting. Kinda hard to clean up in a porta, John. This house has three showers, babe. Not my fault you haven't taken one yet. I like the idea of me all over you. So no rush on that. I was busy packing. I wanted to get out of here before you got home, asshole. Yeah, I see that, he muttered. He leaned down, his face so close our lips almost brushed. You're not moving out, babe. You're mine. We covered this. Done deal. Oh, I'm definitely moving out, I told him. Not even you can think this is healthy, Ruger. He smiled at me with the eyes of a predator. I don't care if it's healthy, he whispered. Whole damned world's unhealthy. You think all those people living in giant houses on the lake have happy, pretty, perfect lives? You think those bitches aren't backstabbing each other while their husbands fuck interns on their lunch breaks? I shook my head. My friend Kimber's not like that. Her life's nice and normal and not crazy at all. Then she's one in a thousand, he replied. Because I swear to you, sometimes the nastiest shit happens behind the prettiest doors, while everyone laughs and smiles and pretends everything's okay. Here's the thing about my world. We're fucked up. We own it. We take care of business and move on. In twenty years, those healthy people you're so jealous of will still be backstabbing each other, and their kids will too. I'll take my chances, I said. Ruger scowled and pushed himself up abruptly. Then he grabbed me and threw me over his shoulder like a sack of wheat. I squawked as he carried me out of the room and up the stairs to his loft, kicking and punching him the entire time. Didn't do a bit of good. I don't know what I expected. Maybe that he'd throw me down on the bed and ravish me, like a movie or something. He didn't. Instead, he carried me into his big bathroom, dumped me in the shower, and turned on the faucet. What the hell are you doing? I shrieked as cold water hit me, still fully clothed. Ruger grabbed the shower hose and started spraying me down with it. I'm showing you respect, he yelled back at me. So sorry I got you all messy earlier. Just doing my best to make this relationship healthy and clean, because that's so fucking important to you. Aren't I a fucking prince? I hate you, I screamed, lunging for the hose. He laughed and sprayed my face. 
I lashed out and slipped. In a flash, Ruger caught me, then pulled me tight into his body. I found myself looking up at him, my wet clothes soaking both of us, one of his arms wrapped around my waist and his other hand tight in my hair. We glared at each other. Jesus, you fuck with my head, he said roughly. My cock gets hard just thinking about you. You're in my dreams every night. I wake up in the morning and all I think about is you and my house, you and Noah finally mine. My family. It's even better than riding my bike. I'm crazy for you, Soph. I shook my head, stunned. I didn't believe him. I couldn't afford to. You're just saying that to control me, I whispered, not sure whether I was talking to myself or him. Fuck me, you just don't get it, do you? He took my mouth in a fast, hard kiss, and I fought him for about two seconds. Then I gave in, because my body recognized him, needed him. Suddenly there were too many clothes between us. Our hands scrambled, and I discovered that waterlogged jeans, even cut-off ones, must be the least convenient thing on earth to wear when you need quick access. Still, I managed to get them down and kicked away just as he grabbed my waist, spun me around, and leaned me against the counter. I looked up to see him in the mirror, face flushed red with need, eyes capturing mine as he slammed his cock deep inside. It filled me fast and hard, stretching me until it bordered on pain. I gasped, the sound a mix of pleasure and pain. I've never felt anything better in my life. Fucking crazy for you, he muttered, fingers digging into my skin. Always have been. Ruger. Then he took me, forcing me to brace myself with both hands as he pounded me from behind. One hand steadied my hips while the other reached around on my clit. That piercing of his lit along my G-spot, the hard little knobs of metal on the top and bottom of his cock head carrying me to a whole new level of sensation. My orgasm hit with agonizing speed, and I screamed, pulsing around him. Ruger thrust three more times, and then he came, too, hot seed spurting. Shit, we'd forgotten the condom again. He pulled out of me slowly, and we looked at each other in the mirror, our chests heaving. He was fully clothed, and I still wore my T-shirt. My hair was sopping wet and scraggly, and eye makeup ran down my face. I was a hot mess without the hot part. Do you have any diseases? I asked, my brain valiantly fighting for control. He shook his head, still watching me in the mirror. I always use a condom, he said. Never fuck a girl without one, actually. Fucked me without one twice, I said, my voice dry. Want to rethink your answer? He offered a smug smile. I know you're on the pill, he said, so pregnancy's not the issue. Also know you're clean. You're my woman, so why shouldn't I feel you around me? And I swear to you, babe, I have never, ever fucked anyone without protection before. I even donated blood about two weeks ago. All clear. That's a relief, I said, straightening. I looked around for my panties and shorts. They'd landed near the toilet, dripping water everywhere. How do you know I'm on the pill? I asked, reaching for a towel to wrap around myself. Found him in your purse, he said without a hint of shame. I looked up, startled. Why were you in my purse? I asked, not pleased. To get to your phone, he replied, tucking himself back into his pants. I wanted to set up the GPS on it. I stopped cold. You have GPS tracking my phone? I asked, incredulous. What the hell is wrong with you? You want to chip me like a dog, too? I want to be able to find you if there's an emergency, he said, his face growing serious. I know it sounds paranoid, but we had a real bad situation last winter. Marie and Horace would be dead right now if I hadn't had GPS on her. Nearly died as it was. Now I do it for all the girls in the club. Don't worry, I don't spy on you or anything. But it'll be there if you ever get in trouble. I don't even know where to start, I said, closing my eyes. I was exhausted, I realized. No wonder my brain wouldn't kick in and tell me what to do. Let's go to bed, he said. I'm tired. You're tired. I'll sleep downstairs, I told him, clutching the towel as I reached for my clothes. 
You'll sleep up here with me, he replied. You can fight me on it and lose, which is more work for both of us, or you can just give in. Gonna end the same, either way. I looked at him and knew he was right. I'd set him straight later. Right now, I needed rest. Can I borrow something to wear? I asked, trying not to yawn. I'm too tired to go get dry stuff. I'd rather you sleep naked. I'd rather you go fuck yourself, but seeing as that's not an option, can I borrow something to wear? He smiled at me. Knock yourself out. Shirts are in the top drawer, underwear in the second one down. I left the bathroom and looked around to find his dresser. Sure enough, the top drawer held a variety of T-shirts. I found one with a reaper symbol on it and pulled it out. Then I moved down to the next drawer. Most of his stuff was black or gray, but a flash of pink in the back caught my eye. What the hell? I pulled out a pair of silky pink panties. Jesus, Ruger, I said. Is there anywhere in this house women don't leave their lingerie? It's like a damn Victoria's Secret in here. I turned to him, holding the panties out with two fingers, disgusted. He cocked his head and gave me a strange smile. Those are yours, actually, he said slowly. You left them behind. What are you talking about? That first night, he said, with Zack. You left them in my apartment. Had them ever since. I froze and studied them more closely. It had been a long time, but they did look familiar. I'd been so sad to lose them because I'd bought them special. I can't decide if that's just a little bit creepy or really super creepy, I said finally, glancing over at him. He shrugged, eyes holding mine steady. You asked me the other night if wanting you was a new thing, he said, his face free of mockery for once. It's not a new thing, babe. Not a new thing at all. I woke suddenly, wondering where the hell I was. A strong masculine arm lay across my stomach, pinning me down. A vaulted cedar ceiling rose overhead. I turned to see Ruger lying face down next to me, and it all came back in a rush. I needed to get out of here before he woke up and started in on his you're my woman and I own you bullshit. I couldn't afford to play around any more. Noah had been through enough already. Lifting his arm cautiously, I rolled out of bed and turned to look at his sleeping form. Ruger's back was half covered by the sheet, and for the first time I had the chance to study his ink in full light. His perfectly sculpted body wasn't just sexy, it was literally a work of art. His arms were a mass of patterns and designs so intricate, I had trouble following them. But dominating his right bicep was a picture of what had to be Noah's Ark. The animals marching away from it were fantastical, dragons and demons and snakes, but the Ark itself was unmistakable. My breath caught. How had I never noticed that before? He shifted in his sleep, the sheet slipping lower. I couldn't allow myself much time. I wanted to leave before he woke up and we started fighting. Given our track record... I'd have sex with him again if that happened. My clip perked up and sent an urgent memo to my brain endorsing that option. Screwing a man-whore had one advantage. He certainly knew what he was doing. As for the pink panties I wore, I didn't know what to think about that. It should have grossed me out, but mostly just turned me on. All those years I'd been lusting after him, and he'd been lusting after me, too. Not enough to stay faithful, of course, but... He'd still wanted me. My nipples joined my clit in petitioning for another round. I ignored both of them. Nothing had changed. The party, M, all the reasons I should avoid the Reapers. Ruger and I simply couldn't be together. But for a few minutes, while he still slept, I let myself study the incredibly sexy man who'd been an unofficial father to my son. Across the top of his back was a broad, curved banner of ink matching the patch on his cut that said, Reapers. Their symbol, the Reaper himself, covered the center, and I saw just a hint of the bottom rocker, which I knew would say Idaho. Strange as it sounds, the combination of his club colors and the arc illustrated Ruger's contradictions perfectly. Strange spots covered his shoulders, and along his side I saw just a hint of the panther's claw reaching around from his hip. 
He shifted and I froze, reality crashing back down. I needed to get out or we'd have another fight. Realistically, we'd have another fight regardless, but a little break would be nice. I went downstairs and found my phone, checking the time. Seven in the morning. It took me less than thirty minutes to finish the last of my packing. Then I carried everything out to the car, loaded it, and climbed in. I turned the key in the ignition, feeling sad and just a little wistful. Things would turn out, I told myself firmly. I was doing the right thing. As if to prove my point, the sun was already high and bright. Birds were singing like in some stupid Disney movie. I turned out of the driveway onto the road and saw Elle, Ruger's neighbor, walking along with her dog. She smiled as she saw me, waving me down. I pulled over. Elle's eyes flicked over the car, noting the presence of boxes and the lack of a child. "'Trouble in paradise?' she asked dryly. I smiled ruefully and shrugged. "'You could say that,' I replied. "'Ruger and I live in different worlds. I realized it doesn't matter how cheap the rent is. Staying isn't going to work.' "'Do you have a plan?' she asked. And it wasn't one of those questions that's actually a passive-aggressive accusation in disguise— my mother had been the master of those. I could tell Elle was genuinely concerned. Not really, I said, but I guess that's okay. Every time I make plans, they fall apart anyway. Noah's with my friend Kimber, and she's got a spare room. I'm sure she'll put us up until I pull something together. I see, she replied, pursing her lips thoughtfully. She glanced over at Ruger's house, then cocked her head at me. Why don't you come over and have some breakfast? There's something I'd like to talk to you about. That startled me. Um, I don't want to sound rude, but I'm sort of trying to get out of here before Ruger wakes up, I told her. He's not going to be too happy about this. He'll get over it, she said, that dry tone back in her voice. He may be a big bad biker, but he's still just a man, and men are notoriously stupid. You can't see my house from the road, and he probably won't come looking for you there anyway. I have a shotgun if he does. I also have caramel rolls. My mouth dropped. Hadn't seen that one coming. Okay, I replied, suitably impressed. Half an hour later we sat at her kitchen table, eating sweet rolls and discussing my crazy life. Somehow she managed to bring out the humor in the situation, making things seem less scary. I wanted to be Elle when I grew up, I decided, she was smart, funny, cynical, and pretty sexy for a woman pushing forty. So, you've got a bit of a problem, she said finally, the queen of understatement. You're smart to move out. I agree with you one hundred percent. Really? I asked. Because I think Mag set me up last night. She's trying to push us together. I know it. Well, there's together and there's fucking, El said, delicately slicing a cantaloupe wedge. It kind of freaks me out when you do that, I admitted. Do what? Eat melon? Orange fruits and vegetables are extremely healthy, Sophie. I giggled and shook my head. No, act all ladylike and then cuss like a sailor. My late husband was in the Navy, she said, smiling softly. And I assure you, his language would make your motorcycle club friends cry like little girls. Ruger actually reminds me of him in a way. So wild and violent— but contained, too. Do you miss him? I asked softly. Of course, she replied, her tone sharpening. You can't help but miss a man like that. But here's the thing, Sophie. I gave up everything for him. We moved every couple of years, so I had trouble making close friends. I thought about having a child, but I didn't want to raise one by myself, and I knew he'd be gone half the time. Then he went and died on me, and now I'm all alone. Sometimes I hate him for that. I didn't quite know what to say, so I took another bite of my roll. Elle sipped her tea and then sat back in her chair, looking at me very seriously. I did something very stupid when I was your age, she said. I let a man make the decisions for me. I have no idea if you and Ruger belong together, but you need space to figure things out. You can't let yourself be dependent on someone unless you can truly trust him. I trust Ruger. I said slowly. I trust him with Noah, at least. I also trust him not to change, which is sort of the problem. Men rarely do, she agreed. Although it's possible, I suppose. 
As I said before, I think I may have a solution for you. Did you know there's an apartment in my barn? Your barn? I asked blankly. I looked out the window toward the wooden structure behind the house. I didn't know you used the barn. I don't, she said. This farm belonged to my great aunt, and she had part of the barn converted to an apartment for my cousin. He was developmentally delayed. She wouldn't let them put him in a home, but he couldn't live on his own. The apartment gave him some freedom and independence, but also kept him safe. He passed two years ago, and it's been empty ever since. I'm sure it needs cleaning, but I'd like to offer it to you and Noah. Are you serious? I asked. She nodded. Of course, she said. I wouldn't have offered it otherwise. It's not being used, and I like both of you. Noah deserves a decent place to stay, and it's definitely better than crashing on someone's couch. Only one bedroom, but you don't need to live there forever. It's furnished. Just until you get back on your feet. What are you looking for in terms of rent? I asked cautiously. She thought for a moment. I was hoping you could help me with the yard work, she said. I've been having trouble keeping up with it lately. I met her eyes across the table, and neither of us said anything for a long moment. You're a very nice person, I whispered. So are you, she replied quietly. I have no idea whether things will work out between you and Ruger, but this way Noah can stay in the same school and still be within walking distance. You think it's a good idea for me to be this close to him? I asked bluntly. Good luck finding somewhere he can't follow you, she replied wryly. It hardly matters how far you go. Like I said, I have a shotgun. The barn has a good lock. Between the two, I think you'll do all right. Would you like to go and take a look? I'd love that. Me. Thanks again for watching Noah this weekend. All moved in now. Still can't believe Elle had this place just sitting here. Good luck for me. Kimber. No prob. So, have you seen him yet? Me. Who? Kimber. Don't be a dumbass. That's Ruger's job. Did he freak? Me. That's the creepy part. He didn't. Kimber. Seriously? Me. No. He texted and asked me if I was okay. I said yes. He asked where I was. Kimber. You tell him? Me. Yes. He'd figure it out anyway. Kimber. Huh. That's weird. After what happened Saturday night, that's a total turnaround. I expected him to come chase you down and drag you back. You know, like a caveman or something. Me. I know. I was expecting more, too. Makes me nervous. Kimber. Ha! You wanted him to be pissed. Me. No. Maybe. It's stupid. I have a job interview tomorrow afternoon. Receptionist at a dental clinic, right near the school. Kimber. Woot woot! Don't change the subject. Me. Hey, I need a job more than I need to talk about Ruger. Kimber. This is about me, babe. I need gossip. You owe me. I watched your kid and I got you drunk. Entertain me. Chapter 12 Sophie, I'm so sorry, but Dr. Blake is still running late. Can you stick around a little longer, or should I see if he can reschedule? I hate to pressure you, but he's really hoping to make a decision tonight, and you're the last interview. We're pretty desperate. No problem, I said, smiling brightly at the flustered hygienist behind the counter. It was a big fucking problem. Noah would be out of school in an hour, and I needed to be there to pick him up. But I also needed to be able to buy food to feed him, too. And after the first three months, this job came with health care and sick leave, not to mention dental. I hadn't had my teeth checked in four years. Are you sure? asked the hygienist. Her name was Katie Jordan, and for the past hour I'd been sitting in the waiting room, watching her juggle patients and the phone. Apparently their old receptionist left without giving notice because of a family emergency. The temp was a no-show, and the doctor's assistant had gone home at ten that morning throwing up. A mother with two kids sat next to me, obviously impatient. She'd been waiting nearly forty minutes for her appointment to start, and things were getting tense. I'll make a quick phone call. I told her. Sounds great, 
she said. Mrs. Summers, are you ready? The woman beside me stood and corralled her children, herding them into the back. I stepped outside the office, which was in a low-lying mixed medical building, kind of like a mini-mall for doctors, although classier, with fancy landscaping, cedar siding, and covered walkways. I tried L first. No answer. I tried Kimber, too. Nothing. I called the school to see if he could go to the after-school program for a day, only to learn he needed to be formally enrolled to participate, something I'd have to do in person, at the district office. That left me with the girls from the club, or Ruger, and the girls from the club weren't authorized to pick him up at the school. I could change that, of course. All I had to do was fill out some paperwork at the school office. In person. That left Ruger. I hadn't had any communication with him since Sunday morning, aside from that one text asking if I was okay. I punched his number and waited. The phone rang long enough. I thought I'd get voicemail. Shit. Then he answered. Yeah. He didn't sound particularly friendly or welcoming, more like the old Ruger, the one who looked through me like I was furniture. I suppose that's what I wanted. It didn't feel good. Um, hey, I said. I'm really sorry to do this, but I have a favor to ask. For Noah. Yeah, you always have favors to ask, he said, his voice almost a growl. Yet I still answer the damned phone when you call. Trying to figure out why. Are you working this afternoon? Yup. Any chance you could duck out long enough to pick up Noah at school? They keep moving back my job interview. If I have to leave, I'm probably going to lose my shot here. He sighed. Yeah, I can move things around here, he said. How late do you think you'll be? I paused, hating every second of this. I don't know, I finally said. At this rate, it might be toward the end of the day. I need to meet with the doctor. He had some sort of emergency earlier, and now they're running behind. He's just trying to fit me in between patients at this point. Okay, I'll take the rest of the day off. Bring him back to my place. Thanks, Ruger. It's what I do, he said, hanging up. I looked down at the phone, wondering how such a great guy could be such an asshole slut at the same time. Then I pasted my hire me, I'm friendly and competent smile back on and returned to the waiting room. By 4.30 I still hadn't done my interview. I'd pretty much given up on it because there'd been a second emergency. A high school girl knocked out half her front teeth during soccer practice. She'd been hysterical when her coach rushed her in, bloody towels pressed to her face. The other patients watched in fascinated horror as Dr. Blake himself came out to fetch her, bustling her back into the treatment room. Forty-five minutes later he reappeared. "'We're going to have to reschedule everyone,' he announced to the room, looking exhausted. "'I'm so sorry. I don't have anyone here to help you right now. We'll need to call you tomorrow.' There were several frustrated sighs, but it wasn't like people could complain, given the circumstances. Dr. Blake's eyes caught on me. He was a handsome man, although older than me, probably in his late thirties or early forties. "'Are you one of my patients?' he asked. I don't recognize you. I'm Sophie Williams, I answered, straightening the scarf I'd tied around my neck. I'm applying for the job as your receptionist. I'm guessing that interview isn't going to happen today. The phone started ringing, again. Then the door opened and a UPS delivery man came in, followed by a woman with three children. Hey, Dr. Blake, she said. We're all ready for our checkups. How are you doing? Great, the doctor replied, offering her a pained look. But we've had a little complication in the scheduling today. This is our new receptionist, Sophie. She'll take care of you. Just like that. I had a job. I felt proud of myself when I turned the car down Ruger's drive that night. I jumped right in at work, and while I didn't know how to use the scheduling program, I still managed to look up the last two patients for the afternoon and call them to cancel. I'd also handled the phone and even talked to a potential new patient. I still needed to fill out paperwork, but Dr. Blake had been thrilled. Just having an income source changed everything. The fact that it came with benefits, sick leave, and vacation? Amazing. I'd never had a job with paid vacation before. 
Of course, that good feeling ebbed as I pulled up to the house. I hadn't seen Ruger since I'd snuck out of his room three days ago. I wasn't sure what I'd expected from him, but I'd expected something. This silent acceptance of what I'd done, after what a huge deal he'd made about owning me, that made me very nervous. Making matters worse, he'd saved my ass this afternoon. Again. That meant I owed him even more than before. Just one more complication to our already twisted relationship. I knocked on the door, but nobody answered. I'd texted him around 4.30 to give him an update, and he'd replied that they'd gone fishing. So I walked around the side of the house to his deck and made myself comfortable at the table to wait. Well, as comfortable as I could, given our recent interactions. I still had my key, but using it felt wrong under the circumstances. It was a little after six already. I hoped he'd be back soon. No one needed dinner and a bath before bed. Ten minutes later I saw them walking up toward the house across the meadow from the pond. The big man and little boy looking like something out of a country living postcard. Ruger carried the fishing gear, and Noah bobbed along next to him like a puppy, holding a string of three tiny little fish. Mom! he yelled, spotting me. He took off running toward the house, and I met him at the bottom of the steps. He jumped at me, and then I was holding him as the fish slapped against my side in all their slimy glory. You, Mom, I got three fish, he told me, eyes wide with excitement. Uncle Ruger and I went to the pond, and we even got to dig up some worms, and they were really, really squirmy. Wow, that sounds like fun, I told him, wondering if I'd be able to get the fish smell out of my interview outfit. I couldn't get upset about it, though, not with him so happy. Sometimes I forgot just how much I loved my little boy, because seeing him again after a long day apart nearly made my heart explode. I have good news, too, I told him, smiling big. What? Mama got a job, I said. I'm going to be working at a dentist's office right by your school. I'll be able to drop you off every day, and then I'll pick you up from the after-school program. No more working at night. What do you think of that? That's fucking great, Mom, he said, eyes bright. Noah, do we use that word? His face fell, and he shook his head. I'm sorry, he said. Uncle Ruger told me not to say it in front of you. Ruger set the fishing gear down under the deck, and I turned to him. Noah says you told him not to curse in front of me? I asked, raising a brow. Long story, he replied, and I'm not going to get into it with you, so you can either let it go and enjoy some grilled fish with us for dinner, or get all worked up. Result will be the same. I glared at him as Noah started wiggling to get down. I let him go, and he held the string of fish up, so proud he practically glowed. Uncle Ruger and I are going to cook dinner, he declared. We're eating my fish. You can share. I glanced down at the three tiny little rainbow trout, smaller than could possibly be legal. Then I looked up at Ruger, questioning. He shrugged. I've got some salmon marinating in the fridge, he said. I'll grill it with corn. I brought Noah's favorite macaroni and cheese, I replied. Want me to cook that up while you get the grill going? Sounds great. Dinner was a little awkward, but not as bad as you'd think, under the circumstances. I'd busied myself doing the macaroni and prepping the veggies while Ruger and Noah cleaned the fish. I wouldn't have trusted Noah with a knife, but Ruger guided him carefully, explaining each step as he slit the fish open, gutted them, and then rinsed them out. We wrapped everything in foil and threw it on the grill while Noah ran off to play and I set the table. So, you got the job today? he asked leaning back against the railing, a casual eye on the food. It was almost like things hadn't blown up between us over the weekend. Okay, I could work with that. Denial had always been an excellent strategy for me. Yep, I said, it's a good one. They do full benefits after three months, and I'll have a week of vacation starting next year. Thanks again for grabbing Noah. No problem, he said, shrugging. It's not like he's hard to be around. If you can get him off the whole Skylander thing. You ever get tired of that? No, I said. I saw a spark of humor in his eyes, and I smiled back. At least we had Noah between us, I realized, no matter how fucked up everything else was. 
You've done a hell of a good job with him, Ruger said. I want you to know that. Thanks, I said, startled. What brought that on? I thought you were pissed at me. Shit, did I just say that out loud? Why did I have to go and stir things up right when we were starting to get along? He didn't jump all over me, though. Instead, he just gave me a slow smile, which was strangely worse. You'll figure it out, he said. Crap. He stepped over and rotated the corn while I studied him, suspicious. He stayed quiet, pulling out his phone and checking his messages. Yup, definitely worse. At least when we fought, I knew where we stood. On the bright side, Noah's little trout were pretty tasty. All three bites. He turned down salmon to eat SpongeBob-shaped macaroni and cheese. No huge surprise there. Ruger startled me by bringing out a bottle of sparkling cider to celebrate my new job. Noah was ecstatic, drinking half the juice by himself out of a real wine glass. I have to admit, I was touched. After dinner, we cleared the dishes while Noah took off again, with a stern warning that we'd be heading home in ten minutes. You start work tomorrow? Ruger asked as I loaded the dishwasher. Nine on the dot, I replied, feeling a little rush of excitement. It's perfect. I can't believe how things worked out. Thanks again for helping today. You have no idea how much it meant to me. I note you didn't follow up on the job at the line, he said, cocking a brow. I frowned and looked away. Um, I wasn't really serious about that anyway, I said. I don't want to work for the club. Yeah, you made your feelings about the club clear, he said. My mood deflated a little. I've got something for you. That's a loaded statement, I replied, my voice flat. He smirked, and I felt better. It wasn't an angry smirk. Dirty mind, Soph, he asked. Seriously, this is important. Come on into the living room. I followed him, then sat in a chair. He sat on the couch, then patted the seat next to him. I shook my head. He held up a thick, business-sized envelope. You don't get your surprise if you don't come over here. What makes you think I'll want it? Oh, you'll want it, he said, clearly pleased with himself. I got up and walked over to him slowly. He grabbed my hand, pulling me down and across his lap. I gave a token struggle, but he handed me the envelope and curiosity took over, so I let him win. Also, it felt kind of nice to sit on his lap. Yeah, I know, stupid, but I'm only human. I opened the envelope and saw cash— a very large wad of cash. My eyes opened wide and I pulled it out, shocked. I didn't count it, but it seemed to be all hundred-dollar bills. There had to be three or four thousand dollars in here. What the hell is this? I asked, looking at him. He gave me a grim smile. Child support. Holy shit, I gasped. How did you get this out of Zack? It's from Mom's estate, Ruger said. I paid him out, and then he paid you out. In exchange, he gets to keep living. Everybody wins. I turned to look at him, shocked. Are you serious? I asked. Our faces were about two inches apart, and his eyes flicked to my lips. I licked them nervously and felt something stir under my butt. His arms came around my waist, holding me loosely, and my nipples hardened. Damn it. Pretty hard to get more serious he told me. Old friend tracked down Zack for me in North Dakota, and I rode over there Sunday afternoon, got back early this morning. We had words. Then we went to the bank. I didn't give him the promise to let him live in writing. That's just a little side incentive. I'll revoke it if he ever gets within ten miles of you or Noah again. Mom would have wanted this anyway. She never stopped loving him, but she sure as shit stopped trusting him. I swallowed. I wasn't sure I wanted to know the details, but I couldn't feel sorry for Zack. He'd earned everything he got, and then some. How much money is in here? I asked, flipping through the wad of cash. Not all of it, he said. That's just last year's. The rest is in transit. Dealing with that much cash gets complicated. Needs to be cleaned up a bit, and then we'll find a way to get it to you that won't leave an ugly trail. The trade-off is, we agreed on your current monthly rate, and it's not like you can take him to court to ask for more if he gets a great job or something. I couldn't even get him to pay what he owed already, 
I said. Health and welfare won't do shit either. I don't think upward adjustments were on the table. Sort of what I figured, he replied. So I'm real glad you got a job, but you won't be living paycheck to paycheck anymore. That's amazing, I whispered, looking back down at the envelope. I have to ask, is it going to come back on me and Noah? Am I going to get arrested? You're good, he said. That's not enough cash to catch any IRS attention, and Horace is working on getting the rest of it to you all safe and legal. He's a damned good accountant, and he'll work with our lawyer. Fucking shark. If Zack ever tries to cause trouble about it, you call me and I'll make him go away. His arms tightened around me, hinting at his strength, and I shivered. This is another case of you doing my dirty work for me, isn't it? I asked softly. It's Noah's money, Ruger said, his face serious. This isn't about you, Sophie. It's about Zack taking care of his son. And it's not like it even came out of his pocket. That insurance settlement came out of nowhere. Noah has a right to this money, and my mom would shit if she knew Zack was starving you guys out. I fixed the problem. Don't think about it anymore. Just use the money to take care of our boy, okay? I nodded my head, leaning my head against his chest. He kissed the top of my head and rubbed up and down my back. So, horse is an accountant? I asked after a minute. I find that hard to picture. I'd just as soon you not picture horse at all, he muttered, and I smiled. Thank you, I whispered. I'd never seen that much money in my life. Hell, at this rate, we'd have the fancy macaroni and cheese all the time. And the rest? If I saved it, I'd be able to pay for Noah's college. My kid would go to college. I felt tears well up in my eyes, which bugged me because I hated crying. If you really want to thank me, give me a blowjob, Ruger said, his voice light. I straightened up and smacked his shoulder, and he burst out laughing. Why do you have to say things like that? You were getting all soft and sweet, he said, and when you get like that, I really want to fuck you. But Noah's right outside, and this is shit timing. Riling you up takes care of that soft and sweet crap. You're impossible, I told him, trying to get up. He held me down, though, and riling me up clearly wasn't making him less interested in sex. The evidence under my ass was getting harder by the second. How about this? he said. One kiss. Give me one kiss and we'll call it even. No, I told him. You're up to something. You can't let me win, can you? Ruger grinned at me. Yeah, you're right, he said. I'm up to something. And I'm never going to let you win so you might as well give up now. With that, his lips came down over mine in another of those kisses that destroyed my ability to think. He explored my mouth softly, and I explored right back, wishing like hell that Noah was with a babysitter. Heroin! The man was pure heroin! Heroin kills people, my brain screamed. My body flipped off my brain and kept kissing Ruger. Finally, he let my lips go and pulled back, smiling and looking smug as hell. Like I said, might as well give up, Soph, he said. Sooner or later I'm going to win this little game of ours. I sat up slowly, shaking my head. How did he do that to me? I wanted him so bad I couldn't see straight, and he turned it off, just like that. Noah ran up across the deck and looked at us through the window, pressing his mouth wide open against it and making a blowfish face. Then he started laughing wildly and ran off again. Okay, that turned it off. You want to keep your own place for a while, Ruger said, touching my cheek softly. I'll try to understand that. It's all happening fast and that's scary. But you're still mine, Soph. Don't think for one minute I've forgotten that or changed my mind. You planning to keep your dick in your pants at the club? I asked bluntly. I'm not planning not to keep it in my pants, he said slowly. But I've told you, I'm not a one-woman man. I won't lie to you or make promises I'm not sure I can keep. And there we have it, I replied, shaking my head. Fuck off, Ruger. I'm going home. Ruger. What time do you get off work? Me. Five. Why? Ruger. 
Want to come over and check your place out for security? Me. No. Ruger. You haven't figured this out yet? I'm going to do it. Rather do it when it's convenient for you, but happens either way. What time? I'll bring pizza. Me. We get home around six. Noah likes his pizza plain. Ruger. Plain? Like nothing? Me. Plain. Be happy. Used to be he wouldn't let them put sauce on it. Ruger. Plain it is. See you at six. Me. He's invading my space. Kimber. What? Me. Ruger. He's invading my space. Coming over tonight to check out security on new place. Bribing us with pizza. Kimber. Control freak much? What security? Me. He likes my apartments to have alarms. Checks for bad windows and locks. Deadbolts. That kind of thing. Kimber. That's sweet, though. He wants you safe. Me. He's the biggest danger. Kimber. Be happy. You have a hot guy coming over and he's bringing dinner. Women have killed for less. Me. Whose side you on? Kimber. Mine. Haven't you figured this out yet? Me. Bitch. Kimber. Ho. Me. At least I don't drive a minivan. Kimber. See if I make you margaritas again. Low blow. Me. Heart. You don't have to spend a lot of money to keep a place safe, Ruger told Noah, his voice serious. They crouched together as Ruger installed a new deadbolt on our exterior door. We had two, one leading outside and the other leading into the rest of the barn, which was pretty cool in its own right. Among other things, it had a loft complete with mounds of old hay for Noah to jump in. Even better, there were stairs leading up to it and a railing. Safety features I assumed they put in for El's cousin. If you have empty pop cans, you can make an alarm by stacking them in front of your door, Ruger said. The goal is to make noise so that you know if someone tries to come in. Most bad guys will run away if there's noise. That's why I put those little alarms on the windows. If you ever see a bad guy, don't be quiet. Start screaming. And don't yell help. Yell, call the cops. As loud as you can, okay? You're going to scare him, I said from the couch, debating whether I should eat the last slice of pizza. Between Ruger and Noah, it had disappeared pretty fast. You scared Noah, Ruger asked. Nope, Noah said. Ruger's smart. He's teaching me all kinds of safety stuff. He says you need to stop texting on your phone when you walk places, Mom, and pay attention to the people around you. He also says there's this little stick you need to start carrying around. It's called a kubertron. Kubaton, Ruger corrected, looking over at me. It's a little baton for your keychain. Very effective, very safe. You should come take the self-defense class at the shop, Sophie. I don't need a self-defense class, I said, rolling my eyes. I have my own personal stalker to protect me already. It's almost Noah's bedtime. You planning to go home at some point? After I finish up, he said. Bath time, kiddo. Noah did the obligatory whining and begging to stay up, but his heart wasn't in it. Bath went fast, with Ruger finishing the lock just as Noah got out. Will you do my story tonight? he asked Ruger. Sure thing, little man, Ruger said. What are we reading? Magic Treehouse, Noah replied. I can read it by myself, but I like it when you do it. I picked up the small living room as Ruger read to Noah. We had a futon for a couch, which was where I slept. Normally, I'd start setting it up by now, but I didn't want to give Ruger ideas. After half an hour, he came back out, closing Noah's door behind him softly. Kid's out, he said. Fell asleep halfway through the chapter. I think he's doing great, but he's been through a lot lately. Thanks for your help, I said awkwardly. Here's your new keys he said, tossing them toward me. I replaced all the locks, so you'll need to give a set to Elle. Her old ones won't work. Um, that's great, I said. Can I have Noah for a while on Friday afternoon? he asked. I'm heading out on a run this weekend. Might not be back for four or five days. Sure, I said. I need him by seven, though. Sounds good, he said. He crossed his arms and leaned against the wall casually. So... 
How long are we going to do this? Do what? He raised a hand and gestured around the little apartment. Have you and Noah live here when you could be over at my house? This is nice, I protested. It's clean, it's safe, and I don't need to worry about the landlord attacking me in the night. It's not happening between us, Ruger. Not happening. He didn't respond, and I watched him warily. He was up to something. I could smell it. Suddenly he pushed off from the wall and walked over, catching me around the waist. Then he threw me over his shoulder, just like he'd done that weekend. No! I yelled. You don't get to haul me off whenever you don't get your way. He smacked my ass. Shut up, he said. You'll wake up Noah. If he comes out here, he'll see you like this, and then you can figure out how to explain it to him. If he asks me, I'll tell him the truth. Mommy's been a bad girl, and she needs a spanking. You asshole, I hissed, kicking and smacking his back as hard as I could. Maybe I should take one of those coob thingy classes. I could have shoved it up his big dumb ass as he carried me out of the apartment and into the barn. Ruger ignored my struggles, which pissed me off even more. He carried me through the barn and up the stairs to the hayloft. I sensed a pattern. At least there wasn't a bathroom up here, so no cold water spray. Small comfort. He dropped me down on a pile of straw so hard I lost my breath, looming tall as he unbuckled his belt and ripped it through the loops on his jeans. Then he folded it between his hands and snapped it. I glared at him, scuttling backward across the hay like a crab. I need to tie you up again, he asked. We aren't doing this, I declared, even though my brain had already started the familiar shutdown his presence seemed to cause. God, I loved how he smelled, not to mention the feel of his cock deep down inside. Those little metal knobs made a hell of a difference. Go to hell, Ruger. Fuck no. We are definitely doing this, he said. Maybe I can fuck some sense into you. Words obviously don't work. With that, he pulled off his shirt and tossed it aside. I glared at him as he opened his fly and pulled off his jeans without another word. He knelt forward in the hay and caught my hands, pinning them on either side of my head. His head lowered as he scented me, kissing the fading bruises on my neck, nibbling and sucking like he'd done at the party. Damn distracting. Shit, that felt good. They're fading, he said pulling away just enough to meet my eyes. I didn't like his expression. Not at all. Maybe I'll give you some new ones. What do you think? I think you're a raging asshole. Ruger laughed. Yeah, well, I think you're a bitch, but my cock likes you, so we'll figure something out. He caught my mouth again, but this time the kiss wasn't hard and brutal. Nope, he changed tactics because now his lips whispered over mine, nipping and sucking, drawing them apart gently as I tried to ignore him. Then he tugged my hands together over my head, freeing a hand to slide down between us. His fingers drifted across my stomach before reaching the top of the yoga pants I'd put on when I got home. He started pulling them down, and I realized this was it. Ruger was about to win again, because Ruger always won, and I always let him because my body wanted him more than my brain hated him. I raised my hips, making it easier for him to take off my pants, which was just another nail in my fucking coffin. Then his fingers slid into me, and I shuddered. The damage was done already anyway, I justified. What difference would it really make? When he finally stopped kissing me, we stared at each other, panting. His fingers stroked down below, grazing my clit, and I twisted, wanting more. Jesus, you piss me off, he murmured. Good thing your cunt's so fucking hot. Don't call it that. His lip twitched. Good thing your vagina's so gosh darned hot, he whispered, because I really, really want to stick my penis in it and have repeated sexual intercourse bringing us to a mutually satisfactory culmination of our desires. How's that sound? Almost dirtier, I said, mouth quirking. Fucking ridiculous. All of it. I wanted to kill him and screw him and scream at him, so now he made jokes? I almost laughed, but his fingers rubbed right up against my G-spot while his thumb played with my clit. I couldn't figure out how he made me so wet so fast every single time. 
Oh, it's dirtier, he told me, nuzzling me again, tugging on my ear with his teeth. If I let go of your hands, are you going to try to get away? I considered the question seriously. No, I admitted, but this is a one-time deal. We're never having sex again after this time. Ruger gave me that lazy panther smile of his and didn't answer. He did let me go, though, and I reached up, pushing him over and back down into the hay. Then I straddled him. I had one shot at this, I realized, one last chance to play with Ruger's body. What should I do with it? I went for his nipple ring, sucking it deep into my mouth as he groaned, hands twisting into my hair. That's good, Soph, he whispered. But could you grab my dick while you're at it? All I can think about. It's fucking killing me. I reached down and found him, hard steel bound in silk. I trailed my fingers over the head of his cock, catching the barbell, brushing back and forth. Holy fuck, he groaned. Too much, babe. Just a shaft for now. Okay? His hand covered mine, showing me exactly how he wanted it. Slow and deep, with a bit of a twist that should have been painful. I remembered he liked it rough so I didn't hold back, and soon his hips arched under me. That's when I gave his nipple a final flick and started working my mouth down his stomach. Ruger wasn't like some guy in a magazine ad. He had a model's perfect abs, but he also had just enough hair to remind me I was dealing with a real man, not some prefabbed fantasy of clean, waxed sexuality. I rubbed my chin against the dip of his navel, savoring the power I held over him before going lower. Some girls love giving head. I've never been one of them, so I didn't have a lot of experience to work with. What I did have was a hell of an imagination, and I'd been thinking about taking his cock into my mouth since that first night on his deck. I remembered sitting there, seeing him outlined in front of me through the thin flannel of his lounge pants, wanting to touch him more than anything. Now I could. Ruger tilted his head up, one arm folded back and under his neck watching with hooded eyes as I rubbed the head gently against my cheek, considering my next move. I reached out my tongue and flicked the notch at the bottom of his glands. Then I swirled it around the little metal knob. Ruger's breath hissed, and I felt a surge of pure, feminine power. I liked it again, playing with his piercing before sucking him in hard. The metal post was weird, but it wasn't like I planned to deep-throat him, so it didn't matter. I started bobbing my head up, working him with my hand at the same time. His fingers burrowed deep into my hair, guiding me. You're killing me, Soph, he muttered, groaning. Stop. I'm gonna come if you don't stop. I liked that idea. For once it would be nice to see Jesse Ruger Gray lose control. But just when I decided to make it happen, his fingers tightened in my hair, dragging my mouth away from his cock. Ride me he ordered. Oh, I could work with that. I climbed over him, reaching down to guide him into my body. Even though I was probably wetter than I'd ever been in my life, taking his full length went slowly. From this angle, I felt every inch of him, stretching me so wide it almost hurt. I stopped several times to let myself adjust, his eyes boring into me the whole while. When I finally had all of him, I stilled. Catching my breath? Ruger still watched me, his face full of need and intensity and desire. He leaned up on one elbow, the flex of his stomach muscles almost painful against my oversensitized clit. He reached out and caught a strand of my hair, tucking it behind my ear, and then cupped my cheek, his face almost tender. I closed my eyes. Angry Ruger, fine. Horny Ruger? I'd gotten used to that, too. But Ruger as a gentle lover? I didn't have room for that in my head, not if I wanted to survive and move forward with my life. I started rocking back and forth on him, the movement ever so slight but almost painfully pleasurable. His hand dropped from my face to my hip, urging me to go faster, so I did. It didn't take long to bring him back to the edge. At some point I leaned forward on his chest for leverage, digging my nails into his pecs, which seemed to turn him on even more. Ruger liked a touch of pain, I decided, so I did my best to crush him with my inner muscles. I'm generous that way. 
I was close to coming myself when he lost patience, rolling me over and taking control again. He grabbed my legs, shoving them up and over his shoulders. Then he pounded me hard until I screamed out my orgasm. Ruger followed right behind, and when he came, he called out my name. I fell asleep with him wrapped around me, both of us on our sides, one of his hands resting lightly against my stomach. He'd gone downstairs and grabbed a blanket, covering the hay and creating a nest for us. At some point I woke to find Ruger's hand between my legs, slowly stroking me as I drifted. He rolled me to my stomach, spread my legs, and slid into my body gently and carefully. I sighed, the delicious pressure building and exploding with a subtlety I'd never experienced before. Then he wrapped himself around me again and I drifted back into sleep. I woke up when my cell rang at six the next morning, finding myself alone on my futon, surrounded by his smell. I didn't recognize the name and the caller hung up. Fucking wrong number. I rolled to my side and saw the empty pizza box, still sitting on the coffee table. Damn, what the hell was I supposed to do with a situation like this? Insane. All of it. Chapter 13 God, I love dancing, Kimber said, sucking on a cigarette. It was just shy of midnight on Friday, and we stood on the sidewalk outside a club in downtown Spokane. I had a nice buzz going. My feet are going to hurt so bad, but totally worth it, I agreed, swaying a little. I felt my cheeks flush, which was funny, so I started laughing. Kimber shook her head at me. I can't take you anywhere, she said gravely. Lightweight. Where the hell did Em go? I want to check out this guy of hers. I thought the deal was we'd look him over and decide whether he's worth her time. She's cheating. No shit. Bitch. I hate her. Yeah, me too, Kimber replied, stabbing the air with her smoke for emphasis. How am I supposed to live the single life vicariously if I don't get any details? I shook my head and shrugged mournfully. I'm doing my part. I tell you everything. And don't think I don't appreciate it, she said, tearing up slightly. We gave each other a drunken hug. We'd hit the first bar around ten, and by ten-thirty, Em had disappeared to meet her online hottie, Liam. She was supposed to bring him inside to meet us, but they snuck off to a bar down the street instead. I would have suspected kidnapping and murder by eleven-thirty, when we moved on to the next club, but she'd been sending us regular text messages that made it clear she was enjoying her evening. Long story short, Liam was gorgeous. We'd get to meet him in a while, she was definitely going to sleep with him, and she was pretty sure he could handle her dad. Apparently Liam was M's perfect man. She promised not to leave the other bar without us, so we called it good. Hopefully they're in some corner booth making out, I said glumly. Not too much. Kimber said darkly. If she fucks him before I give my approval, she's losing her margarita privileges. Talking about making out reminded me of Ruger, and thinking of Ruger made me want to drink more. I still couldn't believe I'd fucked him. Again. I couldn't shake the man. Thank God we didn't need to be back in Coeur d'Alene until noon, because I had a lot more alcohol to drink. Kimber's husband was definitely taking one for the team tonight, watching both kids. I needed to bake him cookies or something. Is it creepy that I want to bake for your husband? I asked her. She burst out laughing and I started laughing too, and then my phone buzzed. M. I want to go back to the hotel. He's definitely the one. I read it in squeed, handing the phone over to Kimber. She started thumb-typing furiously. Kimber, don't you dare. We have to check him out first. You are not following the plan. M. You'll meet him in a minute. Come down to Mix and we can head from there. We'll wait outside. I yanked my phone back and glared at Kimber. That's mine. I get to yell at her first. We can't yell at her in front of Internet Hottie, she told me. That's a cock block. We'll yell at her tomorrow. I considered this. Okay, I said, but I still call dibs on first yelling, once we ditch his ass. She sighed and rolled her eyes. Whatever. 
We didn't see them outside mix. It was a tiny hole in the wall place we almost missed because it was next to a good-sized club with a long line. I texted M and got no response. She's probably just peeing or something, Kimber said, eyeing a group of collegey-looking guys standing in a clump on the sidewalk. They eyed her back and she smiled. Hey, I hissed. Married, remember? She laughed. I'm just looking. Don't be so uptight. I promise not to touch, okay? My phone buzzed. M. Heading out. We stood on the sidewalk for another five minutes. Nothing. I started getting a little nervous. I texted again. No reply. Another ten minutes passed and I'd had enough. This didn't feel right. I'm going to go check on her, I told Kimber. She'd lost interest in the college boys when they'd come over and tried to pick us up. They'd been pretty to look at, but not exactly brilliant conversationalists. She nodded, concern on her face. I'll wait out here, she said, looking up and down the street, just in case they show up. I don't want you outside by yourself, I replied. She jerked her chin toward the bouncer at the club next door. I'll be fine, she said. Anything happens, I'll scream for him. Go find our girl. All right, I said, my voice grim. But when I find her, we're kicking her ass. This isn't cool. The place was small and dark, just a tiny, narrow little bar, way rougher than I expected. No wonder the college boys stayed outside. The men in here would crumple them up and throw them away like used, um, something. Straw wrappers? No, something worse. I shook my head, foggy from the booze. Focus. There were more men than women, and most kept their eyes on their drinks. My quickly sinking opinion of Liam went down another notch. What kind of guy took a girl to a place like this? We shouldn't have let M out of our sight, I realized. I didn't find her in the main bar, so I wandered to the back, where a long hallway led past some grotty-looking bathrooms and an office. It ended with a fire door that had been propped open with a brick. I texted Kimber. Me. Any sign of them? Kimber. No, this is bullshit. Me. Not in bar. I'll look in the alley, then come back. I stepped up to the fire door cautiously. Would M really go out there with a guy she didn't know? Except she probably felt like she did know him. They'd been calling each other for a while now. Hell, I'd gone on dates with guys I'd only met a few times. Still, I pushed the door open and peeked outside to find a tall, dark-haired man in faded jeans and motorcycle boots leaning against the side of a battered cargo van. He smiled at me like a shark and winked. Oh, my God! I recognized him. It was one of the guys from that other club, the Devil's Jacks, the ones who'd come to my apartment in Seattle. Hunter! What was he doing here? Holy shit, coincidence? Or were Hunter and Liam the same person? I opened my mouth to scream when someone shoved me from behind, knocking me out into the alley. I stumbled and nearly fell. Then Hunter's arms caught me, swooping me up and carrying me toward the back of the van. I shrieked as loud as I could, kicking and fighting as he tossed me in but the pounding music from the club next door almost guaranteed nobody heard me. M lay on the floor, arms cuffed behind her back, a bandana gagging her mouth. Her legs were tied tight with what looked like white clothesline. Hunter climbed in after me, wrestling me down and wrenching away my phone. Within seconds my own mouth was gagged, and he'd closed another set of cuffs around my wrists. I lay face down on the floor, eyes wide and staring at M., who stared right back at me. I felt someone else climb in and heard a door slam, and the engine roared to life. Hunter spoke, his voice cool and detached. Sorry, girls. Hopefully this won't get too ugly, and you'll get to go home soon. The van started moving. Ruger. His beer had gotten warm. For once, there wasn't a party at the clubhouse, or a barbecue, or anything happening, which was a fucking shame because all he could think about was Sophie out dancing in Spokane with her slut of a best friend. He should be focusing on his trip to Portland tomorrow, 
but he really couldn't bring himself to give a damn. Jesus, he'd nearly shit his pants when he realized who she was going out with tonight. Kimber's stage name had been Stormy, and the bitch was famous for having a mouth like a vacuum. Even he'd taken her home one night. It'd been okay, but not worth breaking his no-repeats rule. Now we wondered if she'd been filling Sophie's head with stories about him all along. Also explained why she'd been interested in working at the line. Kimber had made a goddamn fortune there, one of their most popular dancers. She'd been an even bigger hit in the VIP rooms. He'd considered simply physically stopping Sophie from going, but figured that would do him more harm than good in the long run. She'd been dodging him since their night in the hayloft, and he'd let it go. The first week of a new job was stressful, so he'd given her a break. This ladies' night thing had caught him off guard. He'd only found out because Noah had a big mouth. Kid was full of all kinds of useful information. Picnic walked into the main lounge with a girl trailing him. She looked about sixteen, although Ruger knew she had to be older. No jailbait in the armory. That was trouble they sure as fuck didn't need. Pick wore the look of a man who'd gotten well laid, and he sent her on her way with a smack on the ass. Then he walked over to Ruger. "'What's with you?' he asked, dropping into one of the mismatched chairs across from the couch. "'I'm bored,' Ruger said, rubbing the back of his neck. "'And apparently I'm getting old because my neck hurts from sitting at my bench today, taking care of that special order.' "'You're fucking pathetic,' Pick said. "'That's the truth.' I hear your girl moved out. Yeah, we can talk about something else now. Picnic laughed shortly. First horse and now you, he said. Whole damned place is turning up pussy-whipped. Fuck off, asshole, Ruger replied. The only reason I'm sitting here right now instead of fucking her face is I'm not willing to hand her my cock on a leash. And you should talk, screwing kids younger than your daughter. Creeps me out thinking of your old ass doing a chick like that. At least I got laid tonight, Pick answered mildly, unlike some. His phone rang. He pulled it out and looked at the ID. It's M, he said shortly, standing and ambling across the room. Then Pick froze, his body language screaming tension. Thirty seconds later, Ruger's phone rang. Sophie. You better not be, he started, but she cut him off. Shut up and listen, she said, her voice tight. Ruger sat up. Those guys you met in Seattle? The Devil's Jacks? They've got me and M. We're in Spokane and they... He heard her scream as someone grabbed the phone. Adrenaline slammed through him, taking him from relaxed to ready for action in a heartbeat. Instead of acting on it, he forced himself to stay calm and listen with everything he had. They'd need every clue they could to find Sophie. And M? What the fuck? Jesus, M should know better than to go out without giving Pick a heads up. How had M gotten mixed up in this? Ruger, a man said. This is Skid, from Seattle. We got a bit of a problem. You're dead, Ruger replied, his voice flat, and he meant it. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Picnic grab a bar stool and smash it against the wall. Horse was on his feet, pushing a trio of girls out the door as Painter grabbed a sawed-off shotgun from behind the bar. Slide wandered in from the bathroom and glanced around. Brows rising. Yeah, we'll talk about my death later, Skid said, sounding bored. Listen up, your boy in Portland, Toke, he went ape shit on two of our brothers a couple hours ago. Just broke into the damned house and started shooting. There's cops everywhere. A couple of bitches who saw it all go down. Total clusterfuck. Girls are talking to the cops, too, just to make things perfect. Docs are working on one guy right now. No idea if he'll make it. Toke dragged the other off. You're full of shit, Ruger said. Toke might be a wild card, but he wouldn't ignore a vote by the full club. Process later, Skid snapped. It's time for you to get your boy under control and our man back to us. Safe. Until then, we'll take good care of... What's her name again? Sophie? We'll take good care of sweet little Sophie for you. She'll be just fine once we clear this up. Our boy goes down. Her prospects don't look so good. Got a real nice ass. Might tap it before I shoot her. Got me. He hung up. Fuck! Ruger muttered, kicking over the coffee table as he stood up. Pick yelled as horse and Bam Bam held him back. Ruger ignored the drama, striding down the hall past the office and into the large workshop where he did his special projects. 
He flipped open his laptop and pulled up the tracker, narrowing his search. There they were. Sophie's and M's phones were near the river, downtown Spokane. They'd be in the water soon. By the time he could get there, the jacks would be in the wind, along with their girls. God damn it. Ruger turned and punched the wall, smashing through the sheetrock. Sharp pain hit, helping him focus. He pulled an unregistered thirty-eight semi-automatic out of his bench drawer and shoved it into his ankle holster, then grabbed extra clips. Then he turned and went back down the hall to find Picnic and the others arguing over what they should do. Pick wanted to ride now. Horse, Bam Bam, and Duck all wanted to take the time to make a plan, which Ruger knew needed to happen. Couldn't do shit in Spokane until they had more info. Toke had lost the vote, but he'd won the battle. The Reapers and the Devil's Jacks were going to war. Sophie. I don't know how long we rode in the back of the van. It felt like forever. Then I heard the sound of a garage door opening. We pulled in and it shut behind us. Hunter and the driver stepped out of the van, coming around to open the back doors. Hard hands, not Hunter's, grabbed my ankles, pulling me out roughly. My cheeks scraped, and if the kidnapping hadn't fully sobered me, the pain finished the trick. He half-carried, half-dragged me into the house. Then he dropped me down on the couch, and I struggled to sit up. Hunter set M down next to me, far more gently. He stepped back and joined his friend. Guy number two was Skid, the other devil's jack I'd met in Seattle. They stood over us, faces grim, and I knew we were well and truly fucked. My stomach twisted and I thought about Noah. Would I ever see him again? Here's the situation, Hunter said, his cold gray eyes flicking back and forth between us. Could he actually be M's internet guy? She hadn't been lying. He really was hot. Even better looking than I remembered. Too bad he was a goddamn sociopath. Or maybe he'd done something to Liam. For all I knew, M's online boyfriend was lying dead in the alley. Shit. You're here as leverage. One of the Reapers down in Portland, Toke, made a real bad call tonight. He went to our house and started shooting. No warning, no provocation. He took a hostage when he left. One of our brothers is down, and the second is probably getting tortured to death right now, so you'll have to excuse us for being a little abrupt about this whole thing. Your daddy, he nodded toward M, is going to do what it takes to get our guy back for us. That happens, you go home. She glared at him, eyes full of betrayal. He leaned forward and pulled off her gag, whispering something in her ear. M jerked away from him. You're dead, Liam, she said, her voice utterly serious. So that was one mystery solved. Poor M, my heart hurt for her. My dad is going to kill you, she continued. Let us go now and I'll try to talk him out of it. Otherwise it'll be too late. I'm serious. He will kill you. Hunter shook his head. Sorry, babe, he replied. I get that you're scared and pissed, but I'm not going to let a brother die just because some reaper had a tantrum. Fuck you. He glanced at Skid, who shrugged. Hunter sighed, rubbing a hand over his face, looking tired. Okay, let's go upstairs, he said. He glanced at me. We'll take your gag off, but either of you start screaming. We'll just have to put them back on. We're in the middle of nowhere, so it's not like you're going to get anywhere if you do. You two control how ugly this gets. Got me? With that, he pulled out a Leatherman multi-tool and cut the rope on M's feet. Then he started on mine. I heard a clicking noise and looked up to find Skid pointing a small square pistol at us. You cause trouble, I'll shoot you, he said. Hunter's nice. I'm not. I swallowed. Hunter pulled me to my feet and I rocked nervously, trying to get circulation back. It was hard to balance with my hands cuffed behind my back. He helped M up and then they marched us up the flight of stairs off to one side of the living room. The house's second story was pretty typical, with a small landing at the top. It looked like there were three bedrooms, along with the bathroom, reminding me that I needed to pee in a big way. Hunter took M's arm and pulled her into a room on the right, kicking the door shut behind them. Over there, Skid said, pointing to the door next to it. 
I walked in to find a queen-sized bed with a very plain wrought iron frame, a battered dresser, and an old desk. There was a small window which looked like it had been painted shut. I wondered how hard it would be to get it open. If I did, could I manage a drop back down to the ground? Stand next to the bed, facing away from me, Skid said. Oh, shit. The bed took on a whole new meaning. I did what he said, my body bracing for the worst. Was Skid about to rape me? Would Hunter rape M? He'd obviously been cultivating some sort of relationship with her. Was it all about the club, or was there something more? M was a very pretty girl, a girl who deserved better. I trembled as Skid came up behind me, feeling the heat of his body and hoping to hell I wasn't his type. I felt his hands touch mine. Then he popped open one of the cuffs. Lie down, he said, his voice unreadable. Should I fight him, or just close my eyes and take it? I wanted to live a lot more than I wanted to fight. I'd let him do it, and just hope it ended fast. I laid down on my back, focusing on the ceiling, blinking rapidly. Put your hands up over your head. I raised my arms as he leaned over me. He paused, looking me over, and I saw his eyes catch on the swell of my breasts. I bit the side of my cheek, trying not to break down and start begging. I didn't want to give him that power over me. He reached down, catching my hands, and I felt a tug on the cuffs as he threaded the chain through the wrought iron. Then he snapped the second cuff back on me. Skid stood back up and walked over to the window, looking outside, crossing his arms. My breath caught. Was that it? Was I safe for now? He glanced back toward me, thoughtful. The guy Tok took is my brother, he said. Not just my club brother, my half-brother. Only family I have. Believe me when I tell you I'll do anything to get him back. Don't think being a woman protects you. Nothing will protect you. Got me? I nodded. Good girl, he said. Keep it up and maybe you'll live. He turned and walked out. I lay there forever, needing to pee so bad it hurt. I supposed I should have asked Skid to take me to the bathroom before he locked me down. Sooner or later I'd wet the bed. I didn't care. I'd rather piss myself than call for Skid to come back and help me. Then I heard a scream and the sound of something shattering against the wall my room shared with M's. I forgot all about my bathroom situation. You cocksucking bastard! M shrieked. I held my breath as I heard another thump. Oh, God, was she fighting with him? Was he raping her? Her voice was full of pain and I felt sick to my stomach, because whatever was going on over there wasn't good. The noise died down. I lay in the dark, counting the seconds. How had something this crazy happen to someone as normal and boring as me? Goddamn Reapers! Ruger's stupid fucking club! First M got stabbed, and now we'd been kidnapped. It was like some horrible virus, creeping in and destroying everything it touched without warning. If I got out of this alive, I was never touching Ruger again. I couldn't be with a Reaper, no matter how much I wanted him. I couldn't allow this to be a part of my life. It couldn't be part of Noah's life, either. If Ruger wanted to see my son, he'd damned well leave the club out of it. As for me, I was done with him, well and truly done. I knew it in my gut and in my bones. Any man whose reality included women getting kidnapped wasn't good enough for me. He wasn't right, no matter how he made me feel. Period. I closed my eyes tight as M screamed again. I woke with a start as the bed dipped. Where was I? I heard Em's voice and it all came back. You okay? she asked. I opened my eyes to find her sitting next to me. I studied her, looking for signs of abuse or crying. She didn't look like a rape victim, though. She looked pissed as hell. If anything, she was prettier than usual, her cheeks full of color and her hair wild and free. Early morning light filtered in through the window. Hunter stood in the door, eyeing both of us, face unreadable. I couldn't believe I'd actually fallen asleep. I need the bathroom, I said, my voice hoarse. God, I felt hungover. Can she go to the fucking bathroom? Em asked Hunter, her voice cold. 
Yeah, he said, walking toward me. She stood and moved out of his way, putting as much distance between them as possible. I tried not to flinch as he unlocked me, rolling away as quickly as I could despite my aching muscles. Come on, Hunter said. Both of you. M took my hand and we walked out of the room together, her fingers squeezing mine. I wanted to ask if she was all right, find out what had happened. No way I was going to talk in front of him, though. We turned into the small bathroom, which didn't have a window. M shut the door behind us, pausing long enough in the doorway to glare at Hunter in some kind of silent battle. Then the door shut. I rushed over to the toilet, incredibly relieved. Oh, my God, I whispered, looking over at her. She ran her hands through her hair, then crossed her arms and rubbed up and down. How are you? Did he hurt you? My pride, definitely, she said, eyes snapping. Not physically. I can't believe this. Seriously, I can't believe how stupid I was. I actually invited him to come and meet me. I made it so easy. Idiot. I didn't reply, washing my hands as we swapped places, then cupping them to take a drink. My mouth was all cottony. Do you have any idea what's going to happen to us? I asked. Skid scares the crap out of me. Did he hurt you? She asked, her voice sharp. No. That's good. This is a pretty fucked up situation, she said. Toke, he's the one who cut me at the party. He's gone off his rocker. This shooting thing makes no sense to me at all, but if it really happened, we're screwed. Nobody knows where Toke is, not even Deke, and he's Toke's president. They've all been looking for him since the party. Cutting me was not okay, and Dad wants to make sure he pays for it. Shit, I muttered. So your dad couldn't give them this Toke guy even if he wanted to? I don't think so, she said slowly. I mean, he's really protective of me. When Toke hurt me like that, Dad lost it. If Dad could find him, he'd be found already. We're pretty fucked here, Sophie. Do you think they'll hurt us? She considered the question. Liam won't, she replied. I mean, he won't hurt me. I don't think he'll hurt you either. I cocked my head at her. You do realize he was lying to you all along, right? Just because you liked him doesn't mean you can trust him, Em. Oh, I know that, she said quickly, then shook her head ruefully. Believe me, I'm well aware that I'm the fuckwit who got us into this. You're not a fuckwit, I said forcefully. He's a liar, and he's good at it. Not your fault that he targeted you. It was the Reaper's fault, but I figured rubbing it in wouldn't be particularly helpful. Doesn't matter, she said. But I'm serious. I really don't think he'll hurt me. I'm more worried about Skid. It's his brother they've got, I told her, his real brother. I think he wanted to hurt me. You guys okay in there? Hunter called through the door. We're fine. M snapped, startling me. Give us a fucking minute, asshole. My eyes went wide. That was pretty bitchy, I hissed. Do you think that's smart? Maybe I'm reading the situation wrong here, but don't we want him in a good mood? She snorted sarcastically. Fuck that, she replied. I'm a reaper, and I'll be damned if I'll suck up to some devil's jack dickwad. Well, I'm not a reaper, I said quietly. And I'd just as soon not die here and leave Noah an orphan, so don't piss him off. She looked chastened. Sorry, I guess I have my dad's temper. Too bad you don't have your dad's gun. No shit, right? And I'm the good girl in the family. You should see my sister. You have one minute, Hunter called through the door. Then I'm coming in. Em washed her hands and we left the bathroom. I avoided making eye contact with Hunter, who stood back and jerked his head toward my bedroom. Go in and lie down on the bed, he said. Both of you. We did what he said, although I could see it killed M to obey. And two minutes later, he had us both cuffed to the bedstead. Thankfully, he only did one wrist each, which was way more comfortable than Skid's method. I'll bring you some food, Hunter said, tracing a finger across M's cheek. She glared at him. I'm going to buy a bright red dress to wear to your funeral, Liam. Yeah? he replied, eyes narrowing. Make sure it's short and shows off your tits. 
I hate you, she hissed. Keep telling yourself that. He walked out, slamming the door behind him. I bit my tongue, wondering what the hell that was all about. Don't worry, Em said after an awkward pause. We'll find our way out of this. We'll escape somehow. Either that or the guys will find us. Do you have any ideas? I asked, wondering what the hell was going on between them. Did he tell you anything, give you any hints or clues about where we are? No. I waited for her to say more. She didn't, and that worried me even more. So what did you do all night? I asked slowly. M ignored the question. I wonder if one of them will leave at some point, she murmured. If we wait until there's just one in the house, I'll bet the two of us could take him. Or even if we distracted him, at least one of us could get away. Go for help. Do you think we're really out in the middle of nowhere? I asked. Have you seen outside? Haven't seen outside, but we barely drove long enough to get out of the city, she said. There may not be any houses next door, but there has to be something within walking distance.